Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Thieves on the Fens by Joy Ellis, narrated by Henrietta Mir. Chapter One Get your team together, D.I. Nikki Galena. You have a murder to solve. Who is this? barked Nikki. There was a low, guttural laugh, and then a click. The line went dead. Trace that last call to my office! Nicky shouted down the phone. D.S. Joseph Easter looked up in surprise. A few moments before, they had been calmly discussing a recent spate of burglaries in the villages around Greenborough. Another anonymous call. Nicky's face was a mask of concern. The last couple of times it was just kind of creepy. He just kept saying my name over and over. I thought it was a hoax. This time he's telling me we have a murder to investigate. A murder is announced, murmured Joseph. Nicky stood up. Only he didn't sound as if he'd stepped out of a bloody Miss Marple novel. He sounded really sinister. She frowned. In fact, he was downright menacing. They couldn't trace the last one, could they? And I suggest they won't this one either. As if in confirmation, a civilian entered her office to tell her that the last call was from a pay-as-you-go mobile, so no trace. Joseph looked across the desk, his expression grave. You think we should take this seriously? At the risk of sounding alarmist... I think that man was deadly serious. She grimaced. You didn't hear his voice, Joseph. It sent shivers down my spine. She shuddered. I wonder if the call was recorded. Joseph nodded. I should think so. I believe they're monitoring all incoming calls now, not just 999 emergencies. You need to hear him, Joseph. You really do. Joseph ran a hand through his hair and stared at her. It's not like you to be rattled by some creep who is clearly out to do just that. Get under your skin. Nicky took a breath. You're right. The last thing I want to do is let him win. Although what he's up to, I have no idea. She shook her head, then picked up the phone. It could just be some prat who loves to cause trouble for the police. But I'm going to request IT to send us a transcript and a voice recording. Then you can hear him for yourself. And tell Control to monitor the calls coming into your office. I will. That makes three calls so far. And I doubt we've heard the last of Mr. Creepy. Unfortunately, I have to agree with you. Nicky made her call, and they returned to reviewing the series of rather disturbing break-ins that had been bothering Greenborough over the past month. They seem to be escalating, don't they? Joseph ran his finger down the reports from uniform. Nicky frowned. And spreading to some of the further villages. Problem is, we can't be everywhere at once. Maybe that's the idea. Divide and conquer. It has to be an organised gang, don't you think? She said. Joseph nodded. And it looks like they have a shopping list. From the list of goods taken, they are probably stealing to order. And that makes it career villains, not some opportunistic little scrotes grabbing whatever they can in order to buy the next fix. They seem very clued up on the occupants' whereabouts, and the kind of thing they have. Joseph rubbed at his chin thoughtfully. We need to find a tradesperson or a bona fide caller common to them all. Someone who gets in and checks the place out, then passes on the info to the thieves. Four local window cleaners, in for another grilling, I see. And the meter readers, although there are fewer of them nowadays, plus the delivery drivers. Joseph shrugged. Although we've already had uniform working on those for weeks, there has to be someone we've missed, hasn't there? Nicky yawned. Then it's back to the beginning, I guess. Go over all the homeowner's statements again, and see if we can find a link. She handed Joseph half the pile of reports in front of her. I think we deserve a coffee if we are going to tackle this lot again. My thoughts exactly. A proper coffee? He grinned at her. Get someone to go to the Café des Amis. She took a note from her purse and passed it to him. My turn today, and a small lunchtime snack wouldn't go amiss. I'll go myself. I need to stretch my legs. The smile widened. That way I can make sure you don't go ordering something that's really bad for you. Spoil sport. I like things that are bad for me. Don't I know it. But today it's a healthy tuna pasta salad. Nicky pulled a face. Can't we send Dave? He's much more amenable to a proper varied diet. You mean he's easier to bribe and he's scared to contradict his boss? Something like that. Nicky smiled as Joseph left her office. He did his level best to keep her eating healthily, but after years as a beat bobby, the craving for junk food still lingered. She sat for a while and stared at the silent telephone. Joseph had said she was rattled by the anonymous calls. It was true. Just the man's voice was enough to awaken a sense of foreboding. 
she sensed not just threat, but something unhinged. In short, she believed they could be dealing with a very dangerous individual. Her mobile rang, and she jumped. Did Mr. Creepy know her personal mobile number, too? She looked at the display and sighed with relief. Mom, how are you? Nicky hadn't known about her biological mother until a few years back, but now they were very close. Nicky, I just wanted to tell you that I'm going away for a couple of days, and I didn't want you to worry. Eve Anderson sounded in very good spirits. Sounds interesting. Where are you off to? There's a reunion in London. Lots of the women from my RAF days. My old friend Jenny Foxwell has suggested we make a proper break of it and take in the flower show at Hampton Court Palace. Oh, that's lovely, Mum. What a good idea. It wasn't Nicky's thing. She could hardly tell a flower from a weed, but she was sure that her mother, who was also a very good pastel artist, would have a wonderful time. When are you off? Tomorrow morning. I'm meeting Jenny at the hotel. We've splashed out on some pampering spa treatments. Then we go to our reunion dinner. The next day it's off to Hampton Court and maybe even the theatre in the evening. We'll play it by ear. Neither of us has to hurry back. We may even stay over and go round the galleries, look at an exhibition. Why not? Go and have a great time, Mum. As soon as you're back, come to dinner. Then you can give Joseph and me a blow-by-blow -blow account of what you got up to. I'll gladly join you for dinner, especially if it's Joseph cooking. But regarding every single thing I get up to, my lips will be forever sealed. They both laughed, and then Eve rang off. About time her mum had a break, thought Nicky. She had seemed unsettled lately. She had spent her whole life living at breakneck speed, on active duty in the RAF, and as an MOD operative. Now she was retired, and everything had suddenly ground to a halt. Nicky suspected that Eve was horribly bored. She understood exactly how she felt. She would be the same. What would she do if she couldn't be a police officer any more? The force ran through her veins and gave her life. Without it, Nicky couldn't even contemplate the idea. Joseph was the same. He had come to the police by a very different route, via the army and the special forces. But now he was as committed as she was. They both lived on Cloud Fen, a rather remote rural spot close to the river and the marshes. It was the perfect antidote to their frenetic and sometimes traumatic working life. Nicky lived in her old family home, Cloud Cottage Farm. Joseph was a stone's throw away, in the tiny but characterful Knock Cottage. Joseph was the closest friend Nicky had ever had. Many thought they must be an item, but their career choices had put paid to that. Now they had a very special relationship. It might not be perfect, but it suited them. Joseph pushed the door open with his shoulder and backed into the office, carrying a cardboard tray with their lunches. I've just been talking to Niall, and he thinks the same as we do, that the Thebes are personal shoppers. He reckons it's rife in the cities. You text a thief with your order, and hey presto, he delivers. Just like Amazon. P.C. Niall Farrow was Joseph's son-in-law. Nicky really liked this young, uniformed officer. She had been thrilled when he married Joseph's daughter, Tamsin, and even more delighted when they decided to buy an old house on Jacob's Fen and renovate it. So why here? We're hardly a metropolis. Everything else we do is way behind the cities. Nicky looked at the tuna pasta salad. She would have preferred a cheeseburger, but still. So what's attracting the designer robbers? Joseph handed her a fork. Internet, probably. Even here in the backwaters we have some pretty innovative criminals. They're just moving with the times. I'm so pleased, muttered Nicky, loading a fork full of pasta. Does Niall have any leads? Not so far, but he's really getting his teeth into this one. His Sarge has let him have a fair bit of rain, so he'll be keeping his ear to the ground on the streets. Joseph sipped his drink. He's taking his sergeant's exam next week, and Tamsin is helping him cram, would you believe? I never thought I'd live to see my Tam actually supporting a police officer. It's good to know we are no longer the enemy, Nicky said. She's grown up a lot in the last few years, hasn't she? My little baby married. Joseph shook his head, then grinned. And I couldn't be happier. Niall's a great kid. Married man, Joseph. He's no kid any more. The phone rang before he could answer. They looked at each other, and Nicky nodded to Joseph. He picked up the receiver. De Igalina's office. Can I help you? Joseph's face fell. He pressed the loudspeaker button. Well, well. DS Easter, isn't it? There was a muffled chuckle. I'm sure she's there listening in. So I'll give you both my message. There was a brief pause. Then the voice said, When? Where? Who? 
When, where, who? What are you talking about? Joseph asked quickly. You may think you're the Fenland's finest, but you'll need help. Maybe tomorrow. There was a click and the hum of an empty line. Joseph slowly replaced the receiver and stared at Nicky. I see what you mean. He sounds really malevolent. He's playing with us all right, and I didn't like his message. He missed out why. Nicky looked at Joseph, and he knows you too. I have a dreadful feeling that we are on the verge of something really unpleasant. Joseph puffed out his cheeks. Time to talk to the super. Nicky pushed back her chair. Absolutely, and since I've just gone off my lunch, I might as well get it over sooner rather than later. Superintendent Greg Woodall sat back in his chair and surveyed Nicky with a sombre air. What is your workload at present? The break in, sir. They're on the increase and we're pretty sure we have a gang of thieves work in this area. Greg nodded. Some of the more remote houses are ripe for the picking. No neighbours and no camera surveillance for miles. Yes, sir, and that's the kind of place they're targeting. They aren't trashing them, just taking very specific items. Right, and now you feel there is someone out there with an intention to kill? Greg raised his eyebrows. Nicky looked down. I know it sounds ridiculous, after just four anonymous calls. Hell, we get threatening and abusive calls all the time but there is something about the man that says he has some kind of nasty agenda. Well, you've got enough experience behind you to know a prankster from a real menace. He put his fingers together in a steeple and touched his lips. The thing is, there is very little we can do at this point, other than be vigilant. I just wanted you to be aware of the situation, sir, and to let you know that, even at this early stage of the game, we are taking him seriously. Best to err on the side of caution and at the same time pray he's just a time-waster. Nicky left the office more certain than ever that this was no time-waster. Chapter 2 Nicky woke at two in the morning, with her duvet in a mess and her pillows on the floor. That voice had resounded through her dreams. For the first time, Nicky felt uneasy about living in such a remote spot. With a tired sigh, she switched on the bedside light pulled the bed together again and walked to the window. There was not cottage, white in the moonlight. Joseph was just a few minutes away. Nicky pushed her feet into her slippers and went downstairs to the kitchen. She pulled a jar of Ovaltine from the cupboard and boiled the kettle. She should be used to broken sleep. Shift work played havoc with your body clock, and most officers admitted that you never really got used to the constantly changing routines. Tonight, however... Nicky felt almost scared to go back to sleep and face those disturbing dreams. With a grunt of annoyance, she made the drink and took it back up to her room. She sat on the edge of the bed and held the hot mug between her hands. This was plain stupid. She was a bloody tough woman. She had faced more danger and more thoroughly rotten people than she could count. Yet that voice on the phone had reduced her to a quaking wreck. It was stupid, but she couldn't dismiss her unease. She climbed back into bed and sat waiting for her drink to cool. She had a sudden urge to ring Joseph and talk to him, just for reassurance, really, to hear his gentle, sensible voice, rather than that other one. She glanced at the clock. He wouldn't mind, she knew, but it was hardly fair. She finished her Ovaltine and put the light out. It was probably the not knowing, the waiting for something to happen. Patience had never been one of her virtues. She was an energetic and industrious police officer, even as a child, she hadn't been able to abide in activity. Waiting for the hammer to fall. Where did that come from? Her resolve began to return. This was clearly a game, and if she continued to feel like this, he would be the winner. She had to back off, calm down, and see what tomorrow would bring. He had said they would need help, so if this was the kind of game she suspected it was, the next step would be a clue, and then they could act. She had a good team. In fact, she had the best team, when the chips were down, she was certain they would be a match for this arsehole. She smiled in the darkness. The team made her feel much better. Only an arsehole would consider taking on Nicky Joseph, DC Cat Cullen, DC Ben Radley and retired detective, now civilian officer, Dave Harris. Plus the powerful and reliable backup from Niall and his partner, WPC Yvonne Collins. Okay, he had her attention. Fine, now let's see how he enjoyed the considerable attention they were going to pay him. 
Nikki pulled the duvet around her and finally closed her eyes. A second later, they snapped open again. The phone was ringing. Had Joseph seen her light on and got worried? Or had Mr. Creepy gone for the kill without the promised clue? With some trepidation, she lifted the receiver. There was no preamble, no taunting, just the same voice. Darkman's nine clean fingers. The line went dead. Once the shock had abated, Nicky grabbed the pad that she kept by the phone and wrote down the four words. They meant nothing, but she was sure it was their first clue. The really disconcerting thing was that he had rung on her private number. Only a select few had access to that. Nicky grabbed her phone. Her finger hovered over Joseph's number, and then she sighed and put it down. Let him sleep. She had a feeling that in the coming days, sleep would be in short supply. After the usual overnight reports and a briefing on the burglaries, Nikki told her team about her late-night caller. Joseph was the first to speak. He was clearly furious that she hadn't rung him immediately. She smiled at him. How could you be cross when someone cared about you and your safety? She would have felt exactly the same, but she still tried to justify her actions. I knew he wouldn't ring again. This is just the beginning. He's not going to rush this. And just because he's got hold of my phone number, it doesn't mean he knows where I live. He might know more than you were giving him credit for. Joseph's face was still creased with anxiety. Next time you ring me. Agreed? Nicky nodded. I will. Then she looked at the others. So, anyone got an idea what Darkman's is? Sounds like a nightclub or a bar, said Cat Cullen. Only if it is, it isn't local. I've been undercover in every shady joint in the area, and I've never come across one with that name. I read a book called that once, Joseph said thoughtfully, but it was complex and too weird for me to follow. I struggled to finish it, and frankly, can't see a connection there. So, what about nine clean fingers? Nicky looked around. Dave Harris, recently retired, but back in the office as an interviewing officer, looked up and smiled. I think I can help you on both scores. All eyes turned to Dave's. It's Thieves Cant. Ah, oh, you mean Thieves Latin? Asked Joseph with interest. Sorry? Cat interjected. What on earth are you guys talking about? Dave grinned. Patter Flash, they call it. Or just Flash. It's a bit like Cockney rhyming slang. It's a secret language that thieves used donkeys years back. Joseph joined in. It's mostly obsolete now, but loads of the words and sayings have crept into the English language, and we use them all the time. It takes back to the 1500s. Okay, great history lesson, but what does dark man's and these nine damn fingers mean? Nicky asked impatiently. And why is this creep using language from the bloody dark ages? Ben Radley turned to his screen and googled thieves cant. Wow, there's even a dictionary. This is fascinating. You can educate yourself in your own time, Ben. Just tell me what we are looking at. Ben typed in the words. Ah, oh, Darkman's means night. Lightman's means day. Nicky tensed. They were being told the when part of the riddle. And the fingers bit. Ben stared at the monitor. It refers to time. It's measured in hours after sunset or sunrise. After sunset is clean, after sunrise is dirty. One hour is called a finger. Nine clean fingers means 3 a.m., Mum. Three in the morning, Nicky whispered. That's when our murder will take place. Or already has, added Joseph darkly. Ben, print off copies of this dictionary for all of us. It might just be useful. Now we are waiting for the where and the who, aren't we? Said Cat. Check with uniform, Cat. See if anything suspicious happened around that time last night. I doubt it, but check anyway. Cat stood up. I'll do it immediately, ma'am. Meantime, everyone get back to the robberies. Regarding these calls, we don't have nearly enough to begin hunting for a body, if we ever do. This could just be some elaborate hawks. Nicky beckoned Joseph and went into her office. Joseph closed the door. You should have rung me. I almost did, but... but nothing. Joseph's eyes were full of concern. We both know this is no joker, and if he's done his homework, which I suspect he has, you'll know exactly where you live. I'm wondering if this is personal. Someone with a grudge against you in particular. Could be. It's certainly possible, when you consider how many villains I've ushered through the slammer door. Then until we get this sorted, I'm moving into Cloud Cottage Farm with you. Nicky didn't say no. I'll get some stuff together tonight. We play this safe, okay? 
until we know what the hell is going on. I'm not arguing, Joseph. Believe me. Good. He flopped down into a chair. Now why the hell is he using this archaic slang? What's the point? Maybe it means something to him. Nikki fiddled with her pen and began doodling on her memo pad. I think we need to look at this thieves' Latin in detail, don't you? And the burglaries. The others are on top of that. Let's run with this for a while. See where it leads. Joseph returned to his desk to do some research. Nikki spent a large part of the morning on the computer. She soon found herself quite mesmerised by the whole thing, but she still had no idea why Mr Creepy was using it. She got up and stretched. Then seeing Dave outside, she caught him in. How did you know about this thieves Latin? Dave took a seat. Do you recall hearing about the Bailey family thefts back in the 70s? Oh yes, before my time, but Archie Leonard told me all about them. The mention of Archie's name brought a pang of sadness. The old villain had been both adversary and friend, and in later years he became more friend than anything else. She missed the old man and his old school crooked family. Some of the Leonards still lived on the Carborough estate. Marchie's son, Raymond, still ran a pretty effective underground network, but he kept his promise to his father and did not work her patch. The only Leonard she had time for these days was Mickey, Archie's adopted grandson. Both she and Joseph looked out for Mickey. He was the exception to the rule that leopards never change their spots. Mickey Leonard was spotless, probably the only success the Carborough had ever spawned. Tell me about the Baileys. Dave leaned forward. They were a bit of an enigma, really. When I was a young rookie, I can just about remember that far back, I was that fascinated with them that I spent every moment of my spare time looking into their history. They weren't from here originally, were they? They came from almost down on the Cambridgeshire borders, an old fen area that was really wild. They were the poorest of the poor, real rural webfoots, but they turned to crime in a big way. Dave grinned. I once heard them referred to as a ragged rabblement of rake hells. I looked that up, and it came from some old book from the 16th century. And their ancestors moved here. Oh, yes, they loved it, and immediately embarked on a five-year-long crime spree. All thefts and robberies, blaggings and pickpocketing. But people did get hurt occasionally. They didn't seem too bothered. And they used their own language? asked Nicky, warming to the story. It was a cross between English, Latin and a version of Romany, with a smattering of Yiddish, Spanish, German, French, you name it. No one could understand a word they said, but boy were they crafty. If it wasn't bolted to the floor, they'd have it away. They even had a couple of what they called blue pigeons, the thieves that stole lead from roofs. Oh, and faggers. They were small boys that went in through windows to unlock the house from inside. They were slippery as eels they were. They could get into places which a cat would have trouble entering. Nicky had heard stories of children being purposefully malnourished to keep them from growing too big for the job. Are any of them left? Nah, all the old ones are long dead now. And the youngsters that were left didn't fare too well. A couple are in prison. One had an horrible accident. They fell for a roof and died. A couple died of illnesses related to their poor living conditions. And just two actually opted out and went straight. Are they still around? No. One went to the States and the other Australia. There are no Baileys left in Greenborough, unless you count the cemetery. So they aren't behind this new crime wave? No. They're long gone, Gov. Whoever it is, it's not them. Dave left, and Joseph took his place. Got a wealth of knowledge on this cant, but no damn idea why our man is using it, except one possibility. Nicky looked up. And... I found a report that said that a form of thieves' Latin, something they called Elizabethan cant, was being used in prisons to fool the warders. And apparently it's almost impossible to figure it out. So we may be talking about that grudge revenge angle, someone who has been banged up and didn't enjoy a stay at Her Majesty's pleasure. Quite possibly. That might have given us a starting point, but I cannot begin to count the number of villains I've had a part in sending down. Nicky exhaled. I wouldn't know where to start. You might just have to start thinking about that. Joseph looked at her ruefully. It's looking like this man is ringing you and none of the other senior officers for a reason. Nicky slapped her hands down on the desk. Bogger, just what I need. Chapter 3 At 4pm, Kat knocked on her office door. Mum, Eve Anderson is in reception. Can I bring her up? 
Nicky took a moment to get her head around that. Eve was in London, or she should have been. Yes, yes, er, uh, no, I'll go myself. She ran down the stairs and into the foyer. One look at Eve told her all was not well. Come on up to my office. She took her mother's arm and steered her away from the busy reception area. We'll talk there. As she entered the CID room, she asked Dave if he would mind getting a couple of hot drinks. They went into her office and closed the door. Before Nicky could ask what was wrong, Eve said, Nicky, she's dead. Jenny is dead. But I know it's just not possible. I spoke to her earlier this morning and she was absolutely fine. Really looking forward to the next couple of days and now... Nicky had never seen her mother so distraught. Eve was a strong, capable woman. It was not her way to show so much emotion. Tell me what happened. There was a soft tap on the door. Nicky took the cups from Dave and closed the door behind him. Eve seemed glad for the hot coffee. We talked just before I left home. She was really excited about everything and said she would be there to meet me at the hotel. Eve took a breath. I got there in good time and went up to our room, and there she was, lying on the bed. Dead, Nicky. She was dead. Tears glistened in her eyes. Jenny was such a wonderful woman. Courageous, funny, and warm, too. She was my friend through thick and thin during the Falklands War, and I really loved her. Nicky went over and put her arms around her mother. Normally, neither of them was demonstrative, but for a long moment, they just clung to each other. After a while, Nicky stepped back. Do you know what the cause of death was? Eve shook her head. I suppose we'll have to wait for the post-mortem. She had no illness that I knew of, and she was remarkably fit for her age. She wasn't overweight, and although we enjoyed the occasional glass or two of wine, she didn't drink heavily. And she didn't smoke, either. She picked up her mug of coffee. The doctor who came to see her said he thought it must have been a heart or possibly a ruptured aneurysm. She went so quickly. She'd only been in the room forty-five minutes, and then I arrived to find her like that. Does she have any relatives? Not that I know of. She never married and had no children. They may be cousins, I suppose, but she never mentioned them. I'm so sorry, Mum. What a terrible shock for you. Eve had stopped crying and was beginning to rally. She sighed. I've seen worse things in my life, Nicky, but... She stopped, as if unsure how to proceed. I'm worried. Nicky looked at her. Why? There was another reason we were meeting up, Nicky. Something was bothering Jenny. Something serious that she didn't want to talk about over the phone. She was going to tell me about it today. Now she'll never be able to tell me. Nicky tilted her head to one side and stared at her mother. And you suspect something isn't quite right about this sudden death? I think it absolutely stinks. They looked at each other without speaking. Nicky knew that Eve was not prone to flights of fancy. If she had doubts about Jenny Foxwell's death, then she would take her seriously. Where does Jenny live? Beach Lacey. Not in their patch, but also not too far out of their area and she knew a very good DCI who worked there. Do you know her next of kin, Mum? Oh, yes, Nicky. It's me. As I said, she had no close family, and we stuck together. Over the years, we always kept in touch. The cogs and wheels in Nicky's mind were set in motion. OK, leave this with me, Mum. If there is anything to be unearthed about Jenny's death, I'll find out what it is. I promise. Nicky? Eve's expression was grave. Be careful, will you? I always am. I mean, be especially careful. And trust no one. Jenny and I work some very dangerous missions together. And as we don't know what this is about, tread with the greatest of care. Please. Nicky nodded. I understand. Good. Now, I think I need to go home and have a stiff drink. I'll ring you later. Or better than that, Joseph and I will call in on the way home. Then I'll get three glasses out. Cat and Ben had been going out for a couple of months. It had been on the card since they first met on a murder inquiry in Derbyshire. What they described as a slow burner had now settled into a steady relationship, and luckily a great working partnership. Bit of a coincidence, isn't it? Cat looked across their desk to where Ben was working. 
We have a major outbreak of thefts by what appears to be a very well-organised gang, and at the same time a weirdo turns up spouting gibberish that just so happens to be some secret language used by thieves. You want to make a connection? She sat back and put her hands behind her head. Not exactly, but it is a bit odd. Ben glanced at the Thebes dictionary and laughed. You know what is odd? You've just said he was spouting gibberish, and gibberish is the cant word for Thebes Latin, so even you speak it. Oh, great. Pity I'm not as fluent as this nutter clearly is. Why not just tell us what he wants us to know and be done with it? He's obviously a game player, and by definition, game players like to confuse, scheme, and trick their opponents. Cap frowned. Oh, dear. You sound like you were ready to play the game with him. Ben grinned. I've always been competitive, you know. This secret language thing reminds me of playing Dungeons and Dragons. Fantasy role-playing? Well, I never. Cap touched his foot with hers under the desk. You really must tell me more about this interesting little fetish of yours. Ben laughed. Whoa, not that kind of role-play. I'm sorry, I gave all that up in my late teens. But it makes you think, doesn't it? Maybe it's a human trait to be secretive. It certainly is if you're a criminal. And wars were won and lost by secret codes and clever code-breakers. Cat looked down at a pile of statements. I wish I could just be clever enough to discover our missing link with these robberies. Someone is definitely getting inside these properties to know what to steal, but I'm damned if I can find any common denominator between the victims. Ben stood up. Let's put markers on the map and see if a pattern shows up. He unfolded a local Fenland map and stuck it to one of the whiteboards. Cat stood behind him with a sheet of coloured sticky markers and a list of addresses and dates. OK, they started here. She put a red sticker on a road in the village of Hanley Dyke. The next was a big farmhouse at Ferntoft End. Another sticker. And three houses on one of the straight droves that joins Turngate with Martin C's End. The stickers multiplied until Cat finally stood back. Blimey, they have been busy, haven't they? And no rhyme nor reason by the look of it, Ben grumbled. They are scattered around everywhere, which means different postmen, different tradespeople, and no connections at all that I can see. With her eyes on the board, Kat said, What if... She took a sheet of stickers with different colours and stared at the map. What if there is no common denominator? No one is infiltrating the houses. Say they use a local pub and send in one of the gang to get friendly with the regulars. People chat when they've had a few bevvies. A clever conman could get them to share all sorts of info. She stuck a series of bright yellow stickers on the map, and suddenly a kind of pattern was revealed. The red markers in each area all circled a yellow one. Look, that's the herringbone inn. This one is the plough and harrow, the golden barrel, the Britannia, the anchor, the nightingale watch. She turned to Ben. What do you think? I think it's time for a pub crawl, don't you? He beamed at her. I can see how you made Detective Cat Cullen. Thank you, kind sir. She gave a little bow. Shall we start tonight? I'm up for it. Shall we try to get some petty cash from the boss? For us to go on the piss? Are you crazy? Ben laughed. I thought of it more in terms of a reconnaissance trip to gain vital information. Well, good luck with that one. Cat wrote a list of the public houses that seemed to be central to the burgled properties. Let's start with the anchor. That's closest to the Ferntoff farmhouse. The owners should be well known in the area, and maybe the landlord will recall any new regulars talking to the locals. If this turns out to be how they do it, why don't we select an area that hasn't been targeted yet? Then go out to the local and keep our eyes peeled. We might just spot someone acting suspiciously. You're right. We know what to look for. We could get lucky. OK. Tonight it's the anchor. Then maybe the golden barrel. That's not too far away. We'll tackle the rest of them, either officially during the day, or make a nightly mission out of it. What do you say? I say I love being a police officer. Don't you? Chapter 4 when Nicky and Joseph got to her house, Eve was her usual determined and positive self. Even so, Joseph put his arms around her and told her how very sorry he was to hear about her friend. Even though hugging wasn't Eve's thing, Nicky noticed that her mother succumbed rather easily to Joseph's embrace. They went through to the kitchen, and Eve poured them each a glass of wine. I guess you wouldn't have eaten, so I've thrown together a simple supper if you don't have plans. Mum, you didn't have to do that. Not after a shock like the one you've had, Nicky remonstrated. I wanted to keep busy. It's only a cheesy broccoli pasta bake. Nothing fancy. Thank you, Eve. That will be lovely. Can I help with anything? Joseph asked. 
Just sit, drink your wine and prepare yourselves. I've got a lot to tell you. As they ate, Eve told them about her friend Jenny. Eve and I wasn't sure exactly what her role in the Ministry of Defence was. I just knew that she had a lot of expertise in a particular field and was very highly thought of. Why was she so secretive, Mum? You were her best friend and you'd served together for years. Prior to her retirement, her work was classified. She couldn't, wouldn't have talked about it. She was far too professional. How long has she been retired? asked Joseph. Five years, and she was loving it. Eve smiled. It's hard to move on when you've been active all your work in life, but Jenny was one of those people who are comfortable in their own skin and find enjoyment in whatever they choose to do. And what did she do? Nicky asked. Oh, she was a great one for projects. And she was quite well off after years of working at such a high level. The first thing she did was buy a wreck of a property and renovate it. She shook her head. You wait until you see it. It's something rather special, I promise you. Joseph looked over the rim of his glass. In Beach Lacey, isn't it? Yes, about half an hour's drive away. She sighed. I'll have to go down there soon. I have a key and there will be people to contact. I'll talk to her solicitor tomorrow and make some arrangements. Want some company? Nicky said. I'd love some, if you can spare the time. Nicky smiled. It was nice to be able to do something for her very independent mother. Just say when. Joseph will cover for me, won't you? Absolutely. Eve looked pleased and relieved. Her garden was the next project, and believe me, it's a dream. That was one of the reasons she wanted to go to the RHS flower show. She had some idea about adding a fern garden and wanted some expert advice on how to go about it and what plants to use. Sounds like she was very organised. Joseph smiled. Eve laughed. Oh, Joseph, you have no idea. She would spend hours, days, weeks on the computer, planning and sourcing everything down to the last nut, bolt or screw. It sounds rather like a military operation, but given her RAF background, I guess that was to be expected. Nicky laughed. Too true, but Jenny was an inveterate list and note maker. She had more notebooks, files and folders than you would ever believe, and that's without whatever was on her computer. Eve puffed out her cheeks. I guess I'll be sorting all that out. I can't imagine the job going to anyone else. She lifted the bottle. More wine, anyone? I'll pass, Eve. You have another Nicky. I'll drive us home, Joseph said. Appreciate it. Nicky pushed her glass forward. Mum, tell us what was worrying Jenny. There was a long silence. Then Eve said, Jenny isn't the first of our group to die suddenly. We had another friend, a woman called Anne Castledine. She died three weeks ago, totally unexpectedly. She was driving down to Chatteris for the weekend. There's a skydiving centre close to there. Anne was an experienced parachutist and a qualified skydiver, and she was going to do a charity tandem dive. She was on the A141 and collapsed at the wheel. They said it was a massive heart attack and she was dead before the car crashed. Eve slowly swirled the wine around in her glass. She'd been in contact with Jenny a short while before and told her that she was doing a bit of private work for someone and wasn't very happy about one or two things that were coming to the surface. She wanted Jenny's opinion about what she should do. Then bang, Anne's dead, and Jenny starts to worry that her death was not what it seemed. More than that, I don't know. Jenny said she believed she might have made a disturbing discovery and we needed to talk. She raised her hands, looking exasperated. Oh dear, I'm beginning to see why you were suspicious about Jenny's death. By the sound of it, Anne was a very fit and healthy woman. Eve nodded, in tip-top condition. You have to be to do the kind of thing she did. You certainly don't throw yourself out of planes if you have a dicky ticker. How many are there in your group of RAF friends? Asked Joseph. Around a dozen, but six of us had worked closely together and we all took jobs with the M.O.D. afterwards. We were a kind of band of sisters, always kept in touch and met up without fail once a year. I was closer to Jenny than I was to any of the others, but as I said before, we had always been particular friends. Was Anne one of the six? Yes, and she too was pretty close to Jenny. Nicky bit her lip and glanced at Joseph. This doesn't look good, does it? No, it doesn't. 
If I were you, Eve, I wouldn't voice any of your suspicions to anyone. Play the grieving friend, and keep saying how sad that someone can appear so well, but be so suddenly taken by illness. Eve frowned. I wasn't planning on telling anyone else other than you two, I promise. But you were going to start investigating, just as soon as the post-mortem result comes back, right? Nikki looked at her mother. Uh, well, possibly. Eve gave them a guilty smile. Then forget it. Joseph looked stern. Nikki has a friend in the division that covers Beach Lacey. She's going to liaise with him and let him know that we have concerns about the nature of her death. Okay. I mean it, Eve. Leave it to us and keep a low profile as much as you can. If there is something going on, you don't need to attract attention to yourself by nosing around. I consider myself duly chastised, Detective Sergeant Easter. Eve tried to look contrite and failed. And let's pray that both of these women had natural deaths, Nicky added, not for one minute believing her own words. No one said anything. Joseph looked pensive as they drove back. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? asked Nicky. That Eve might be in danger. Exactly. Nicky chewed on the inside of her cheek. I know she's very capable and knows how to take care of herself, but I'm still worried. I think you should be. Heaven knows what might be going on here. He set the key into the ignition. I think you should make it a priority to get hold of your mate in Beach Lacey and put him in the picture, don't you? Oh, don't worry, Joseph. That's the very first thing I'll be doing tomorrow. Joseph sorted out some things that he would need for Cloud Cottage Farm, thinking over the events of the last few days. He took a clean shirt and trousers from the wardrobe and folded them. He was far more worried about Eve than he had let on to Nicky. He had been in the military long enough to know that certain things happened in the name of security. Eve Anderson and her friends could have had access to some highly confidential material in their time, and maybe, just maybe, her friend Anne had chanced upon something she shouldn't have. Ready? He heard Nicky's voice calling up the stairs. One minute and I'll be there. And they say a woman faff about with their clothes. Sorry, I've been a bit distracted. He grabbed some clean underwear and pushed everything into a grab bag. You do only live a five minute walk away. I think you could leave the complete contents of your wardrobe where they are. Nicky was obviously joking, but Joseph also picked up on the anxious undertone. He ran down the steep wooden stairs. Come on, that only took me four minutes. Don't grouch now. Your answer phone has a couple of messages on it. Nicky pointed to the flashing red light. Better check before we go. Joseph pressed play. Message one. Tamsin's voice. Dad, ring us when you get in, will you? We're about to strip off some cladding to see if there is an original open fire in the bedroom, but Nile could use a bit of advice before we wreck the place. Love you, Dad. Speak later. Joseph smiled. After their rocky start, he'd begun to think he'd never hear his daughter tell him she loved him. Message two. He waited, still filled with warmth from Tamsin's words. If you want to know where, look for Stophole Abbey. Joseph played it again and cursed, all hint of warmth gone. Did you bring that print out of the old dictionary home with you? He asked Nicky. She shook her head. Still on my desk, damn it. We'll Google it on the laptop when we get home. She turned for the door. Let's go. Joseph grabbed his bag and clothes and followed her out, stopping only to make sure that he had locked the door securely. So Mr. Creepy had his private number too. Joseph was beginning to see that this man was far more organised than Nicky perhaps appreciated. He was very glad that he'd be staying with her. Eve sat in semi-darkness with a glass of wine in her hand. Her heart was heavy, but her brain was working overtime. She had told Joseph that she would keep clear of their investigation, and she would. Theirs. She needed their help in an official capacity. They could ask questions that she certainly couldn't, and they had access to reports and files that, though not completely off-limits to her, would take her a lot longer to access. But right now she had an inquiry of her own to arrange, because she had connections that the police didn't. Apart from being a dear friend, Jenny Foxwell had been a brave and brilliant woman. They had been to Helen back on some dangerous missions during the Falklands War, and they had survived. If Jenny's death turned out to be anything other than natural causes, someone would pay. Eve would make sure of that. Eve sipped her wine and allowed some of the horrors of years ago to filter back into her mind. It had been a terrible time, certainly, but some beautiful things had come from it. Jenny's friendship, for one thing, and her love for Wing Commander Frank Reed, Nicky's father, 
the man she had loved from the moment she set eyes on him. Her eyes narrowed. Tonight, even Frank was absent from her thoughts. It was hard to think of anything else other than Jenny being dead. Eve sighed and placed her empty glass on the coffee table. Time to make some calls. She made three, and each would have sounded innocuous and quite ordinary to any listener, which was the intention. The only thing that might have sounded a tad unusual was that each call contained a reference to a friend's nephew, Henry, taking flying lessons. Eve finished her calls and then glanced at her watch. Twenty-two hundred hours. Well, contact had been made. Twelve hours from now, she would have company in her search for answers. Nicky and Joseph sat at her kitchen table and deliberated on what they knew. It hadn't been hard to discover that Stophole Abbey was a cant reference to the meeting place or central hideout for a thieves' guild, but that was little use when they had no idea where this place was. We're assuming he's referring to our gang of housebreakers, aren't we? And not some historical site. Joseph frowned. It must be our thieves. I don't recall hearing anything about some ancient criminal lair in this area. What about the family of thieves that Dave talked about? The Baileys? I wonder where they hung out. He told me that earlier. It was somewhere around Harlan Marsh. Not this part. I think if we are about to be presented with a murder scene, it will be on our doorstep. Don't you? Nicky nodded. Most likely. He seems to have made this personal, so yes, you'll make sure it's on our patch. Three in the morning in the House of Thieves. Joseph almost whispered. Sounds like a nominee for the Booker Prize. He's only just started this bloody game, and I'm fed up with it already. Nicky growled. I hate people who waste our precious time. She looked at Joseph. As soon as I've spoken to my friend at Beach Lacey, I want every man Jack working their butts off to track these robbers down. They might be villains, but they don't deserve to be targeted by our local loony, just assures that he's capable of killing people. Joseph leaned forward. Do you believe that he will purposely kill someone, just to make us join in his damned game? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Joseph groaned. Me too. So we had better do as you say. Find the thieves, then make a call on Stop Hole Abbey. Preferably before three in the morning. Although Nicky had made up the bed in the guest room, Joseph said he preferred to catnap on the sofa. She wanted to object, but she knew that last call had unsettled him, and he would be on his guard all night. She turned in at eleven, and maybe because she knew that Joseph was close by, Nicky fell into a deep sleep. Her phone rang at 4am. They had agreed that if it rang in the night, she would answer and Joseph would listen on the extension. As she lifted the receiver, she heard the click that told her Joseph was there. Dear Galena, sorry to disturb you, ma'am, it's Sergeant Conway. I'm afraid there has been a body found. It looks like murder. Where, Sergeant? The old hotel, the shrimp boat, on the Feldike Road, close to the bird reserve. It's been boarded up for months, and my lads are always turfing rough sleepers out of it. Will you take it, ma'am? We're on our way. Thank you, Sergeant. Nicky hung up and swung out of bed. She pulled on her shirt and some jeans, and as she did so, the phone shrilled out again. She grabbed it, and instead of Jack Conway, a sibilant voice whispered, And so it begins. Nicky barked an angry retort. So much for the sodden game. You were going to tell us who was going to die. How I lied. Nicky found she was holding a silent receiver. She slammed it down and swore. Then she heard Joseph running up the stairs. He just couldn't wait. Apparently not. She pulled on her sweatshirt and grabbed her mobile phone. No point in trying to trace a call. He'll be using a burner phone like before. Let's go see what he's done. Chapter 5 The Shrimp Boat Hotel had been a major attraction back in the 1800s. In those days there had been a beach, and this odd little corner of Lincolnshire had been a highly fashionable resort for the newly popular exercise of sea bathing. Visitors would come to enjoy the medicinal benefits of bathing in the sea, and it became the place to go after the London season finished. Coaches would stream in, and there were fairs and races and all manner of entertainment. Now it was a desolate nature reserve, formed to halt the erosion of the sea bank and strengthen the east coast flood defences. There were just lagoons and salt marsh, but it had become a popular destination for bird watchers, flocking to see the myriad of water birds. Over the years, the shrimp boat had lost its attraction. Its banqueting hall closed and the stables were neglected to the point where they had to be demolished. It had fought on as a public house, but as few people were keen to drive out to the marshes for a swift pint after work, 
that too closed. Nicky and Joseph drew up in the overgrown car park. There were already various official vehicles there. Nicky noticed the home office pathologist's bright green Citroen dolly and a CSI van. Rory didn't waste any time getting here, Nicky said. At the door of the ramshackle old place, they pulled on protective suits and logged in with the officer in charge of protecting the scene. He lifted the blue and white cordon tape and let them in. Over here, my cherubs! Professor Rory Wilkinson waved cheerfully to them from the other side of what had once been the hotel foyer. Can't offer you any cheeky little cocktails, I'm afraid. This place seems to have gone to rack and ruin. Joseph grinned. You're rather cheerful for this hour. Not like you at all. And you haven't shouted at us about contaminating your crime scene, added Nicky suspiciously. Are you all right? Perfectly wonderful, my dear inspector. I am going on holiday, hence the cheerful disposition. Joseph looked at Nicky. Did you hear that? Nicky widened her eyes. Wilkinson, you've never had a holiday in all the years I've known you. Then it's about time I started. Hallelujah. David has finally retired from his job in the field, so no more globe-trotting to those underdeveloped parts of the world. No more dodging uprisings and mercenaries. No more Ebola scares, dysentery or beriberi. Rory raised his eyes to the heavens. And for me, no more lying awake at night wondering if he's safe, or waiting for a call that I don't want to answer. That's really good news, Rory. Joseph smiled. Really good. Nicky wanted to ask where he was going, but decided it could wait. The murdered man couldn't. So, what have we got? Come and see. Rory walked through the foyer and into a bar area. He's lying in front of the old fireplace. Nicky stared down at the lifeless man and swallowed hard. This was no easy passing, was it? They all looked at the battered and bruised body, but before anyone could answer, Joseph's phone beeped. He pulled it from his pocket and tapped Reed. He handed Nicky his phone, his face sombre. You'd better see this. Ken Cracker's been tucked into bed with an orkin towel, ha ha. Nicky read it again. Other than the cracker bit, you don't have to look it up to know what the creep is talking about. Poor guy's been bludgeoned to death, hasn't he? With a club of some kind, said Rory. Would, certainly. But I'm not sure exactly what the implement was. I need to make a proper examination. Would the time of death be around 3am by any chance? Nicky asked. No! I can't have this, Rory exclaimed. I tell you the time of death after we've haggled and bickered for at least ten minutes. Please, don't ruin years of tradition. Well, is it? Yes, but you really are not playing the game, D.I. Galena. Actually, I am, even though it's the last thing I want to do. Nicky explained what had been going on, and Rory's face clouded over. Oh, dear. It seems we have a psychopath among us once more. Possibly. No, probably. Nicky looked down and tried to fathom what this man had looked like before a person or persons unknown had taken a cudgel to his head and body. Is there any identification on him, Rory? I'm assuming his name is not really Ken Cracker. All here, ready for you. Rory handed Nicky an evidence bag. Wallet, some money, sports watch and a set of keys on a ring with a fob of some football club. So nothing taken at all? I wouldn't think so, unless someone was looking for something very specific and took only that. Rory shrugged. But frankly, I doubt it. Joseph opened the bag with gloved hands. He stared at the driving license. Michael Roper. He frowned. That name rings a bell. He's definitely known to us. And I'm pretty sure it's for theft. That would follow the pattern. Nicky looked around at the decaying old inn although this place hardly looks like a thieves' headquarters. I don't think there's been anyone here apart from a few winos and jonkies. Rory beamed at her. Forgive me for barging in on your deliberations, but check out your local history books, my dear detective. The shrimp boat was positively notorious just after World War II. More black market villains stayed here than anywhere else on the East Coast. There's a watchtower still standing about a half a mile away that was erected specifically to scan this area for smugglers. It was big business back in the day, and the shrimp was at the heart of it all. Nicky shook her head. You are a fount of knowledge. What would we do without you? I pray that you will never have to find out. 
Rory smiled, and then added, except for when I take my vacation, of course, but back to our dead man. They returned their attention to the remains of Michael Roper. Joseph looked down at him. What did you do to be chosen, I wonder? Nicky shrugged. Probably nothing other than be a thief. I wonder, Joseph mused. Could be a cover, an excuse to off someone in particular and make it appear random. He looked at Rory. Would you say this is the work of one man or several? Possibly a gang? Let me get him back to my lab, and then I'll share everything that my forensic genius can glean from his broken body. And that's it? That's all, folks, said Rory, in a scarily close imitation of Looney Tune's Porky Pig. So, if you good people would now bugger off, I will proceed with my duties. Nicky and Joseph were on their way out, when Nicky called back, Where are you going on your holiday? Rory raised his hands. Haven't decided yet. It's been so long I need to consider all options carefully. Chow? Joseph grinned at her. I wonder if he knows that the origin of Chow is, I am your slave. I should think so. Rory wouldn't be Rory if he wasn't facetious, would he? After a few moments, Nicky added, But how the hell did you know what Chow meant, Joseph Easter? Joseph laughed. You're jealous that I call Rory a fount of all knowledge, aren't you? Bitterly. Thought so. Back in the car, their mood became sombre. Joseph, how are we going to find who this killer is, when all we have are a few untraceable calls and some stupid clues in mumbo-jumbo? And he doesn't even give us time to consider them. He wants to play a game and already he's torn up the rule book. Maybe he wanted to ensure we know he's the one in charge. Joseph sniffed. Not that there is much doubt of that. He holds all the cards at present. We know nothing. We have no idea what his agenda is, nor anything about him. So our only hope right now is forensics. At least we have Rory. If the killer left the slightest trace of DNA on that body, Rory will find it. He paused. Of course, he could get cocky and make a mistake. Or he might be a killer who craves recognition, and then he will tell us who he is, himself. You mean he needs a notoriety? Hmm, I wondered that myself, which is why I'm going to ask Superintendent Woodall to keep this away from the media. The killer will be gutted if there is no coverage. Maybe that will force his hand. We don't want another death because he's frustrated. Nicky knew that. It was a proverbial rock and hard place. Still, she wanted to keep it quiet for a while, if they possibly could. I'm going to see Greg Woodall the moment he gets in. I want a lid on this. At least the shrimp boat is off the beaten track and most of the birders who visit early in the morning come from out of the area. We'll ask Uniform to keep Sturm about the real reason for their presence there, and tell them to play it down if anyone asks. Will you sort that as soon as we get back to the factory? Consider it done. He looked at her earnestly. Look, I know all this is important, but don't forget your call to Beach Lacey. As if, Nicky grimaced. Right now I'm finding it hard to keep my mind focused on anything other than Eve. Me too. Healthy women don't drop down dead. Well, very rarely. And they certainly don't do it in pairs. Nicky didn't want to face it, but she had to. Her mother might be in grave danger. Chapter 6 Apart from having a pretty good evening touring the local pubs together, Cat and Ben had come up with nothing of interest. They were amazed to hear that the creep had just upped the stakes. That kind of goes against the grain, Ben said. After all... Anyone can cheat or move the goalposts, but you have to be skilled or clever, or maybe lucky in order to win fairly. If he wants to prove how smart he is, he needs to be a bit brighter than that. I know it gives the guy status, which is the last thing we want to do, but should we come up with a name for him? asked Dave. The creep on the phone who talks in thieves' cant is a bit of a mouthful. Nicky reluctantly agreed. I know exactly what I'd like to call him, but the top brass might not approve. Any ideas? A few names were thrown around, then Dave said, What about Flash? It's another name for Cant. The old-time American cops called it that. Cat was skimming down the dictionary. How about Mad Tom? It means a beggar who feigns madness, and as we haven't a clue what the mad bastard is up to. Much as I like Flash, I think it makes him sound a bit too much like a hero. Like Flash Gordon. Nicky looked at Cat. So I guess it's Mad Tom. Now, let's get the deer's duty sorted. She beckoned to Joseph. We need to find out all we can about the dead man. We believe from the documents found on him that he is called Michael Roper. 
He is on the database, although the photo is very old. So, Dave, we will need an ID. Perhaps you could organise that. But do liaise with Rory first, because Michael Roper is not looking his best right now, and we don't want to shock his family any more than we have to. Then, when his identity is confirmed, Cat and Ben go see everyone and anyone who knew him. If he's a criminal, I doubt we'll get too far, boss, said Cat. He's a murdered criminal. That should make them think that they might do well to cooperate with us. Our main objective is to discover why our killer chose him, and whether anyone has any idea who that person might be. Okay. Nicky looked at Cat. And the robberies? Keep that simmering. Narl and Yvonne are working it from street level, so keep in touch. You never know, added Nicky. There might be a connection. D.I. Jill Mercer has offered help if we get bogged down. Joseph looked at Nicky. I think that's about it, until we get some forensic evidence back. Then off you go. Nicky went straight to her office and rang DCI Cameron Walker in the neighbouring division. Hey, Nick, good to hear you. How's things in your neck of the woods? Confusing, my friend. Very confusing. I hear you've attracted some kind of troll, only it's not a virtual one. Sadly, yes. And he's using some obsolete language. News travels fast. It does when it's interesting. If you come unstuck, pop over and have a word with my missus. She'll give you a hand with translating. Kay understands thieves can't, Nicky asked incredulously. She's a lecturer in linguistics, and her specialty is arcane languages used by subcultures. You are kidding me. You mean the pretty little brunette who thrashed us all at table tennis last summer and makes blueberry muffins to die for? Yup, that's my girl. But seriously, she'd be pleased to help you. I remember that, Cam. Nicky scribbled the name on her memo pad. But I phoned about something very different. Far away. Nicky explained as much as she knew. I heard that the owner of Monk's Lantern had died suddenly. It seems she was a friend of the chief super and a general supporter of local charities. Of course, we shan't be involved, it's not a criminal matter, but from what the local village grapevine says, the full details haven't been confirmed yet, Cameron said. I don't think anyone will get the full details, Cam. There seems to be something sinister going on behind these seemingly innocent deaths. Is there any way you could get a look at the PM report and let me know what it says? I have to be honest. We suspect that Jenny's and Anne's deaths were suspicious. And you say both women have an historic military connection? A whole group of women. One of them being my mother. Shit. Sorry, but that's not good, is it? It's worrying to say the least. And not just because she's my mum. I'm scared that if we tread on any military toes, whatever investigation we're conducting will be shut down in seconds. Nicky exhaled. Look, I promised to go with my mother to Jenny Foxwell's home. Eve is, uh, was her dearest friend and she has a key to the property. Can you do me a big favour? Would you meet us there? Of course. Anything to escape from the fraud case we're working at present. There are so many red bloody herrings, deceptions and lies that my brain is scrambled. I'll ring you after I've spoken to my mother. Have you been there before? To Monk's Lantern? No, I only heard about Jenny a few days ago. Why? It's a fabulous place. I bet her relatives will fight to the death over it. There are no relatives that I know of. Cameron let out a low whistle. Hell, I'd hate to see a place like that go to the state. Nicky frowned. What's so special about it? You'll find out when you see it. Bye for now. Rory and his assistant mortuary technician, Spike, were trying to count the multiple bruises on Michael Roper's body. Spike straightened his back. I give up, Prof. This poor guy took a right hammering, didn't he? And all this... Rory swept a hand over the corpse. It's just the surface contusions. His internal organs will no doubt be bruised as well. As you say, dear heart, in your own inimitable way, he's had a right hammering. With what, do you think? Ah, oh, well, that one is easy. With his finger, Rory traced an area on the man's leg. Look at this uninjured area, and the marginal bruising that runs in parallel straight lines. Then look closely at that tiny area at the end of those lines. See a small curve? Spike nodded. Something flat, like a board. Close. Try something flat, heavy, and slightly rounded at the end, like a cricket bat. Ah. Oh. So it is. And the fractures of the long bones are single transverse, so that ties in two. Rory stood back. So, Spike, what else do you deduce from Mr. Roper? Spike, so named for his spectacular hairstyle, tilted his head and pondered. A single assailant, Prof. 
All the blows seemed to have come from the same direction and the same angle. Spike pointed to the man's arms. Here, along the ulnar side of his forearms, there are indications that he tried to defend himself. Spike held his own hands in front of his face. If there were more than one assailant, one of them would probably have held him, while the other gave him the beating. Well done, Spike. I do believe we will make a half-decent pathologist out of you one day. Beneath his sterile mask, Spike beamed with pride. Despite the lad's rather inauspicious start, he was improving daily, and notwithstanding his unorthodox appearance, was starting to embrace the job with real enthusiasm. One thing Rory really liked about Spike was the respect he accorded their reluctant guests. He never had to be told how to treat the recently departed. He just knew, and his touch was sometimes almost reverent. This was something Rory hadn't expected of the young and rather funky technician. Right, if the external examination's complete, shall we see what despicable injuries our killer has caused on the inside? Spike nodded. Can we play the game, sir? Of course, it's all in the cause of improving your education. Based on the visible external trauma, Spike listed the internal injuries he suspected they might find. Rory listened, nodding sagely. Okay, let's take a peek, shall we? Coffee and doughnuts on me if you've got more than half right. Eve rang at 11.45am and told Nicky that she would like to go to Jenny's home that afternoon. There was little she could do on the murder investigation until the forensic reports came back, so Nicky readily agreed. I'll pick you up at two, if that's okay. DCI Cameron Walker will meet us there, Mum. He's going to get hold of Jenny's post-mortem report and relay it straight back to me. Good, good, Eve said in a low voice. Mum, are you okay? You sound pretty down. Just worried, I guess. And I keep thinking what a terrible waste. Jenny worked tirelessly in defence of this country, right from being a lowly aircraft woman to a damned good position in the MOD. And just when she gets a chance to enjoy a life of her own, this happens. Eve sighed. It makes you realise how precious life is, and how vulnerable we all are. Nicky was suddenly flooded with thoughts of Hannah, her only child who died in her teens. Her voice trembled very slightly. Yes, life is fragile, and all too easily lost. Oh, I'm so sorry, darling, I didn't think. This is nothing compared to what you've been through. Forgive me for being so thoughtless. Don't be silly, Mum. Losing anyone you care about is heartbreaking. It's still pretty raw, isn't it? And don't underestimate the shock of finding her. It does haunt me, admitted Eve, but it's also galvanising me into wanting to discover what happened. I will be pleased to see your friend, Cameron. Hey, you, don't get too galvanised. Remember what Joseph said. He's right, you know. Low key, low profile, OK? Cross my heart. Nicky was glad that Eve hadn't completed the saying. Then I'll see you later. Nicky sat quietly and thought about her daughter. The hurt was always there, but sometimes it came back with all the strength of a physical blow. Like now. Nicky closed her eyes and whispered, I love you, baby. Always did, always will. She swallowed and opened her eyes. Things to do. There was a murderer to catch, and her mother needed her. Nicky pushed her chair back and left the sanctuary of her office. Joseph, cover me from two o'clock, and ring me if you hear from Rory. Will do, and if you've got a minute, I've got the lowdown on our dead guy. She walked across to his desk. He's been identified already. When Dave contacted the home, his brother came straight in. He demanded to see Michael immediately, no matter what state he was in. Joseph pulled a face. Luckily, Rory had performed a miracle on him, and he looked quite presentable. The brother identified him straight away. Michael Roper? Yes, Michael James Roper, 26 of 115 Main Road, Greenborough unmarried, still living at home with his parents and one younger brother, Reese. The older one, Liam, who identified him, is married and lives in one of the nearby villages. He said he was supposed to be meeting Michael for a drink last night, but he didn't turn up. Was he worried? Not particularly. Michael was a bit unreliable, apparently. The parents weren't too bothered either when he didn't come home. He sometimes stayed over with a girlfriend. What's his history? asked Nicky. Petty theft, mainly opportunist shoplifting from the retail park. Small-time stuff, but his brother, who has no record and seems squeaky clean, was worried that he'd started mixing with guys that were new to the area. He reckoned they were into something heavier. Drugs? No, housebreaking. Ah, interesting. Joseph nodded. Very. 
And would this brother nor these new guys if he saw them again? The lad is understandably pretty cut up, Joseph replied, but he said he'd do all he could to help us find whoever killed Michael. Good. Well, it's a start, isn't it? Has victim support been notified? Thinking of the parents and the younger sibling? Nicky looked at him. All in place, ma'am. And I gather from your imminent departure that Eve is ready to go to her friend's place. Joseph raised his eyebrows. Nicky shrugged. We are going, but I'm not sure she's ready. She sounded very strange on the phone. She's angry. I know a death like that does make you angry, but I do feel concerned about her. Joseph kept his voice low. Just as long as she doesn't try any surreptitious investigations of her own. That's what worries me most. We both know what Eve is capable of. Don't we just? Nicky gave him a rueful smile. It worries me too, believe me. By the way, what did the super say about keeping Michael's death under wraps? Joseph asked. He's going to do his best, but we all know what the media are like. It will only take a word from one of Michael's family or friends, and the press will be baying for information like ravening wolves. At least Mad Tom will know that we aren't giving his killing high priority. That should rattle him a treat, especially if he's the megalomaniac type. I don't want him too rattled, though. I just want to piss him off enough to force his hand. She frowned. I meant to ask you, why did the killer call Michael Ken Cracker? I looked it up. It's a name given to a housebreaker. Ken is a house, and to crack it, like as in safe cracker, is to break in. Nicky's frown deepened. Is he directing us to this group of thieves that are breaking into all and sundry in the Greenborough villages? He might be, but Michael wasn't a housebreaker. He was just a shoplifter. Joseph shrugged. But he had met up with some very shady people recently, or so Liam said. Perhaps Mad Tom doesn't care who his villains are, as long as they have the thieving instinct. Maybe. We already know he isn't too worried about bending the rules. Nicky glanced at her watch. Better go deal with that paperwork before I head out to Beach Lacey. I shouldn't be too long, and I'll keep in touch. Go careful. Joseph seemed anxious. I'll be fine. An afternoon out with my mother and a DCI hardly rates as a hazardous adventure. Still, we need to keep on our guard. We have no idea what or who is behind Jenny's death. Nicky felt a rush of warmth for him. Just to have someone care about you made everything worthwhile. I'll be careful, Joseph. Honestly. Chapter 7 Nicky's first glimpse of Monk's Lantern took her by surprise. They were just approaching the village of Beach Lacey, when Nicky noticed an avenue of trees leading to an old chapel. It sat apart from the other buildings, and looked out over miles of vivid yellow rapeseed fields and a pasture where horses grazed. What a lovely setting for a church! That would make a beautiful pastel, Mum. It's just your kind of landscape, isn't it? It was Jenny's, too. There was a catch in Eve's voice. You were looking at Monk's Lantern. It's a chapel. It's Jenny's dream come true. Eve said nothing more. Nicky realised it was the first time her mother had been here without her friend. This was not going to be easy for her. Nicky took her time to approach the lovely old property. It's absolutely beautiful. Wait till you see inside. Nicky parked, and they made their way to the old wooden church door. Eve unlocked it and stood back. It was breathtaking. Nicky had seen chapel conversions before, but this was something else. It kept faithfully to the building's history, and the designer had moulded it around the original stained glass and carved wood. The hall soared into the arch roof. Nicky cried out, Christmas tree! A massive fresh blue pine! You can just picture it here! Eve laughed. That is the very first thing Jenny did last Christmas. The place was still like a builder's yard, but she put up the biggest tree I'd ever seen. We sat on upturned plastic buckets, drank Louvain and sang carols. Nicky walked from room to room, amazed at Jenny's creativity and style. The house was striking, but homely too. So, what do you think, Nick? DCI Cam Walker's voice made her jump. Your mum let me in. You didn't even hear me draw up, did you? Stunning. Just stunning. Told you. Cam nodded towards the hall. How's your mother holding up? This must be pretty traumatic for her. It's tough on her. Jenny Foxwell was her closest friend. Cam spoke softly. Nothing is filtered down from London yet, and I'm having trouble finding out which medical examiner did the PM. Surprise, surprise. So what are you here for, Nick? Cam looked at her shrewdly. Anything I can help with? Let's ask Eve. They found Eve sitting in Jenny's study. She had not been wrong. Her friend seemed to have recorded everything. The room was an archive, 
The shelves lining the walls were crammed with box files, ring binders and notebooks. Nicky and Cam stood at the door. There must be hundreds of files in here, Nicky exclaimed. Eve looked around. Somewhere in all this is the answer to why she and Anne died. It'd be a life's work to sort through all this. Cam was gazing around. Then I'd better get started, and if it takes me that long, so be it. Eve looked determined. Nicky took a file from a shelf. She's labelled everything, so maybe if we exclude things like garden plans and oil central heating guarantees and the like, we could narrow things down. Eve smiled for the first time. Sorry, Nicky, but I don't think we'll find what we are looking for in a box file labelled Top Secret Documents. If she made notes, they will be either encrypted or hidden in plain sight, like in a file marked Garden Plans, or even Oil Central Heating Guarantees. Nicky pulled a face. Silly me. I'm so used to dealing with Billy Burglar and his thick-as-shit sidekick itchy grab it and run Cam chuckled. I suggest you start with her computer, Eve. If you find anything that looks helpful, let me get IT to check it for you. I've got a couple of very bright kids who would happily do me a personal favour out of hours. Sorry to bring this up, guys, Nicky said. But should we be rifling through her possessions like this? Eve looked up. I've spoken to her solicitor. I can't take anything away, but I can look for her address book and diary and sort out anything outstanding that needs attention. I am a key holder and next of kin, and I have Jenny's written permission to stay here whenever I want. She looked solemnly at Nicky. Unless something radical happened in recent weeks, Jenny's last will and testament will show that I am her only beneficiary, other than some bequests to charity organisations. Monk's lantern is mine, Nicky. Nicky and Cam's mouths dropped open. I don't know what to say, Nicky said at last. Me neither, Cam spoke in an awed whisper. I guess congratulations wouldn't be quite appropriate, but this is the most incredible property. Will you live here, Eve? Mum? It's too soon to know. Eve gave a convulsive sob. It was always a bit of a joke. We were sure we'd live to be two dotty old women, and at least ninety-five before one of us kicked the bucket. But it has happened, and we need to know why. Eve looked at Cam. Jenny Foxwell did not die of natural causes. She was going to Machu Picchu in the autumn, and they have strict health regulations to let you go. She had a thorough medical examination and was declared not just fit, but in excellent health. Not only that, both she and our friend Dan had just renewed their private pilot's licences, and the aviation board is as hot as hell on heart problems. Nicky stared out of one of the windows at the drive, still trying to take it in. Then she stiffened. Cam, come here. She pointed down the drive. Are they your people? A large black vehicle with tinted windows was driving very slowly past the gates. I'm not even here. I told no one I was coming. Cam muttered. They are nothing to do with me. They watched the vehicle slowly drive on and then accelerate away. Cam's eyes narrowed. Are there any security cameras here, Eve? Yes, and an alarm, though Jenny never used it. Have you got the code by any chance? He asked. Yes, I know it by heart. We need to set it, and make sure the cameras are working as well. Can you show me where the monitors are? Eve went off with Cam, leaving Nicky still staring down the lane. She could feel it. There was an unseen danger lurking in the shadows, and Eve and Monk's lantern were right at the heart of it. Eve had seen the car. Now she knew that her fears had been justified. The time for tears had passed, and now she must act. She had been intending to stay in Monk's Lantern for a few days, but now she knew it would not be safe to do so. Whatever secret Anne Castledine had chanced upon, and possibly told Jenny about, it was something that people were prepared to kill for. Eve Anderson was determined not to be the next to die. I've checked the cameras, and they're all working fine. Cam walked into the office. And the alarm seems all right, although we should run a check if it hasn't been used for a while. I'm sure it's okay. Jenny only set it when she was going to be away, but she was thorough. She would have made sure it was functioning okay. Even as Eve spoke, she had a vision of her and Nicky unlocking the door and walking straight into a silent house. Why had Jenny not set the alarm prior to going to London? It was completely unlike her to forget. Jenny forgot nothing, even under fire. Cam, did you touch the alarm system? Eve asked. He shook his head. Just did a visual, to see if the operating lights were on. Check the number pad for me, would you? Without touching it. 
Cam raised his eyebrows, but made no comment. Together they went into the hall and looked at the keypad. Well, I'm damned, Cam whispered, almost to himself. It's spotless. No marks, no dust. Nor fingerprints. Eve finished the sentence. I'd say someone cleaned it very thoroughly. Wouldn't you? Cameron put his nose to it. With some sort of grease-busting cleanser from the smell. He looked at her anxiously. It certainly wasn't your friend, was it? Hardly the kind of thing you do when you're on your way out to a jolly girl's outing, is it? Someone has been in here. Nicky stood behind them. Looks that way. Cam straightened up. I'm going to have to make this official. We need some bodies watching this place, and I need permission to organise that. He grimaced. Although there's a very good chance they'll tell me to take a hike. We're too strapped to babysit an empty house whose owner isn't coming home. Eve touched his arm. Don't worry. And don't do anything yet. If you draw attention to it, it will just make things even more dangerous. Anyone who's seen us here today will already know a lot about me and my friendship with Jenny. She glanced at Nicky. They'll also know about my family and other friends. What we are doing here is completely normal. A woman has died. Things have to be attended to. That's understood. You were here to support me. But anything more? Nicky looked at Cam and held his gaze. Mum's right, Cam, though it pains me to agree. My head wants a place under observation night and day, but my gut says, go with Eve's wishes. Cam nodded. Okay, we'll act normally. For now, but if anything else happens... He shook his head. I can't go on covering up the fact that something suspicious is going on here. Understood. Nicky looked at Eve, who nodded. Of course. Cam looked at his watch. I must get back. I've got an appointment with Jenny's GP. If I can't get access through our own channels, I'll use the old mate's network. Dr. Dan Lord and I play squash together and we're old school friends. After all this, I can hardly wait to grill him on what the post-mortem shows. Ditto, chorused Nicky and Eve. What about confidentiality? asked Nicky. I'm not asking for details, just the overall verdict. He looked at Nicky. I spoke to Kay, and she said she'd like to talk to you about your camp man. She suggested supper tomorrow evening, you and Joseph. He looked at Eve. And you too, Eve. My wife would love to meet you. I'm going to be a bit busy from now on, thought Eve. It's very good of you, but maybe another time. My conversation isn't exactly sparkling at present. Another time it is. Cameron turned to leave. I don't have to tell you to lock up and check those cameras, do I? Both women rolled their eyes. Didn't think so. See you soon. Chapter 8 The day was ending and the team was busy preparing to go. Nikki, Joseph and Rory sat on in her office, discussing the preliminary findings on Michael Roper. Rory was not in his usual high spirits. External examination showed exactly what we expected. Sustained blunt force trauma leading to death. The poor man was systematically bludgeoned for some length of time. Strange as it may seem, a flat object can cause less damage than something like a baseball bat or a pipe. The greater the surface area struck by the blow, the less severe the injury. But not in this case. The beating was unrelenting. Michael Roper had an excruciatingly painful death. His spleen was ruptured. His liver, heart and lungs were contused. He had both intracranial and intracerebral bleeds, one being an epidural bleed between the dura mater and the skull. Any one of these could have killed him. Rory sighed. Would you like to hear about the multiple fractures now? Nicky groaned. No thanks, I'll read it later, when my stomach is settled. All through Rory's exposition, Joseph had been shaking his head. Why use such force? if it was just to prove a point. That kind of beating is usually reserved for hate crimes or revenge. It doesn't gel with the picture I have of Mad Tom either, Nicky added. He's supposedly trying to portray himself as some kind of king of the gypsies, an old English rogue speaking a secret language, and then he goes and kills someone in the manner of a drug fueled idiot. Maybe he didn't want to get his royal hands dirty and paid said drug fueled idiot to do it for him, Rory suggested but I'd still want the killing to reflect the game I'd set up, Joseph said. Nicky's right. It doesn't fit. Originally, I thought Mad Tom was really well organized. I suspected he had a serious agenda and that his strategy would be deviously clever and worked out down to the last minute detail. I thought he was going to be a formidable game player. 
Now you're not so sure, Nicky said. I'm thrown. It's almost like he's flying by the seat of his pants. No direction and no rules apply. So we stop trying to analyse him. Let's stick to whatever facts we have and take it from there. He's gone very quiet since his call at the crime scene, so let's just be coppers and forget the psychoanalysis. Nicky sat back and folded her arms. Good advice, dear heart. Rory stood up. And I must go back to being a pathologist and stop trying to be a copper. He smiled. Anyway, you can always call Richard Foley the fourth psychologist if you need a real one. Can't. He's on holiday. Rory's eyes lit up. Oh, where has he gone? I'm still looking for ideas. Madeira, I think. Ah, I went there once as a boy with my aunt, God rest her soul. We did one of the Levada walks. It was pretty, with waterfalls and beautiful landscapes. But Aunt had a fit of the vapours and had to be carried back to the hotel. So embarrassing. It caused me lasting psychological trauma. I think it's not somewhere I'd like to revisit. Even though Aunt is long gone, her memory lingers on. Rory shook his head. I'll get the final report to you when all the toxicology, DNA and ancillary test findings are back. Rory? Nicky called him back. There was very little blood, am I right? Very little. The fatal damage was internal. So your man would not have fled the scene, scattering droplets of the victim's lifeblood as he went, if that's what you meant. Just checking. Yeah, always advisable. Rory beamed at them and closed the door behind him. Eve Anderson texted her three remaining friends. It was a shame that Henry's flying lesson had to be postponed, but luckily he had rebooked at a different school. Their meeting place, if an emergency were to arise, had always been Jenny's home. There was no way Eve was going to bring her friends to Monk's Lantern. The word postponed, therefore, simply meant change of venue. They all knew that the second choice was a little cafe bistro down a cobbled Greenborough side street. It was quiet and intimate, the perfect place to chat over a glass of Pinot Grigio. Eve had booked a table under the name of Grant. There were a lot of well-known Grants in the area, so anyone making inquiries would dismiss it. Eve was in her bedroom, sitting on the bed and wondering if whoever had gained access to Monk's Lantern had found what they were looking for. She doubted it. They were clearly clever enough to have effected an entrance without leaving a single trace, but Eve believed Jenny Foxwell would have been even more devious. At least the place had not been ransacked. That was one blessing, though it also spoke of a professional intruder who knew their business. Eve began to pace the room. Part of her didn't want to share her fears with the other three, but they might be in danger, so she had to tell them what was going on. She hoped she wasn't yet under surveillance. She could handle that easily, but it was an inconvenience. She had already planned how to get into the bistro undetected, and she trusted the others to do the same. If only she knew what the post-mortem report said. Eve went downstairs and wandered from room to room, deep in thought. Nicky's friend Cameron had asked her if she would live at Monk's Lantern, and she had said it was too soon to decide. But was it? Only one thing would keep her here in Greenborough, staying near Nicky. But that could prove to be a double-edged sword. The deaths of Anne and Jenny had made her realise that you never really left the past behind. You didn't retire from a life of warfare and subterfuge and step into a new life in St. Mary Mead. Some of the past lingered on, and that could affect those closest to you. Nicky was the most important thing in her life, probably the only thing of real value. That her daughter could in any way be threatened by her old life was just unthinkable. Eve picked up a small carved jade fish from her mantelpiece. Jenny had brought it back for her from her trip to China. The lucky fish had survived, but Jenny had gone. She stroked the smooth, cool surface and wondered about Monk's lantern. She gazed at the fish in her hand and made her decision. Beach Lacey was not far, but it was just far enough. Her house here had been a practical choice at the time, but in truth there was little to love in it. It was just a house but her friend had put a huge amount of love into Monk's lantern, and it needed someone to take care of it, just as Jenny had. That person could only be Eve Anderson. If she survived whatever was going on right now, she would be happy to move there. The best thing she could do for Jenny Foxwell was to keep her dream alive. Joseph and Nicky were about to leave when a civilian stopped them. Someone at the front desk asking for either or both of you? She glanced at her memo. Name of Leonard, Mickey Leonard. 
They glanced at each other, and Joseph raised an eyebrow. I wonder what our friend Mickey wants. They walked into the foyer, and there, grinning broadly, was young Mickey, shining star of the Carber estate. Joseph remembered the wild, hyperactive street kid, uneducated and neglected by his parents. How had he turned into the bright, smartly dressed young man that stood before them now? Sergeant Joe! Inspector Nick! How are you doing? Mickey clasped their hands. We are fine, thanks, Mickey. Joseph smiled. No need to ask how you are. You're looking good, my friend. Life's sweet, as it happens. I've got myself onto an apprenticeship scheme with Arnold's Engineering. How about that? Nicky beamed at him. That's brilliant news. We're so proud of you. Mickey lost his smile. But that's not why I'm here. Could we talk in private for a bit? Fancy a coffee, Joseph suggested. The cafe is just around the corner, and it would get us out of here. Our treat, added Nicky. Sounds good to me. They strolled the few streets to the Café des Amis, and while Nicky ordered the coffees and a Danish for Mickey, Joseph found them a table, tucked away from the rest. Mickey began. My uncle Raymond asked me to speak to you. Joseph looked at him. This was interesting. Raymond kept his distance, and that was fine by him. He gave them no trouble, but he was not the same type of villain as his father Archie. Archie Leonard had had a code of honour, but Raymond had no honour at all. Mickey spoke in a low voice. It's the house thefts in the village. Uncle Ray wants you to know that the Leonard family has nothing to do with them. He's not happy about them either. They're on his turf, and even though he's no housebreaker, they're getting in the way. We never thought there was a connection to Raymond, Nicky said. Not his sort of thing, is it? But the attention the Thebes are getting will be causing ripples in whatever shady dealings Raymond is getting up to. Joseph grinned at Mickey. Mickey smiled back. Spot on, especially after one of the tea leaves got topped. What do you know about that? We've released nothing yet. Nicky shook her head. Don't tell me. The Carborough grapevine is remarkably efficient. Works a treat. Always did, always will. Mickey's smile was back. So, Uncle Raymond's decided to use his network to find out who is behind it. Oh, was he thinking of sorting it himself? Asked Joseph. No, for once he'd like you to do the honours. Anything he gets, I'll pass on to you. And in return? Asked Nicky suspiciously. Nothing, Inspector Nick. It's a freebie. Anyway, if they get banged up, it will be doing him a favour. Joseph drank his coffee. Can't see us turning down any help catching this particular gang of thieves, can you, Nicky? Norway. We'll be glad of the info wherever it comes from. Good. Mickey finished his Danish pastry. What we do know is that they are well organised and are going for specific items. They obviously have some kind of sophisticated system in place to market what they steal and... Mickey paused. Uncle Raymond said there's something odd about them. He can't put his finger on it yet, but there are rumours that they are recruiting. Recruiting housebreakers? Joseph exclaimed. Bet you don't see too many ads down the job centre for that kind of qualification. And as far as I know, there are no apprenticeships either, added Mickey. Nicky leaned forward. Tell Raymond, uh, tell him we appreciate anything he can put our way, okay? We want these thieves behind bars, and because of the suspicious death that seems to be connected to these thefts, we want to get to them fast. Mickey nodded. He drained his coffee cup and stood. Thanks for that. Much appreciated. Always nice to see you, Mickey, and good luck with the new job. Mickey gave them his trademark salute, a straight-fingered hand sharply touching his forehead. He'd done it since he found out that Joseph had been in the military and was one of the few things left over from the bad times. Stay safe. I'll be in touch. Tonight, Greenborough's only department store remained open until seven, and the restaurants and public houses were beginning to get busy. Eve spent a few minutes ostentatiously browsing in the kitchen department of the store, and then slipped quietly out of a side door that opened into an alley that led to the narrow lane where the bistro was located. She had arrived a few minutes early, but someone she recognised was already seated in a small alcove towards the back of the restaurant. Wendy Avery was a tall, athletic-looking woman, with brown hair and very dark eyes. She was one of those women who look amazing whatever they wear. When she saw Eve, she smiled sadly and stood up to hug her. This is very distressing, isn't it? Eve nodded. It certainly is. René Britton and Lou Fawcett soon appeared. It took Eve a few moments to recognise them. René, who had cropped blonde hair, was now a flowing redhead, and Lou, who had iron-grey waves and perfect vision, was wearing an elfin-cut brown wig and designer glasses. Is that really necessary? asked Wendy. We weren't sure, so we thought we might as well, just in case, René whispered. The four women chatted for a while, 
and reminisced about their two old friends. When they had ordered their food, René turned to Eve. You'd better tell us why we are here. It's clearly something serious. In a low voice, and pausing for the waiters, Eve told them of her suspicions. No one said anything for a while. It's not easy to discover that your friends might have been murdered by someone unknown, and that you too could be in the crosshairs. Wendy finally broke the silence. What can we do to help? You clearly need us. What's the plan of action? We need to pull everything we know about what Anne was working on before she died. That seems to be the trigger. So we can start from there. Did she tell any of you what she was doing? Lou nodded. Cataloguing a private collection of rare and antique books. You knew Anne, brain like a giant sorting machine. Where and who for? asked René. It was a country house somewhere in Rutland. She said the owner of the property had recently died and the family needed help with the old man's book collection. It was going up for sale. Lou pulled a face. She never said any more than that, but I guess we can check it out quite easily. Eve butted in. Whatever we do, we mustn't do it openly. Nor googling anything. This needs to be tackled very carefully. Stamford isn't far from Rutland, said Lou. There are several antiquarian bookshops there. I have a couple of mouldy old tomes that I could trail around with and see what I can pick up about local collectors. Good idea. Anything else? She seemed to be thoroughly enjoying what she was doing. Then suddenly she became rather guarded. I got the feeling that she was worried about something, but she never said what. Well, not to me anyway, said Wendy. She spoke to Jenny. I do know that, Lou said. There was a silence as they all considered the fact that whatever she said had probably sealed their friend's fate. We can't meet again for a while, Eve said solemnly. We'll use pay-as-you-go phones to keep in contact. She picked up a bag from the floor beside her. Here, cheap as chips and untraceable. I put in our contacts under nicknames that I'm sure you'll recognise. You need to keep changing the SIM cards, though, just in case. She passed the phones around beneath the cover of the tablecloth. This could just be a big mistake, but I am willing to stake my life on the fact that something terrible happened to both Anne and Jenny. I have someone helping us who has access to official reports. We are waiting for a cause of death. I'll notify you when I know more. And if we do need to rendezvous, use Venue 3, OK? The others nodded. Venue 3 was a local swimming pool with a gym, a sauna and a cafe. Women met there all the time, often more to socialise than to exercise. It was a good, safe spot. They spent the next half hour deciding on a plan of action. Each woman would have a specific line of inquiry to follow. It was time to go. They left one by one. Wendy remained behind with Eve for a while. I'm sorry, Eve. Jenny was your closest friend, wasn't she? Eve nodded. It's horrible, but I can't afford to be emotional. Not yet. I have to find out what happened. Yes, said Wendy. But be careful, won't you? We all have to be careful, Wendy. We are going to need every bit of skill we possess. Let's hope we haven't grown sloppy in our retirement. Wendy gave a little laugh. I don't think so, Eve. Each of us has a special talent. We were a pretty formidable group back then, weren't we? If necessary, we will be again. I hope so. I really do. Chapter 9 As evening turned to dusk and the shadows lengthened, the solitary man stood on the marsh path and stared across the darkening landscape. He looked up and saw the iron-grey clouds of night gathering on the horizon. Soon there would be little light left. He smiled grimly. Good. He supposed Cloud Fen was a beautiful spot, but he had little use for beauty any more. Once he had seen it everywhere. Back then his world had been full of light. All that was gone now. On to the matter in hand— Along the lane ahead of him he could see the only two dwellings on this part of the fen. The smaller cottage was in darkness, but the farmhouse had lights on in the downstairs rooms. The curtains were pulled shut, but he could see two figures moving around. Safety in numbers, eh? He was tempted to take his phone from his pocket and make a call, but he was not here for that. He had been in this place for hours, long before the two police officers arrived home. He had done everything that he set out to do, so he might as well go home. He turned and began the long walk back to his car. I've been thinking about Eve, Joseph said. He was stacking the dishwasher, 
while Nicky rinsed out the wok in the old butler sink. Nicky looked at him. You don't trust her to stay in the background, do you? No, I don't think she's capable of staying in the background. He closed the door and listened until the machine started to fill, then stood with his back to it. I don't actually blame her either. I'm not sure I'd be any different. My thoughts precisely. I know I'd take absolutely no notice of what anyone told me. It's the fact that I love her that's getting in the way. God, she's been in my life for such a short time, but already she's... Nicky gave a little shrug and bit her lip. Joseph, I can't lose her again. Joseph walked around the table and put his arms around her. You won't. We'll get to the bottom of this. Eve is one of the most resilient women I've ever met. Whoever takes her on better be damn sure they know what they are doing, or they'll suffer. Remember the last time someone threatened her? Nicky did. There had been blood, and it hadn't been Eve's. But even so, they had no idea what or who they were up against. That was the frightening part. You can't fight an enemy when you don't know who they are. Nicky took a deep breath, and rather reluctantly stepped away. I'm being silly, and Nicky Galena doesn't do silly. No, you are not being silly. You are being caring, and Nicky Galena actually does that rather well. Let's hope we hear something from Cameron tomorrow. I'm still wondering who was in that car with the blacked-out windows. The way it went past the house, you just knew it was surveillance of some kind. I keep hearing that quote from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Who are those guys? That's the one. Nicky yawned. I think I need a coffee. I'll make it. Joseph opened the cupboard. Hang on, you've moved it. Moved what? The coffee. It's not in its usual place. Nicky ambled across to the cupboard, muttering something about needing a detective inspector to hunt down a bloody jar of coffee. Then she stopped and stared. But... She moved a few things, but the jar was not there. I know I'm tired, but I always put it in that cupboard. Oh, look. Joseph pointed. It's on the dresser. You must have been distracted when you were making the coffee this morning. Nicky didn't answer. She couldn't really argue, although she was certain that she had put it where she always did, and she was tired and worried. Maybe it was Joseph who had been distracted. Joseph made the drinks, and they sat back down at the table. Nicky warmed her hands around her mug. I wonder why Mad Tom has gone so quiet. It's disturbing, isn't it? Joseph nodded. He's probably seething because there's nothing in the press about Michael Roper's death. I just hope he doesn't get murderously angry. Right now, he's probably sitting in his lair planning terrible things. I wonder where that lair is. Joseph looked thoughtful. Can't be too far away, or he wouldn't be able to control things properly. Why is he doing this? My head aches from just trying to fathom that one out. Then the thieves can't thing. Is that just some kind of dramatic window dressing? Or is there a point to it? Joseph added. Nicky rubbed her eyes. As I said, my head aches. Nothing makes sense. Then let's change the subject. Tell me about this converted chapel your mother seems to have inherited. What's it like? It's called Monk's Lantern, and it's breathtaking. I love having her here in Greenborough so close to work, but she'd be a fool not to move there when all this weird stuff is sorted out. Joseph looked doubtful. It's that good. You'll see it soon. Then you'll understand. And Beach Lacey isn't very far. I think her intention was to stay there for a few days to sort out some of Jenny's paperwork, but until we know more about her two friends' deaths, it's far too dangerous. If we ever do. Joseph pulled a face. If someone in MI5 or GCHQ wants to keep a thing quiet, then as far as we mere mortals are concerned, it never happened, and we'd never be able to prove otherwise. Natural causes, case closed. We're at the epicentre of two mysteries, aren't we? Jenny and Anne's death and Mad Tom and his strange game. Nicky stretched and yawned again. I'm going to turn in. Get some sleep yourself tonight, Joseph. Mad Tom isn't hiding in the woodshed. Actually, I'm thinking of reactivating the security system that Vinnie Silver set up for you back when our cat got hurt. Until we identify Mad Tom, it makes sense to keep a close eye on your home. Nicky groaned. Oh, no, I hate all that. I haven't used that thing since it happened. This is my family home, my safe place. Up until around five years ago, we used to leave doors unlocked and no one was ever burgled. I want this to stay being my home, not my prison. I'm not talking machine gun nests on the roof or a barbed wire entanglement around the rhubarb patch. Just some high-tech cameras, short term, that's all. Maybe I'll ring Vinny, see if he'd check it out and reset it for us. 
Much as I love that man, let's give it a few days, can we? If Mad Tom really becomes a threat, then okay, but leave it for a little longer, please? Joseph raised his hands in surrender. For now, but that's all. He smiled at her. You look all in. Get to bed. Just need to check this morning's mail, in case there are any bills. Nicky turned to the letter rack on the front ledge of the old Welsh dresser. It was empty. Joseph? Yes? Mrs. Allsop cleaned today, and she always puts the post in the rack. There were already two envelopes in it, ones that I hadn't got round to dealing with. Now it's empty. Joseph didn't answer. He was staring into the utility room. And I left a pair of black shoes on the shoe rack ready to polish for work tomorrow morning. They're not there. Time to do a walk round of the house, don't you think? Joseph stood up. Have you been upstairs since we came home? No, and you haven't either, have you? He shook his head. Then let's take it slowly and very carefully. Ten minutes later, they were back at the table, the coffee replaced by a bottle of whiskey and two glasses. They had identified exactly twelve things that had been moved since the morning. Mrs. Allsop is a stickler for not disturbing things. If she picks up something to dust, she places it back in exactly the same spot. Always. And there are no signs at all of a break-in. No forced entry. Nothing taken. Nothing damaged. Mind games. It's Mad Tom, isn't it? I'll lay odds on it. Joseph's face was etched with concern. Anger, too. How the hell did he get in? I'm not going to even bother getting a Soko down here. You can bet your life there will be no traces, no fingerprints, no DNA, no nothing. Just a hefty bill from the forensics department. We'll check outside in the daylight. But I think you are right. He's messing with us for the fun of it. Nicky shivered. I hate the thought that some creep has been nosing around my home. It's a violation. It's horrible. And am I correct in supposing that you have lifted the embargo on my phoning Vinnie Silver about the security cameras? Is it too late to ring him now? Cameron Walker lay in bed and pondered the mystery of Monk's Lantern. Earlier that evening, Dr. Dan Lord had mercilessly thrashed Cameron on the squash court, which had put the doctor in a very good mood indeed. Sadly, though, he failed to divulge the contents of the post-mortem, because he had not been sent anything. They had sat in the clubhouse bar for a while after showering. Dan was utterly bewildered by the way Jenny's death had been dealt with. As you well know, Cam, it's in everyone's best interest that sudden or unexplained deaths are investigated properly. I can't quite fathom what has happened here. Did the coroner request an inquest? Cameron asked. No, no inquest. Apparently the coroner's office did arrange for a post-mortem examination to be made, but I'm damned if I know where she was taken. I was rung up and asked if I had been treating her for any recent illnesses, and whether I'd seen her for treatment during the last fourteen days. The usual stuff. And naturally... As she was my patient, I asked to be kept in the loop about the cause of death. All I've had so far is a brief message saying that it was natural causes and would be passed on to the registrar. A fit, healthy woman who, according to a friend, passed a series of health checks recently with flying colours. A woman with no known medical conditions. A woman who, just a few hours before she died, was driving into London for a fun weekend with friends. Dan shrugged. It can happen, Cam. No one knows what goes on inside the human body. Things happen aneurysms for a start. They're like time bombs waiting to detonate. And she didn't have age on her side either. Dan drew in air. You know, although I can't really believe that Jenny was a candidate for something like that, it's more the way it's being handled that worries me. It seems almost clandestine. And the speed at which it's all happened defies belief. He shook his head. Or am I being paranoid? Cameron had a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. Nicky and Eve had been right. He almost saw the curtains being drawn tightly around Jenny Foxwell. No, mate. I rang the Met for a friendly chat, her being a well-thought-of resident of the village and a friend of Top Brass and all that. But no one who dealt with the call to the hotel was around. So they couldn't help me. Cameron pulled the duvet closer around him. Can't you sleep, sweetheart? I'm fine, honey. Just going over a few things in my head. You go back to sleep. His wife sighed and turned over. Cam smiled and gently stroked her hair. She was used to him and his midnight musings. Things often seemed clearer once he got away from the mad hubbub of work. But not tonight. Cameron suspected that there were deep waters flowing beneath Beach Lacey, and they were about to carry all evidence of Jenny Foxwell away with them. He set his jaw and narrowed his eyes. He had liked the woman, and from what he had heard, she was something of a heroine in her day. 
It wasn't right. This was not the way to treat people like her. He had no illusions about what he was considering. It wouldn't be easy. But he, like his old friend Nicky Galena, had a very strong sense of justice. He also had a very astute policeman's nose, and right now he was not smelling roses. Something about Jenny's death stank, and he hated bad smells. He'd do what they asked, and keep this away from official ears, but his spare time was his own. He silently pledged himself to Eve Anderson's cause. If he could help her find the answers she was looking for, then he would, and he'd have no qualms at all. Chapter 10 Cameron Walker left for work half an hour earlier than usual, allowing time for a short detour past Monk's Lantern. The old chapel looked so peaceful in its tranquil setting amid the rapeseed fields. He sat and stared at the sun glinting off the stained glass windows. Looks can be very deceiving, he muttered. If Eve Anderson decided not to live here, it would be a crime, and he would never forgive her. Even his DCI salary and Kay's income combined would not stretch to a place like this, but it was something to aspire to. He remembered what the place was like before Jenny took it on. It had been a wreck. Maybe one day, he thought, and smiled. Cameron narrowed his eyes and sat up straight. Something wasn't right. He thought for a moment, and then climbed out of the car and walked down to the chapel. He padded around to the side of the building and looked up at one of the security cameras. It had been moved so that it pointed away from the area it had been trained on yesterday. With a grunt, he checked the others. All of them had been tampered with. Every entry point was free from surveillance. Well, Eve Anderson, I know that you didn't do this, so who the hell did? He checked that all the doors were still secured, then returned to his car. Before he drove on to work, he rang Nicky and told her what he'd just discovered. I'm not quite sure what to do about this, he said. It could just be bored kids, but there was no evidence to support that, and no damage. I suspect someone stood in a blind spot and used one of those telescopic poles with a soft brush, the kind you clean high windows and conservatory roofs with, and gently nudge them out of alignment. Probably, and we both know it wasn't kids. Nicky sounded edgy, not her usual self at all. Something wrong that I don't know about. Our weirdo got into my house last night and played hide-and-seek with my belongings. I'm suffering from the aftermath of having my personal and very special space invaded. Hell, Nick, I'm sorry to hear that. The bastard. Can I help in any way? Just make sure that wife of yours is still happy to entertain us tonight. I want to know everything I can about this psychotic rubbish babbling turd. Cam laughed. She'll do all she can, I'm sure. And she said to tell you to get to our place any time after seven, if that's all right. That's fine. And regarding the cameras, I'll tell Eve, and we'll take it from there. Meantime, we'll just be aware that someone's got Monk's Lantern in their sights, OK? Look, Nick, I've got a couple of trusted officers. I'm going to get them to do a little bit of private obo work off the radar. I'll tell them I've heard a rumour that your housebreaking gang could be targeting empty houses in our area, and Monk's Lantern would be the perfect drum for them. No more than that, I promise. And they will report to me, and me only. Is that all right with you? As long as it's so low-key that it's undetectable. They will be veritable ghosts, I promise. And Nick, before you go, I'll pin down my doctor friend, and the post-mortem on Jenny Foxwell is natural causes. Shit and double shit! I know, just as you said it would be, but between you and me, he is concerned about the way it was handled. Dr Dan Lord is a veritable terrier when he gets his teeth into something, so I know he won't let it rest until he has answers that he's satisfied with. Nicky let out an audible groan. Normally I'd be delighted to hear that, but on this occasion I'm a bit on the nervous side. Don't let him meddle, Cam. He could get more than he bargained for. You really think dark forces are at work here? I think some very scary people are working to cover something up. I also think that they aren't governed by the same rules as us. Then we must tread warily. He waited for a second, then added, Tell Eve I'm with you guys on this. Keep me in the background, and I might just be of some use to you. Thanks, Cam. I appreciate it. And Cam, where is Jenny Foxwell's body? I have no idea, Nick, nor does Dan Lord. As far as we know, the last people to see her were the funeral directors that placed her in a body bag and drove away with her. But the coroner or his deputy officer would have made the arrangements for the post-mortem. So where did they send her? No one knows. And as no copy of the post-mortem was sent to Dan, he has no paper trail to follow. Nicky didn't answer immediately. For some reason, what you've told me comes as no surprise. But her next of kin will want her body back for burial and they're going to cause a right royal rumpus to get it. 
I'd sure hate to be the one on the end of the phone when Eve gets going. Oh, you were so right. Better get moving, Nick. See you tonight. Looking forward to it. Take care, and I really mean that, Cam. Take great care. At work, Cameron immediately went into the morning meeting. It was not easy to concentrate on the details of his fraud case, for his thoughts kept drifting back to Monk's Lantern. As soon as they broke up, Cam's chief superintendent approached him. Got a moment, Cameron? Of course, Mum. My office. Chief Superintendent Carol Decker rarely ventured downstairs. The general comings and goings of CID didn't really rate too highly in her order of precedence. She was wholly strategy, standards and operational policy, and she was an absolute magician when it came to budget management. Carol Decker took her role as the most senior local officer very seriously, and her decision-making and professionalism had earned her considerable respect, if not affection. I'm asking a favour, actually. She sat opposite him and narrowed her arm and eyes. I'm sure you've heard that Jennifer Foxwell of Monk's Lantern Beach Lacey has died suddenly and tragically. Cameron drew in a breath. Yes, Mum. A terrible loss. I understand she was something of a legend in the RAF when she was younger. I knew her quite well. For once, Decker seemed almost lost for words. This is a real shock. I only spoke to her a few days ago. She was going to help out with a media campaign I'm planning about helping the public to engage with the police. She was really enthusiastic about it. Now? What was she going to ask him? The thing is, obviously her death was unexpected, so I have no idea about funeral arrangements. Jenny was a very generous supporter of police charities, and I'd like to know that we are properly represented. Would you keep an eye on things for me, and field any inquiries that come our way? I'm off to a conference for several days, and then I'm bogged down with regional stuff, so can I leave it with you to do whatever is needed? Absolutely, Mum. Cameron's heart leapt. Carte blanche, or near enough. Mum, I've had some intel about thieves marking empty houses. Would it be possible to do the occasional drive-by of Monk's Lantern, just to keep an eye on things? Carol Decker shrugged. If you think it's really necessary, but nothing heavy. We just don't have the money for that sort of thing any more. We'll just do a quick check if we are out that way, Mum. He suddenly decided to chance his arm. How did she die, Mum? Do you know? Heart attack, I think. Although I haven't heard any details. I'm sure it will be in the papers soon enough. Don't bank on it, thought Cameron. Decker stood up. Thank you, Cameron. I'll leave it in your capable hands, then. My pleasure, Mum. And please don't worry. I'll deal with everything. As she closed the door, Cameron decided that the angels must be smiling down on him. Whatever he did now, it was with the chief's blessing. Well, sort of. So at least no one would query his interest in her untimely death. Thank you, boss, he whispered to the closed door. Thank you very much. Chapter 11 Nicky knew it would be Mad Tom. She picked up her phone, wondering what his next gambit would be. So how does it feel, Detective Inspector? Nicky bit back her response. She wasn't going to give him what he wanted. Sorry? Who is this? She kept her voice steady, and hoped he wouldn't hear her heart thudding like a jackhammer. Oh, I see. That's your line now, is it? Well, it won't work. I know exactly how you're feeling, and I'm very pleased. What you want from me? Nicky hissed. I want you to suffer. Nicky swallowed. Tell me why. The laugh that echoed down the line had an edge of hysteria. Where would I start? Why do you want me to suffer? What have I done to you? Oh, just allowed my whole world to turn black. That's all. Made me what I am now. The pain in his voice was palpable. Then can I help you? She asked, hoping she didn't sound patronising. Too little, too late. Now back to business. This time I'll play nicely. If you want to save a life, find the ace of spades who has lost a chunk of gin. Then look for the cracksman who bit the blow. There was a click, and once again Nicky was left staring at the receiver. She had scribbled down what he said, and now she pulled the print out of the Cant Dictionary from her drawer and quickly leafed through it. It didn't take long. They needed to find a widow who had lost a diamond, then look for the thief who had stolen it. Oh yeah, that's simple, huh? She threw down her pen. The widow and the missing diamond were most likely already on their records, but if they'd been able to find who stole it, they'd have had them banged up weeks ago. 
She heaved a sigh and went to look for Joseph. She found him with Cat and Ben, discussing their next pub crawl. The Nightingale Watch actually coughed up some interesting info last night. Cat looked excited. We're on the right track, we're certain of it. The landlord said a couple of men have been coming in over the last week or so who are being ultra-friendly with the locals. Drinks all round with lots of noisy banter, added Ben. They told Jack, the landlord, that they were brothers looking for a new home in the country for their parents. But he thought that was a crock of shit, Cat grinned. He's going to keep an eye out and give us a bell if they turn up again. Nicky nodded. That's a start, and for what it's worth, I think you are on the right track too. It makes sense, so keep at it. She placed her notebook on the desk. But right now, sodding mad Tom has given us another task. They all looked at her. Another threat? asked Joseph. She nodded and showed them the translation. Immediately, Ben was at his computer checking the files on recent thefts. He's going to kill again. Cat looked troubled. But won't you just do it anyway, like before? He says he'll play the game this time for what that's worth. He lied last time, didn't he? Ben looked up from the monitor. Think I've got it, Mum. A Mrs. Sheila Willoughby, recently bereaved, from C's End Lane, just outside Greenborough, had her mother's vintage diamond engagement ring stolen. Worth around one and a half grand, apparently. It was the only thing taken. He stared at the screen. No one but her fits the bill. And isn't C's End Lane quite close to the Nightingale Watch public house? Nicky said thoughtfully. Cat went to the map where the coloured stickers were still in place. About a mile away, Mum, so yes, it is. Ring your friendly landlord, Cat, and see if Sheila Willoughby is one of his patrons. This could be our first viable connection. And ask him if he has CCTV. Some footage of his ever-so-friendly visitors could be very useful. Already done that, Mum, said Ben. He's going to look through it this morning for us. Good. Who attended the theft, Ben? He read down the report. PC Collins, Mum. Excellent. Dave, pop down to the front office and see what shift Yvonne is on today. If she's in, get her to come up when she's free. Dave stood up. On my way. She looked at Joseph. I need you to listen to the recording of Mad Tom's message this morning. He said more than he's ever said before, and it's actually quite interesting. He lifted his phone. I'll get that sorted immediately. Back in her office, Nikki allowed herself to hope that they might finally be getting somewhere, and an added bonus was that the Leonard family also wanted the thieves caught. She flopped down in her chair. She desperately wanted to solve this case. Her mother was far more important. Nikki knew she shouldn't feel that way, especially when one man had died and another was under threat, but she did. She couldn't help it. She was shit scared for her mother. She pulled out her mobile. Eve Anderson? Her mother answered. Just checking in. Relax. I'm still alive. Her laugh sounded slightly forced. Someone has been tampering with the security cameras at Monk's Lantern. I thought you should know. Hmm. That makes me think that whoever got in before didn't find what they were looking for. And they're going to try again. For sure. Mum, have you talked to the solicitor about the funeral arrangements and Jenny's family? In depth. Eve sighed. Not an easy conversation, believe me. For he confirmed that she had no immediate relatives at all. I am the main beneficiary. And her funeral? Burial. She expressly stated that she was not to be cremated. Eve paused. Jenny, well, actually, there were several of us. Your father included. We were caught up in a fire on board an aircraft carrier. Several of our fellow officers perished. After that, well... Nicky exhaled. She seemed to be learning new things about her family all the time. I understand. This was not the time to probe her mother's life history, and now she had to tell her that Jenny's body seemed to have gone AWOL. Is the solicitor arranging to bring her home from London? Eve said that he was. Jenny had made several specific wishes in her will that had to be adhered to, the burial being one of them. Has he given you any kind of time scale? Nicky asked. Not yet, but I'm getting bad vibes from everyone right now, my daughter included. Is there anything else I should know? Nicky silently cursed. Her GP is chasing the full post-mortem report, but he's having trouble getting hold of it. And I hate to say this, but no one will tell him where Jenny was taken for autopsy. I see. Cameron and his doctor are doing everything possible to sort this, I promise you. Eve didn't answer. Nicky had a good idea that she was already planning an inquiry of her own. Nicky, I will get my friend home, where she belongs. 
You do know that, don't you? Yes, Mum, I do. We'll help you, and so will Cam. He asked me to be sure to tell you that. The trouble is, there is no way we can get officially involved, since no crime was committed, apparently. Don't worry, sweetheart. I know exactly how the land lies. There was an edge to her mother's voice, and Nicky knew that nothing on earth would stop her once she decided to take things into her own hands. Anything I find out, I'll pass on, I promise, Nicky said. Eve thanked her and hung up, leaving Nicky more worried than ever. Nicky was back in the CID room. Joseph saw her anxious expression and knew she had been talking to her mother. Yvonne is in on the late shift, so Dave left a message for her. Cats dashed off to the Nightingale watch. The landlord has located those two men on the CCTV, and IT have downloaded the voice recording to my computer. Should we go and listen to Mad Tom's ramblings? Nicky nodded. I'll be interested to hear your take on what he said. Together they listened to the conversation, rewound it and listened again. Joseph rubbed his chin thoughtfully. If I were a psychologist, I would say that man is eaten up with anger, wouldn't you? And there were several key points. The use of the word allowed. You allowed whatever it was to happen. That saying that you either condoned or failed to prevent a third party from carrying out some action. Nicky agreed. He was quite specific about that word, wasn't he? And too little, too late. He's blaming you, or the police in general, for not doing their job properly. And there is pain in the voice when he's not uttering his threats. He has obviously suffered. And he's decided that you will pay for it. For what, though? That's the big question. And why dress it up with all this gibberish? Why not just threaten us? Or if he likes games, set us some tests. But what's with the secret language stuff? Maybe Kay will shine some light on it tonight, Nicky said, not sounding hopeful. Joseph was looking forward to seeing Kay Walker again. She was an intelligent and astute woman. Despite her academic qualifications, her feet were firmly planted in the real world and with her family. She was great company, with a dry, self-deprecating wit, and Kay was incredibly perceptive. Can we drive past Monk's Lantern? Joseph asked. I really want to see this place. Absolutely. Before she could say more, Dave approached them. Sorry to interrupt, but I've had a call from our dead man's brother, Liam. He thinks he's seen one of the men Michael Roper was getting pally with. He's in the shopping precinct, and I said I'd meet him there right away. Is that okay? Joseph looked to Nicky. Maybe things were taking a turn for the better. I'll go with Dave, if that's all right. Nicky shooed them out. Go! Go! It took only a matter of minutes to get to the small shopping precinct in the centre of Greenborough, they found Liam Roper leaning against an advertisement board, keeping his eyes trained on the occupants of a small cafe. When he saw them coming, he nodded towards two men who were sitting at a small table drinking black coffee. Dave glanced across to Joseph and gave him a knowing smile. Neither man meant anything to Joseph, but clearly Dave had their number. I saw them down by the river and followed them here. The tall overweight one seems to be giving the little skinny one a bit of an ear bashing. Liam looked hopefully at Joseph. It's the big guy that my brother was drinking with, although I've seen him with the other one a few times too. The skinny little runt with the tattoo on his neck is Terence Stevens, typical young toe rag. I've felt his collar more times than I've had hot dinners, but he's strictly small stuff, mainly batteries nicked from Boots, the chemist. Nothing heavy. Dave transferred his gaze to the other man. But that face is new to me. I took a chance and got a picture of him on my phone. Pretended I was taking a selfie with a shop assistant that I know. It's not brilliant, but it might help. Liam passed Joseph his phone. Joseph took it and felt a jolt of empathy for the lad. He really wanted to help find his brother's killer, and was obviously prepared to take risks if need be. That's not bad. We can try to enhance it, so at least we have a face to compare it with if a name comes up. I'll just put my mobile number in your phone, Liam, and you can send it to me. He keyed in the number and handed the phone back. I'm grateful for this. It's a big help but try to stay well out of their sight. I don't want you getting hurt, too. Aren't you going to arrest them? Liam asked. We can't do that yet. There's nothing to go on, and we don't want to show our hand too soon and scare them off. But don't worry. We will be keeping a close eye on their activities. Dave grinned at the disappointed expression on Liam's face. It's all right. Young Terence is not a very bright thief. He could lead us straight to some of the more serious players thanks to you. He patted Liam's arm. Leave this with us now, lad. 
We'll take it from here, okay? Liam nodded. I'll ring you if I see anything else that might help, but I'll keep a low profile, I promise. Joseph didn't believe him, but there was little he could do about it, so they made their way back to the station. At the door to the CID room, Nicky greeted them with the words, Cat's got something. Our widow with the stolen diamond ring and her recently deceased husband were regulars in the Nightingale Watch Pub. Excellent, Joseph replied. So Cat was right. That really gives us somewhere to start, doesn't it? It does. And not only that, we have some excellent stills from the CCTV footage of the two brothers who were given at large with the locals. I'm just about to ask Uniform to get their officers into all the pubs in the area. This is clearly how they suss out their targets. Can we see the photos? Joseph asked. Nicky passed him three or four black and white images. Dave peered over his shoulder. Snap! Joseph took out his phone and showed Nicky Liam Roper's selfie. It was one of the two men from the Nightingale Watch. Looks like this one is the organiser, doesn't it? said Nicky thoughtfully. Or at least a liaison man. Joseph agreed. I can't see him being the cracksman. I think you are right. He probably sources the labour and cases the joints. Before he could say anything further, his phone rang. Sergeant Joe! Mickey, you okay? Got a name for you, Joe. Uncle Raymond says to tell you we have guests from out of town. He's working on the rest, but he eyeballed one of the gang in the town today. The bloke is known as the Surveyor. His real name is Dougie Haskin, and he's from Hampshire. Thanks, Mickey. We appreciate it. Joseph paused, then added, Hey, if I send you a photo, would you ask your uncle if he recognises the face? Uncle's here. Send it over and I'll ask him. In a few moments, Mickey was back. That's Dougie Haskin, Joe. And Uncle Ray says he's no petty thief. He's very clever. To our knowledge, he's never been nicked. He's a background boy, but he plays for high stakes. Joseph heard a deep voice in the background, and Mickey added, Another thing, we reckon that whatever this enterprise is, it's big. Maybe ten or a dozen guys working it. Joseph let out a low whistle. And they're still recruiting. Sounds like there's a new criminal business venture here in the Fens. Joseph frowned. And I bet your uncle is about as pleased with that news as we are. I want them gone, dear sister. Raymond's gravelly voice came on the line. And fast. They've killed one man, Raymond, and more may follow. So believe me, we are not taking this lightly. This is our number one priority, I promise you. Anything I get, it's yours. The phone went dead. Joseph looked at Nicky. We have a name to our photo. Dougie Haskin, a.k.a. The Surveyor. Apparently clean, but I'll check with Hampshire. I'll do it, Sarge, Cat called out. We should have asked Raymond about the other brother from the Nightingale Watch. Maybe he knows him as well. I'll scan the photo and send it to Mickey. We may get lucky twice. Dave looked down at his phone and smiled. Bonnie got my message about Sheila Willoughby and the stolen ring, and she's coming in early to speak to us. Nicky grinned. Good old Devon. Any excuse to come into work? She's not so bad now she has that little dog to replace old Holmes, said Joseph. Yvonne Collins doesn't function properly without a canine companion. Sorry to interrupt, but nothing on Haskins, Sarge, Cat called out. I put out a few feelers, but he's not showing up anywhere. OK, leave it there. We've got tabs on him. That's the best we can do at present. Nicky stood up. Now we need to wait and see what uniform can find out from the local landlords. Chapter 12 Lou Fawcett liked old bookshops, and she also liked Rutland so it was no chore to go on the hunt for a recently deceased antiquarian book collector. There was no one like that in Stamford, so she moved on to Oakham, but again had no luck. Undeterred, she drove to the small market town of Uppingham. Its honey-coloured buildings, numerous art galleries, antique shops and so very English specialty shops were a delight. She purchased all the local papers and scanned them thoroughly for the slightest hint of the dead book collector. Again, she came up with nothing. When Anne Castledine had told Lou about her cataloguing job, she had mentioned that the old gentleman specialised in books pertaining to Victorian botanists, plant hunters and illustrators. In her own small library of collectible books, Lou found a volume entitled The Lady's Companion to the Flower Garden, published 1841. She had bought it for the beautiful illustrations, but it would make a perfect excuse to talk to the bookshop owners. She actually knew its value to the penny, but that didn't matter. She wondered for over an hour, until she found a small shop that at first glance looked closed. Just as she was walking away, the door opened. An elderly man wearing a brightly coloured silk waistcoat with a matching bow tie called out to her. 
so sorry. Can I help you at all? She smiled, and clasping her precious volume, walked back. Door sticks. I really must get some WD-40 on it. The old man glowered at it as if the door were to blame. Do come in and browse. Lou found so many interesting books that she almost forgot the purpose of her visit. After a while, she walked back to the polished wooden counter and purchased a copy of A Vision of Eden, The Life and Work of Marianne North. Ah, such a talented and brave woman. You know her history? Lou nodded. This is one of my favourite books, but I loaned it to a friend and never got it back. I saw her paintings of tropical and exotic plants at the Botanic Gardens at Kew last year, and was totally blown away. They chatted for a while, and Lou asked if he had time to give her an idea of the value of a volume of her own. She produced her book, and the old man took it almost reverently. Very rare to see a first edition, miss. It will be worth quite a lot of money. I sold a fourth edition a while back. It fetched two hundred pounds, so... I suppose it doesn't really matter, said Lou, almost giggling at the miss. I'll never sell it. My books are my friends, and I have a special passion for the old botanists. She gave him a rather sad look. Trouble is, none of my real friends are particularly interested in the subject, and it would be lovely to have someone to talk to about them. The only person around here who would have agreed with you, miss, sadly passed away recently. Lou stifled her cheer and quickly composed herself. Really? Mayor Commodore Arthur Rowlings, miss. He had a wonderful collection of antiquarian books. I suppose the family will just break it up and sell it. Such a shame. Forgive me for asking, but you wouldn't have an address or a telephone number, would you? If they are selling, maybe they'd let me put in an offer for one or two volumes. I'm sorry. I don't, the old man said. But if you leave a contact number, I could let you know if I should see or hear anything about an auction. A warning sign flashed up in Lou's mind. Oh, don't worry. It's very kind of you, but I'm sure I couldn't afford them anyway. She thanked the man and returned to her car. At least she now had a name. As soon as Lou went out, the bookshop owner put up the clothes sign and hurried back to the office. He picked up the phone and dialed a number written on a post-it note and stuck next to the phone. D.S. Fitch, it's Robert Callum from the bookshop, sir. I've had one of those inquiries that you asked me to watch out for. He listened to the other man speak, then said, Yes, she made a purchase, but I'm afraid she used cash, not a card. And no, she didn't give a name. He paused, listening. She was mid to late sixties, I suppose. Brown hair and glasses. But I think I can help you a little more than that. When she left, I took her registration number, so I'm sure you'll be able to track her from that. Another pause. My pleasure, I'm sure. And I hope you catch them before they steal those wonderful books. Robert Callum replaced the receiver and shook his head. She had seemed such a nice woman. It was hard to believe that she might be the leader of a gang of thieves who specialised in stealing articles of cultural significance. D.S. Fitch had insisted that a woman had been behind a whole spate of crimes involving the theft of rare books, manuscripts and maps. Fitch had quoted a recent daring raid that had netted over two million pounds worth of antiquarian books. The press called the thieves tome raiders. The old man sighed. What was the world coming to? Eve Anderson sat in Jenny's study in Monk's Lantern and looked around. She had notified the solicitor that she would be there, phoning Jenny's former colleagues and friends. That was not the case, of course, but it sounded plausible. Right now, Eve was trying to think as Jenny would have done, to be her. She knew her friend better than anyone, and sometimes their minds worked in a very similar way. So she sat in Jenny's chair and considered where Jenny might hide some secret piece of information. When she first walked into the study with Nicky and Cam, the sheer number of books, papers, folders and files seemed overwhelming, and she despaired of ever finding anything. But overnight, her resolve had returned. After all, she had a head start on whoever else was looking for this information. They didn't know Jenny Foxwell, or how her clever mind worked. Eve sat back, rested her elbows on the arms of the chair, and let her hands rest loosely in her lap. She took a few deep breaths. It was useless running around like a headless chicken, grabbing at files and madly leafing through notebooks. She should relax and simply observe the room and its contents. It would help if she knew exactly what she was looking for, 
but all she knew for sure was that it concerned Anne Castledine and something she had discovered while cataloguing a dead man's old books. As a younger woman, Anne had been something of a daredevil, even by their standards. Her other love, after flying, was scuba diving. Anne and Jenny had once gone to the small Malaysian island of Sipadan to see the coral reefs at Barracuda Point. Anne had said it was one of the best dives in the world, and Jenny had declared it the experience of a lifetime. Eve's eyes travelled around the room. If she were Jenny, she would conceal her notes in something that represented Anne in some way, but not obviously so. She wondered how many people knew about the trip to Malaysia. Probably very few. She stood up and moved around the crowded office, looking for anything connected to diving. She checked an atlas, a photo album marked Sipadian Holiday, a folder that held brochures for diving equipment and several books on dive sites. Okay, she thought. What else did they do that could be significant? They had both done charity skydives, but that was rather well known. Eve continued to search for about an hour, looking for anything that connected Anne to Jenny or the rest of the group. She found nothing. She was certain she was on the right track, but she was also very much a realist. She wasn't going to just chance upon something that had been carefully hidden, though she was sure that she could find it. The sudden trill of the doorbell shattered her reverie. Eve stiffened. No one knew she was here, and her car was concealed from the road. It could be someone innocuous like the postman, or it could mean danger. She decided to be cautious and ran up the stairs to where she could see the driveway in the porch area. A smartly dressed man stood outside the front door. She didn't recognise him, but he didn't look exactly threatening. Something about him said policeman. Eve went down to the door and called out, Can I help you? Mrs. Anderson, I'm D.C. Smith, ma'am. D.C.I. Walker asked me to keep an eye on this house. I was on my way home when I saw a car around the back, so I thought I should check it out. Eve opened the door. There's nothing wrong, officer. I'm just sorting out a few things, but I do appreciate the concern. The young man was around twenty-five, with a fashionable haircut and a ready smile. I'm more than happy to wait with you until you're through. He gave her a conspiratorial grin. D.C.I. Walker said you'd probably make an appearance even though he'd advised you against being here alone. How perceptive of him. Eve raised an eyebrow. But I could be a while. Anything I could help you with? No, detective. I hardly know what I'm doing myself. It's a very sad time. My condolences for your loss, Mrs. Anderson. Thank you. I met Miss Foxwell a few times. I thought she was a really nice person. As you say, a very sad time. D.C. Smith looked thoughtful. I'm sure this is none of my business. But is there something suspicious about her death? Eve lost her smile. Why would you ask that? The young policeman looked down. Uh, I was in the village a few days before she died. She was filling up her car at the petrol station. She told me she was going to London and asked me to let her know if I noticed anyone hanging around Monk's Lantern. Eve thought fast. I think maybe you should come in after all. She stood back to let him enter. Inside, the detective looked around, wide-eyed. What a stunning place! Eve just nodded and pointed to the sofa. Sit down and tell me more about what Jenny said. Well, she gave me her mobile number and asked me to contact her if I noticed anything suspicious going on here. My mum and I live just down the lane in one of those farm cottages over on the left, ma'am, so I suppose she thought I'd be in a position to see more than anyone else. He shrugged. And now my boss is watching this place on the quiet-like even though the lady herself is no longer with us. It just seems a bit strange to me. Eve frowned. Did Jenny say why she was worried about this house? She went away dozens of times, but she never bothered before. She just set the alarm and was off. To be honest, she never said, but she didn't look quite herself. She seemed distracted, and after she drove off, I noticed another car, certainly not a local vehicle, move away shortly afterwards. Don't ask me why, but I got the feeling someone was watching her. Eve felt her chest tighten. Did you tell someone about this? No. I followed her myself, ma'am. But when I got here, she was safe home and there was no sign of anyone else. I decided I'd imagined it. We detectives can see a crime in everything if we look hard enough. Darren Smith smiled at her apologetically. And my boss would have had my guts for garters if he knew I'd been asking questions. As I said, it's none of my business. I happen to think you were being very astute, young man. I also suggest that you were right about that vehicle. Did you get the number? Darren reached for his pocketbook and flipped through it. 
Have it from my beat bobby days. He read the number out to her. And the type of vehicle? A big saloon car, black, quite new. I'm pretty sure it was a Saab, but I only saw it from the side as I was paying for my petrol. Then I was too busy trying to catch the registration number. Eve sat back. So Jenny was being followed a few days prior to her death. Her eyes narrowed. Death from natural causes. My ass. Darren Smith stood up. Well, if I can't help, I'd better get on home. He took one last look around. This place is really beautiful. He looked up at a high window ledge. I love those pieces of coral and those crystal specimens. They are really cool. She thanked D.C. Smith and asked him to keep his eyes peeled, but on no account to tackle anyone alone. Bring your boss. Or fail in that. She scribbled her mobile number on a sheet torn from a memo pad and handed it to him. Ring me. At the door, she touched his arm lightly. I mean it, detective. Please don't be a hero. Do not tackle anyone you see around here. The young man looked curiously at her. You remind me of Mrs. Foxwell. She had that same manner about her. No nonsense. And scary as hell. You'd better believe it. Jenny and I were cut from the same cloth. After he had left, Eve stood in the hallway and stared up at the window ledge. She had seen that collection of corals and pieces of mineral many times before, but had never noticed that the central piece, a glorious red sea fan, was mounted on a heavy wooden base. She walked slowly up the stairs and took down the piece of red coral. Back downstairs, she upturned the coral and inspected the wooden base. It didn't take long to see that it was constructed rather like a box. The base slid open to expose a small compartment. Eve smiled when she saw the folded sheet of paper. Thank you, Jenny, she whispered. She removed the paper and put the coral back. Only then did she unfold the paper. A string of numbers, in Jenny's handwriting, followed by a gap and then another single number. Eve exhaled. This was it. She had no idea what it meant, but she knew it was what she had been looking for. She swallowed hard. Now that she had held this tiny but valuable piece of information in her hands, she really was in danger. Eve committed the whole thing to memory, then placed the paper in the fireplace and set it alight. She watched the paper burn and then ground the ash with the poker until nothing remained. For a moment she contemplated her options, then sank back on the sofa and pulled out her cheap throwaway mobile phone. Her first call was to Nicky, but it went straight to voicemail. She left a brief message and then punched in a new number. She didn't know what the numbers meant, but she knew a woman who would, and this time her call was answered. Eve? Renée, I'm going to give you some numbers. Work your magic, if you will. Then we need to meet. ASAP. Venue 3. We do, because Lou rang me, and she has a name for our dead bibliophile. Plus, Wendy and I haven't exactly been hanging around. We all have some news. Then seven tonight. Pass it on for me. Will do. Now give me those figures. Eve closed her eyes and repeated the numbers. René wrote them down and read them back. Got it. It looks pretty straightforward. Bless her. Jen was not much into ciphers, as I recall. One of her only weak points. Eve sighed. Better go. See you later. Eve pushed the phone back into her pocket and gathered up her things. She stopped in the hall, then went back and activated the alarm system. She had already realigned the cameras. It would probably do no good at all against pros, but it would be an irritant. She smiled grimly. Anything to cause annoyance was fine by her. Eve locked the door and took her car keys from her pocket. Then she froze in her tracks. Why was the young detective's car still parked at the bottom of the drive? A dozen scenarios flashed through her mind. Then she heard a groan. She spun in the direction of the sound. Lying on the path along the side of the chapel was D.C. Darren Smith. She looked around quickly, but no one was there. She ran and knelt down at his side. He was partially conscious, but his smart hairstyle was now smeared and caked with blood from an open wound just above his right ear. Eve checked his pulse and his eyes. She didn't like that unfocused stare one bit. Hang on, Darren. I'm ringing for help. Just lie still. You're going to be fine, okay? Her words sounded empty. Did he even know she was there? The wound looked nasty, and he was mumbling incoherently. She squeezed his hand and continued to talk to him. She grabbed her phone from her pocket and, with one hand still holding the detectives, began to key in 999 with the other. The phone was knocked from her hand. The second blow made her see stars. But even worse was the sting in her upper arm. 
because it was so frightening. After that, things got confusing. Eve saw two assailants, not the one she was expecting, and then the whole world seemed to devolve into a confusion of fists and shouting and noise. Then there was silence. Eve slipped into unconsciousness. Chapter 13 Joseph's mobile rang, just as the 4pm meeting was about to start. Vinny, you got my message. Vinny Silver was an old army mate who specialised in high-tech security systems. After he and Joseph left the special forces, Vinny had made a name for himself working privately. Bunny, good to hear your voice again. Guess you need my help again. Vinny always used Joseph's old army nickname Bunny, as in the Easter Bunny. Vinny was tall and wide and as strong as an ox. Nicky had once said she could picture him felling a giant redwood with a very small axe. Joseph smiled into the phone. Looks that way, my friend. Not more bad guys sneaking around on the fence. Just one. The bastard got into Nicky's home last night. Then make up a spare bed in that dinky little cottage of yours. I'm on my way. He laughed wickedly. Can't have that gorgeous detective inspector troubled by no bogeymen, can we? Cool it, Vinny. Joseph laughed. And forget the dinky cottage. We will be staying at Cloud Cottage Farm. Hey, have you two finally got it together? Joseph sighed. Here we go again. There had to be a downside, didn't there? I forgot about that long nose of yours. Long nose my ass, bunny boy. I just cannot believe that you'd have gone all this time with a woman like Nicky Galena right there on your doorstep and not... Shut up, Vinny. Just get your ass over here and sort out this bloody system. It's so complicated I hardly know how to switch it on. As it happens, I have just completed an estimate on a big security system in York. I can be with you in a couple of hours. Where shall I meet you? Joseph suddenly remembered their meal with Cam and Kay. He wondered if they could fit in another place at the table. He began to explain about the meal, but Vinny interrupted. Actually, that's not a problem. I have a whole load of calls to make and some business appointments to sort. I'll hang on here and get that put to bed, and then motor down a bit later. I'll see you at Nicky's place around ten, if that's okay. Perfect. Joseph became serious. Nicky's pretty gutted over this creep getting into the farmhouse, Vin. It's really shaken her, I know. Invasion of privacy is a sick-making bloody thing. Some people can't even stay in the house after it happens. They have to move. Nicky's more angry than anything, but we know this maniac is still out there, so whatever you can do, we'd appreciate it. A nice well-aged bottle of something from the Isles, and I'll make Cloud Cottage Farm as invincible as Fort Knox. Joseph laughed. You're on. See you later. Nicky was just bringing the morning meeting to a close when WPC Yvonne Collins walked in. Just the woman, Nicky called out. She told Yvonne about Mad Tom's latest threat. Yvonne, was there anything particular about that break-in that could possibly lead us to the man who did it? A trademark? Yvonne shook her head. Not really, but it was a very professional hit. No mess, no noise, and whoever did it went straight for the ring. In, out, end of. Was there any other valuable things around? Asked Dave. Let's just say that someone could have made a tidy sum with the Nikon digital SLR camera alone. It was sitting on the dining table, just waiting to be picked up. Yvonne looked in her pocketbook. Mrs Willoughby thought her husband had paid over two grand for it. Dave scratched his head. That shows considerable willpower, doesn't it? I can't think of any local rogues with that much self-control. Can you? Yvonne shook her head. No, I certainly can't. Mrs Willoughby was obviously still trying to get over her husband's death, but she was really together. She made a clear statement, no waffle. Quite unusual. Yvonne frowned. Cat was telling me about the connection to the pub. Mrs Willoughby and her husband went there often when he was fit and healthy. They were close friends with several of the regulars, and she still calls in. Even though her husband isn't with her any more, she feels comfortable having a drink there. There is now little doubt that the gang uses hotels and pubs as their source of information on what to steal and where, Nicky said. But it won't be so easy from now on. Every landlord in the area has been made aware, and our boys and girls are keeping a very close watch on any strangers. But that doesn't help us find our thief. We have to, before he gets topped by Mad Tom. I know we don't generally make it our business to protect the villains, but we need to get to Raffles before Mad Tom does. Nicky looked around. OK, let's get to work on that. Yvonne and Dave, if you've got a few minutes, I'd appreciate a word. On her way to her office, she received a message from Eve. She read it and smiled. Eve had made some headway. She was meeting friends that evening, so would talk to her later that night. Nicky guessed these were her old RAF buddies. She knew that they, above all people, were aware of the seriousness of the situation, 
and the dangers of getting involved, but this small group of Amazons had a very personal axe to grind. To be honest, she could hardly blame them. Yvonne and Dave followed her into the office and sat down. Nicky looked at them hopefully. You guys have been around this neck of the woods forever. Is there anyone on the streets that might be able to give us some info on who this very specialised burglar might be? I've set aside a small sum of money, far more than a snout would normally get, and I'm wondering if it would be enough of a carrot to get someone to talk. Dave pursed his lips. I've been racking my brains over that, Mum, and I can't come up with anyone. I've got one possibility, said Yvonne, but no promises. There's a young woman I know who hangs around some of the shadier spots in Greenborough. She's got a little kid, and she's struggling a bit these days, so possibly... Try Avonnie. She handed Yvonne a note. Fifty quid if she puts us on the right track. No questions and no comeback. Yvonne looked at the note. I'm guessing this doesn't come from petty cash. Nicky grinned. Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies. I'll do my best, ma'am. I hope it's worth it. I don't want bloody mad Tom offing villains all over my manor just to get back at me. If she coughs up something tasty, it'll be worth every penny. She looked at Dave. Meanwhile... Would you go out to Sheila Willoughby's place again and have another talk to her? All we need is one tiny thing that might give us a clue as to the thief's identity. No problem, Mum. I'll go at once. The two officers crossed paths with Joseph. Good news, he said to Nicky. Vinnie will be with us tonight at around ten. He's going to reactivate the security system with, as he put it, a few more gizmos that the Pentagon would bite his hand off for. Nicky thought this sounded rather daunting, but then she recalled the horrible sense of violation that had followed the mysterious incursion into her home. Excellent, she said with feeling, and we can still go to supper with Cam and Kay. Oh, and don't let me forget to talk to Mum tonight. Don't tell me Marta Hari has been on the prowl again. I think she probably has. She says she thinks she's found something. Joseph gave a dramatic shiver. I dread to think what she's up to. Well, I don't think she's alone. I suspect she has rallied the troops. She's meeting friends this evening. Let's hope there's safety in numbers, then. Joseph flopped into a chair. And let's also hope that Mad Tom gives us a bit of time to work on his riddle. So far, he's been pretty unreliable. I don't know why, but this time I think he will. We still need to act quickly, though. Well, you've pulled out all the stops. I guess there's nothing more we can do. You could ring Mickey. See if anything else is creeping through the undergrowth over at the Carborough. Joseph nodded. Good idea. I'll do that now. A few moments later, he was scribbling down a name, thanking Mickey profusely, and grinning at Mickey like the Cheshire Cat himself. Remember that CCTV shot we sent to Mickey? Raymond has just found a name for the other guy. And guess what? He's from London, specialising in breaking and entering. And wait for it. He is an expert in jewellery, Victorian diamonds being a particular favourite of his. His name? Lawrence Aspen. Then what was a big cheese like that, doing sourcing venues in the pubs? Surely that would be a bit below him, wouldn't it? Nicky broke off and yelled, And someone go get my fifty quid off Yvonne! I reckon the planner, Dougie Haskins, the other guy on the CCTV, asked for his expertise after he'd talked to Sheila Willoughby about her ring. She told Yvonne that she wore it all the time. Maybe Haskins wanted the main man to verify its authenticity. Nicky typed the name into her computer. Lawrence Aspen had a whole page to himself. She scanned the crammed type. I see he started life as a confidence trickster and was very successful, so chatting up a pub full of regulars would be right up his street. He probably quite enjoyed slumming it up here. Nicky looked over towards the door. Has Dave left yet? Joseph looked out. No, he's just putting his jacket on. Catch him for me, would you? Joseph beckoned to Dave, who hurried over. Show Mrs Willoughby this man's picture, Dave. Nicky handed him a printout. This is Lawrence Aspen, a jewellery thief from the Big Smoke. Ask her if she ever met him in the Nightingale Watch. Dave took the picture and left. Joseph raised his eyebrows. Now all we need to do is find the bloke before Mad Tom gets to him. Well, as nobody seems to have caught up with Yvonne, I'm just going to ring her. Maybe her young snout knows him, and if she is employed, as I suspect she is, perhaps she's had dealings with him. Mickey said Raymond hadn't seen him around, so he's clearly avoiding the Leonard family in the Carborough estate. Sensible man. They'd lynch him if they caught him. If only he knew the facts... He would also know that we are definitely his best bet right now. We are out to save his life, not destroy it. Nicky spoke to Yvonne. They had made giant steps in a very short time. They knew the name of the intended victim. Now it was a race to find him. The game is on. Nicky whispered to herself. Just please let it be us that wins it. 
Chapter 14 Wendy Avery had taken advantage of Venue 3 and had a long swim before joining the others. She met Renee Britton in the changing rooms. Renee had spent a while in the gym in order to make their meeting appear legitimate. Lou is already in the coffee shop. I saw her go in a few minutes ago, Renee said, gathering up her gym bag. And Eve? Not seen her yet. They strolled casually over to the cafe and juice bar. Lou Fawcett waved at them. She was at a table in the far corner and had already bought their drinks. They chatted for a while before getting down to business. Eve's never late, Wendy said. No one argued with this. She phoned me earlier and said she'd found something at Monk's Lantern. Rene leaned forward, putting her elbows on the table. She gave me a set of numbers. I've decoded them into a series of dates and assigned an index number to each date. She looked closely at her friends. I suggest those odd numbers could refer to a page, a plate, or maybe a chapter number. Something like that. Anne was dealing with books, so that would be reasonable. Lou looked towards the door. The women were becoming more uneasy. Where is Eve? Wendy said. Finally, she pulled out her burner phone and keyed in Eve's number. Nothing. It's switched off. This doesn't look good. Wendy frowned. Let's quickly pull what we have, then I suggest we try to find Eve. Her gaze fell on Renée. Did she say where she was when she rang you? Still at Jenny's place, at Monk's Lantern. Then we'd better start there. Before we go, we need to share everything we've managed to gather so far. She swallowed the last of her latte. So, what have you guys found? Over dinner, Nicky told Cam and Kay all about Mad Tom, his threatening calls, his intrusion into her home, and his insistence on giving them clues using the thieves' cant. For Kay's sake, she didn't tell them about Michael Roper's horrible death. What can you tell us about thieves' Latin? asked Nicky, gladly accepting a second helping of Eton mess. Kay Walker passed her the cream and sat back. It evolved out of the dialects of the lower classes back in the 1500s. Gradually it became amalgamated into a sort of criminal parlance. It's largely obsolete now, but it exists in different forms throughout the world. She took a sip of wine. There's a legend that says it was invented by some rascals from Derbyshire who occupied a cave called the Devil's Arse and plagued travellers with their murderous thievery. That's almost certainly a myth, as is the idea that it came directly from the King of the Gypsies. It was a secret language used by vagabonds, thieves and all other members of the underworld so that upstanding citizens wouldn't understand them. Cameron topped up her glass. Be prepared, folks. She can talk about this for hours. He winked at Nicky and Joseph. Kay cuffed her husband good-naturedly. Go on, you. It's really interesting, that's why. All the language we use today is peppered with slang remnants of this cryptolect or secret language. You still hear people talking about kicking the bucket, smelling a rat, keeping your pecker up, and so on. The face is called a mug. Even the word kidnapper comes from Kant. You can find it in nursery rhymes, cockney rhyming slang, and polari, which is a slang used by gay men. Dickens used it in Oliver Twist. He shows that Oliver is honest through the fact that he can't speak cant, like the criminals around him. Dickens even put a glossary of Thieves Cant in the back of the book. Cam raised his eyes to the ceiling. See what I mean? No, talk away, Kay. We need to understand this weirdo, Nicky said with feeling. Tell me exactly what he has said so far, said Kay. Joseph repeated the words as accurately as he could. Kay pulled a face. You say this man wants to engage you in some kind of game? He gives us clues in his coded language. We then have to try to get an answer before he does something terrible. Ah, well, in that case... Kay drew in a breath. I could be looking at this all wrong. Sorry? Nicky wondered what Kay was about to come up with. I was picturing your man as some sort of twisted academic, someone with a love of arcane, obsolete languages, maybe a cryptographer. But maybe that's not it at all. This form of speech has another use in fantasy role-play games like Dungeons and & Dragons and the Thieves' Guild. Joseph sat up. Ben talked about playing Dungeons & Dragons. He said they had a language for each class or guild. Nicky nodded. And someone mentioned a guild of thieves, although I can't recall who or when. Kay looked at them. Even though those games are make-believe, they use the proper thieves' cant. That must be where your guy got it from. I suggest you check out the internet for a game in which some of the higher-level players use complex languages based on thieves' Latin. Our man is certainly playing a game. You think he's taken an imaginary situation with avatars and monsters and such, and carried it over into real life? It's happened before, Cam said. 
Kids confusing fiction and fantasy with real life and losing their boundaries and inhibitions. I know, after a while violence and sex become the norm. They see life like a video game. Nikki pulled a face. We've had a few cases of that over the years. It's horrible. She turned to Kay. My knowledge of games doesn't extend beyond Candy Crush Saga. So tell me, are these games violent? They are fantasy war games. Cruel deaths are the norm, but mainly they're about creating an ongoing story for your own personal character. Nikki was beginning to wonder just how Kay had spent her youth. Heroes and villains? asked Joseph. Of course, but it's also about quests. You get to choose whether you want a path of good or one of evil. Then you and your cohorts go on an adventure. It's very much tactical play, and using your initiative to defeat your enemies. Cam joined in. Some of the other games are very strategy-based. Different items that have to be won, like poisons and drugs, traps and tricks, maps, puzzles and riddles, and objects with magic powers. One even has an advanced language system as complicated as, say, Russian, added Kay. It's impossible to figure out for yourself, and it takes months to master even the simplest form. It has three specific word orders, standard, question, and command. Frankly, I cannot believe that anyone would even want to try to learn it. What kind of people play these games? asked Nicky. The words freak, geek, and nerd spring to mind, muttered Joseph. That is sometimes the case, but there is a wide cross-section of people that love them. Kay smiled over the top of her wine glass. High-profile actors, writers, film directors, and multi-millionaire businessmen for a start. So is it mainly males that are attracted to it? Nicky asked. Predominantly, although it's quite addictive and a lot of women enjoy it too. Like you? Kay burst out laughing. Oh, no. I did a module once for a university course in entomology. It concerned borrowings between one culture and another, and it included secret languages. Part of it was game-playing. She grinned. My knowledge comes from study, not sitting up all night in an airless bedsit plotting to slay dragons. Cam held up his hands. I, on the other hand, did exactly that for a short time in my youth. Misspent youth, added Kay with a grin. Possibly, but I think it actually helped me in my career. It did teach me how to work with a team to overcome the enemy, and I guess I'm still doing it. They were silent for a while, all looking thoughtful. Then Joseph said, What was your other theory, Kay? About a twisted academic? Arcane languages are fascinating. They can become quite an obsession. The deeper you dig, the more secrets and connections you uncover. I just wondered if someone had got a bit too involved and maybe lost the plot, so to speak. Cameron offered coffee. That's my contribution to dinner, he said with a grin. Made from real home-ground beans. He stood up to leave the dining room, then paused at the door. You don't think Mad Tom is connected to your spate of housebreaking, do you? Nicky nodded. There has to be a link, Cam. Mad Tom knows exactly who broke into a house and stole a valuable Victorian diamond ring. Now we also know who did it, but we don't know where that thief is. We are assuming Mad Tom does, and somehow we need to get to our burglar before him. Cam puffed out his cheeks. This is a bit of a weird one, isn't it? Does Stophole Abbey mean anything to you? Nicky suddenly asked Kay. Joseph, do you remember? That's where the reference to the Thieves' Guild came from. He gave us that clue, find Stophole Abbey, and it turned out to be the central hideout or guild hall for Thieves' Guild. That, I think, said Kay, directs you to a player rather than an academic. I do know of it, and that expression is from an advanced fantasy game. They talked for a little longer. Cam was in the kitchen speaking on his phone. He hurried through with the cafetiere and a tray of coffee cups and set it down on the table. Trouble? asked Joseph. Not sure, that was a station. They've had a call from the mother of one of my detectives. Apparently he never arrived home after his early shift ended. The duty sergeant rang his mobile and he said it's dead. Kay touched his arm. You'd better go. I know you, sweetheart. You'll never settle until you know what's happened. Who is it? asked Nicky. D.S. Darren Smith. Smart young detective and it's not like him not to tell his mum what he's up to. He's a really conscientious kid where she's concerned. He still lives with her? asked Nicky. He lost his dad, so he moved back home to be with his mother. Where do they live? Cameron hesitated. He lives in Beach Lacey, just down the road from Monk's Lantern. While Nicky and Joseph were enjoying their meal, three women stood at the bottom of the drive leading up to Monk's Lantern. Wendy Avery touched the bonnet of the small car parked outside. Cold. So who does it belong to? The house looks deserted. 
Rene stared at the darkened windows. Dog walker? suggested Lou. Parked it and gone for a long hike with Fido? It would still be warm, unless they were planning a ten-mile cross-country hike. Wendy felt terribly uneasy. This car hasn't been driven for hours. So what's the plan? Rene asked. A walk round. Eyeballs only. We touch nothing. Wendy said calmly. This place does not feel right, so I suggest we stick together. No one disagreed. They walked slowly in the fast-approaching twilight. No other cars here, Lou muttered softly. She looked down at the gravel that surrounded the small parking space at the back of the property. But someone has been here recently. There was a shower of rain earlier, and there is a dry patch where someone parked. Eve, probably, said Wendy, then drew in a long, slow breath. So, where is she now? Hold up. Rene held up a hand. Look. A figure was lying on the ground close to the side of the chapel. Jesus. Eve? Wendy fought down the urge to run. Be careful, girls. Let's do this properly. The three women spread out and moved towards the unmoving figure in a pincher movement, all the time keeping watch around them. It's clear, whispered Lou, and Wendy moved forward. To her surprise, and she had to admit also to her relief, it wasn't Eve Anderson, but a young man. He was unconscious. Nine, 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 Renee, quickly. Thready pulse, nasty head injury, and he's freezing. Jackets, please. And Lou, there's a blanket in the boot of my car. Wendy threw her car keys to her friend and ripped off her own jacket. Fast as you can. They wrapped him in every spare article of clothing they could find and made him as comfortable as possible. He's holding on, but barely. Wendy stared down the tree-lined drive. We need help soon or we'll lose him. What the hell happened here? asked Renée. Wendy didn't answer. She tucked the blanket a little closer around him and felt something, probably a wallet. She flipped it open and saw the warrant card. No, oh Lord, the poor little devil's a police officer. The women looked at each other in silence. A siren wailed in the distance. Lou sighed. We'll have some explaining to do, won't we? Maybe now that the paramedics are here we should quietly disappear, Rene suggested. Our jackets. Do we leave them? This could be an attempted murder. I'm thinking DNA and all that. Lou bit her lip. Then we'll have to brass it out. Wendy looked at the other two. We say that we agreed to meet our friend here tonight, but found the place empty and this poor lad lying here. We got help. End of story. No more than that. They nodded. Then René whispered, But where is Eve? Through the branches of the overhanging trees, the breeze whispered the answer. No one heard. Chapter 15 I asked him to keep a low-key watch on Monk's Lantern for me, Cameron said. I hope to God he didn't walk in on something he couldn't handle. He put his foot down harder. If anything's happened to him because of me, I'll never forgive myself. Nicky found it hard to reassure him. She had asked for his help with Jenny Foxwell's suspicious death, so if anyone was to blame, it was her. As soon as they heard the words Monk's Lantern, she and Joseph had insisted on accompanying Cameron. Soon they were turning into the road that led to the old chapel and saw the blue lights flashing across the fields. Nicky's throat tightened. Ambulance, she whispered. Oh, Lord. They parked the car and ran down the drive. Joseph touched her arm and nodded towards a small group of women standing by the rear doors of the ambulance. Nicky knew at once that these were her mother's RAF friends. There was something about them, a kind of self-assurance. Her mother had it, too. Nicky looked around and her eyes narrowed. If these were the friends Eve had been meeting tonight, where was her mother? With a small gasp, Nicky made a dash towards the half-open doors. A hand reached out and grasped her arm. I'm Wendy Avery. It's not Eve in there, okay? Nicky froze mid-stride and turned to look at the woman. Then where is she? We need to talk, D.I. Galena, but not here. For once in her life, Nicky Galena was happy to obey. She realised that Joseph was standing by her side. Mother's friends, I believe. I guessed. Joseph replied. What happened here? It's a young police officer, a detective constable, we think. He'd been attacked. We found him and called the ambulance. Wendy sighed. He's in a bad way, I'm afraid. So why are you here? Nicky asked. This is what we need to talk to you about. One of the women spoke up. I'm Renee Britton, and this is Lou Fawcett. We are... 
were, all friends of Jenny Foxwell and Anne Castledine. The terrible fear wound its way through Nicky's veins and reached out to clutch at her heart. Let's talk in my car, Wendy suggested. It looks like your colleague has everything here under control. Cameron checked on his young friend and was told that there was nothing he could do to help. So he did what he knew best and began organising an investigation. Nicky heard him ordering forensics and as many officers as could be spared to secure the scene. He'll need to talk to you. You know that, said Nicky. We won't be making any fast getaways, I promise. I just think the fewer people who hear this, the better. Wendy nodded towards the Mitsubishi Outlander parked at the end of the drive. OK. Nicky hurried across to speak to Cam, who nodded absent-mindedly. His mind was clearly on D.C. Darren Smith. How is he? He shook his head. He was lying there for hours. It's touch and go. They're trying to stabilise him before they make the trip to the hospital. What the devil happened? Growled Nicky. Maybe these ladies know. They don't look like a deputation from the Beach Lacey W.I. to me. They're not. They're my mother's friends. I suspect they were here regarding Jenny Foxwell's untimely death. So where is... That's exactly what I'm about to find out. I hope. She and Joseph walked down the drive to the waiting car, her anxiety growing with every step. Not long ago, Nicky had said to Joseph that having found her so late in her life, she could not bear to lose her mother again. She had already lost Hannah, her beloved teenage daughter, her beloved father and her stepmother. Apart from Joseph, Eve was all she had left. If she lost her too... Don't go there. Joseph's voice was soft and gentle. I know what you were thinking, but just don't, okay? She took his arm and held it tightly. I can't help it. I don't know what she's got herself muddled up in. And I don't know who is after and these other women. I'm scared, Joseph. Really scared. Don't jump to conclusions just yet. We know nothing about where Eve is. But just remember, your mother is one of the most resilient and competent women on this earth. It would be a very big mistake to give her up for lost. He squeezed her hand. Let's go see what Charlie's angels have to say, shall we? She gave him a half-hearted smile and thanked whatever powers there might be for the fact that she had Joseph Easter by her side. She and Joseph climbed into the big vehicle. Nicky asked how they knew who she was. Your mother is very proud of you. We've all seen the photograph several times. Wendy became serious. Nicky, Renee spoke to Eve earlier. She was right here at Monk's Lantern. She gave us some information... We know she would have committed it to memory and most likely destroyed the original. We think the coded message was what our friends were killed for. Lou continued. I have the name of the man Anne Castledine was working for. We've done a bit of homework on him. Not on the internet, that isn't safe. But through some old contacts. His name is Air Commodore Arthur Rawlings. Simon Arthur Rawlings. What exactly do you know about him? Asked Nicky guardedly. He worked for the government, and there was some kind of shadow hanging over him. We don't think it was espionage or anything like that, added René. We believe it was something from his private life, something no one once made public. Wendy, seated behind the wheel, turned to face Nicky. We are telling you this because if you are to find Eve and discover who killed Anne and Jenny, you need every bit of evidence that you can get hold of, no matter where it comes from. You believe that someone has taken my mother? Ice was forming in her blood. She missed a meeting. Her phone is not picking up, and a man has been seriously injured at her last known location. Wendy nodded. Sorry to say this, but yes, we think she's been taken. We need you, said René, and you need us. Now, Wendy looked from Nicky to Joseph. We disturbed the scene as little as possible, but we had to help that young officer. However, we did notice that there were signs of a considerable struggle, more of a fight, actually, and given the detective's head injury, we don't think it was him who fought back. There were other marks on him, so we think he was taken by surprise and poleaxed. Lou frowned. And you were sure my mother was actually here? Lou nodded. From the time she made the call to René, there is also a dry patch on the gravel indicating that a car was parked there. We checked the time it stopped raining, and it ties in with when Eve was here. It's not conclusive, but we think we've got it right. Could Eve have seen the attack on the young man and gone to help? Joseph asked quietly. No one answered for a while. Then Wendy said, Possibly, although from the damage to the shrubs and plants beside the chapel, we think not. Eve is trained, as we all are. 
She looked at Joseph and smiled grimly. And you too, if what I hear is correct, in a stealthier kind of defensive combat. This was roughhouse fighting. René agreed, then added, I hate to tell you guys your business, but there were blood spatters all over the place. I'd use your best forensics talent if I were you. Joseph looked across at Nicky. Shall I? Go. Tell Cam we need Rory out here, and no one else. Joseph was out of the vehicle at once, and running up the drive towards Monk's Lantern. He sat in the pub and sipped at his beer. It tasted of nothing. Once he had really enjoyed a pint down the local. Now the beer seemed as flat as the rest of his life. He looked down at the newspaper. The Daily Telegraph was folded neatly, open at the cryptic crossword. He had almost finished it, and lingered over the last few questions to draw out the time. His jacket was draped over the next chair, and a slightly worn leather briefcase sat on the seat beside him. It looked as if he was waiting for someone, and saving this seat. Actually, it was to deter anyone from joining him. He looked across the bar to where two men were chatting amicably with an older couple. Watch out, my friends, he whispered into his drink. I do believe you are next on their list. The couple were well-dressed. The man wore a barber half-jacket, chinos and expensive shoes. The woman tailored slacks and a fitted check woolen jacket over a silk blouse. The moment they walked in, he knew they were the perfect target material. She even had an antique bar brooch on her lapel that he was pretty sure was white gold, diamonds and sapphires. He was no expert, but he recognised quality when he saw it. He tried to imagine their home. The bar staff obviously knew them, but they weren't greeted like regulars. Maybe they'd purchased one of the newer properties near the old decommissioned railway station. They were very upmarket and quite expensive for this area. These two looked just the kind to be attracted to those. He finished his drink and picked up his things. Well, those guys would need to get a wriggle on if they were to profit from the elegant newcomers, because a date was set, and if D.I. Nicky Galena couldn't find that diamond thief pretty soon, it would be game over. Rory yawned. I was not expecting a royal summons. Please note that your loyal subject has dragged himself from his couch to be here for you. Seeing Nicky's pale face, he frowned. And I think I'm glad I did. What's happened? Joseph left Nicky with her mother's friends, took the pathologist to one side, and gave him a brief synopsis of what they thought had occurred. Rory listened in silence. We have no idea as to whether Eve was here when the attack happened, or whether she chanced on something, or maybe she had left already. Joseph shook his head. But that isn't very likely. She suddenly went off the radar. Who has been in the crime scene area since the man was found? The woman who found him and administered first aid. Joseph gave a slight smile. But they are not your average do-gooders. They did their best to keep things as uncontaminated as possible. And then the paramedics. We've kept everyone else away. Let me see the sight. Rory moved towards the cordoned off area, then stopped before he reached it. My Sokos are en route with our gear. We'll get the duckboards down and then I'll go in. He grimaced. I know the victim must come first, but it plays havoc with cross contamination, and this place looks like the local rugby club have just had a scrummage here. Apparently, it was like this when the women arrived on scene. They suspect a major fight had taken place, with our victim lying bleeding at the heart of it. Who are these women? asked Rory. Retired MI5 directors? That grey-haired one doesn't go by the name of M, does she? She does bear some resemblance to Dame Judy. Not that far off, actually. M.O.D. and R.A.F. And yes, retired. Bloody hell! exclaimed Rory. Ah, of course. They are connected to Eve Anderson? Friends, and someone is killing them off one by one, unless they are very much mistaken. Rory bit his lip. This is no elaborate joke, is it? Joseph shook his head. I wish it was, but no, Rory. This is deadly serious. No wonder Nicky is as white as a ghost. In as few words as possible, Joseph gave him the background. Rory rubbed at his chin. After a while, he slowly said, I'll find your missing body. Joseph's eyes widened. Can you do that? Oh, yes, my dear friend. I have considerable clout in certain home office circles. His expression hardened. In fact, I'll do more than find your woman and bring her home. I will personally conduct a second autopsy. 
and it will be a very brave man or woman who tries to stop me. Nicky will be really pleased to hear that. Joseph puffed out his cheeks. I'll go to London tomorrow morning, crack of dawn, but you'll have to give me all you know about where the body was found and what you believe occurred, okay? I'll email it to you as soon as I finish here. Good. And as I see my CSI is heading towards us, I'd better get on with sorting out this bun fight. We'll be eternally grateful for whatever you can tell us. Joseph looked around. And here come the troops with extra lights and a canopy. Then we're good to go. Rory touched his arm. Tell Nicky. I won't let her down. You never have. Joseph squeezed Rory's hand. I better get back to her. Rory nodded, then turned and began barking orders. Chapter 16 Robert Callum was working late. Not that it mattered. He lived in a tiny cramped flat right above his beloved bookshop. It was cramped because of the bookshelves lining every wall. Books were his life, and they often strayed from the shelves of his shop to his home upstairs. Earlier in the day, he had taken delivery of some collectible books and had not had a chance to check the invoice and inspect them. He could hardly wait to unpack the boxes and see what he had. He handled the books reverently, stroking the covers and occasionally sniffing at the pages. He placed several first editions to one side, and then ran his eyes over a collection of wartime poetry. He was looking for one special volume that he had managed to procure, a 1957 first edition, first impression, from Russia with Love by Ian Fleming. He had a buyer waiting and was anxious to see its condition. He came across another book, one he had been trying to track for some time. He lifted it out and touched it gently. Sorry, old friend. You've arrived too late. It was a volume of Curtis's Botanical Magazine by John Sims, published in 1826. It had been destined for Air Commodore Arthur Rowling's collection. Now the man was dead, and Robert had a £750 niche book on his hands. Still, the plates were exquisite, and he was sure he would be able to find a good home for it. It reminded Robert of a rather unsettling meeting that had taken place earlier in the day. He had been boxing up some items for auction when the door opened and D.S. Fitch burst in. When Fitch had initially asked for Robert's help to watch out for the rare book thieves, he had been quite charming. This time he was positively intimidating. He had subjected Robert to a grilling about that woman who had come in with the botanical book. When Robert assured him he knew no more than what he had already told him, Fitch left without a word. Now he looked at the beautiful colour plant illustrations and thought of the woman who had seemed so interested in the Victorian botanists. He preferred her to D.S. Fitch, even if she had turned out to be an international criminal. In fact, he deeply regretted telling that odiferous policeman anything about her, and especially her vehicle registration number. And why had she seemed familiar, even though he knew he had never met her before? Was it her turn of phrase, her smile? He stared at a painting of a lotus flower, and tried to recall just what it was. He closed the volume. She would have liked this book. He wished he had her number, because he would have asked her to come in and see it. He straightened up. That's it, he said out loud. She reminds me of Anne. He sank down onto a chair. What a terrible waste. Anne Castledine had spent hours with him, cross-referencing some of the more obscure items in the Air Commodore's collection. Even though he'd known her for a relatively short time, he liked to think that they had become friends, and then he had heard the awful news about her car crash. They had said it was her heart, even though she had told him that she was fitter than a butcher's dog and had recently had her pilot's licence renewed with no problems at all. Robert sighed. Whatever it was, he just prayed that she hadn't suffered. She was a wonderful woman, and he had loved having her in the shop with him. His mystery woman, his Matahari or Mrs. Raffles, reminded him of Anne. Not physically, it was something in their bearing. They had a confidence about them, and showed a real interest in what you had to say. They seemed to value you. Robert Callum put the books to one side, and decided it was time to call it a day. Maybe he would have a reviving scotch and dry ginger, and raise his glass to the memory of Anne, and his rather lovely international thief, and the hope that she might visit his shop again. It was after nine when Joseph remembered that Vinnie was coming to Cloud Cottage Farm, Nicky had meanwhile managed to transform herself from panic-stricken daughter to cold, calculating detective. They both knew they wouldn't find Eve by running around like mad things, but Joseph knew her well enough to realise that underneath the cool exterior, Nicky's mind was a maelstrom of fears and suppositions. "'Before we go home, I need to call at Eve's house,' Nicky said. 
I know a uniform have checked there, but I want to go inside and see if she left anything to indicate what she was planning. She held up her keyring and shook it. I kept a spare front door key with mine. We can go straight there. Joseph glanced at his watch. They just about had time before they needed to meet Vinny, but just in case, he called and gave his friend a swift update. No matter, mate. I'm running a bit late myself. Got caught in the aftermath of a pile up on the A1. Joseph and Nicky returned to their vehicle. The three women had volunteered to go directly to Cameron's police station and give their statements, so as not to hold up proceedings. The scene now belonged to Rory and his small army of Sokos and uniformed officers. Nicky was looking grave. I hope that young detective survives. I feel responsible. It's grim, but it's the reality of our job, Nicky. He's a police officer, and that's what we do. Put ourselves in harm's way. None of us knows what is waiting for us when we go out on a call. It's not your fault. Nicky adjusted her seatbelt. I know that, but I think we'd have exercised a little more caution if we'd read the situation better. What's to read? We know nothing. It has all been surmise and suspicion, right from the start. Even Eve hasn't got a clue about what's going on or who is threatening her and her friends. She doesn't even have proof that there's been a murder in the first place. Nicky threw him a sideways glance. Maybe she does now. Someone has taken my mother, Joseph, and we both know that it had to be someone with considerable cunning and skill to get one over on her. Nicky swallowed hard. Joseph, how do I get through this? Joseph stared at the dashboard. Frankly, he had no idea. After a lifetime of believing that her birth mother was dead, it was unthinkable that she should lose her now. I don't know, Nicky, but I do know that somehow we will get through it, and we'll find her. He leaned across and put his arm around her, holding her tightly. We'll find her. For her sake, you have to stay strong. I and, well, the whole team can't do without the tough nut Nicky Galena that we've all come to know and love. Maybe even the old Nicky, the one that every officer on the station was bloody terrified of crossing. Nicky gave a small laugh. I'm not sure there's too much of her left any more. There is, I'm sure. Find her. Joseph cupped her face in both hands, and their eyes locked. We've got a fight on our hands, Nicky. And if we have to fight dirty, so be it. We're not going to let the bastards do this to decent people. Her jaw tightened, and a familiar, steely look returned to those tear-filled eyes. You're right, Joseph. And we also know that Wendy, Renee, and Lou were in serious danger. Any one of them could be next. She drew in a shaky breath. Okay, let's check Eve's house and get back home. Vinny can sort out our security, because we still have bloody mad Tom on our backs. I'll ring the superintendent, then we'll make a battle plan. And a damn good one, all right? Joseph raised his eyes to the heavens. Praise be, she's back. Yes, ma'am. When Eve opened her eyes, her first thought was, Why? Why am I alive? Anne and Jenny were dead, killed almost instantly. Yet here she lay, sick, dizzy, and confused, but alive. Her eyes gradually adjusted to the dark, and after a while she could make out shadowy shapes around her. The place smelt strange. Not exactly unpleasant, more kind of damp and woody. She tried to move, but her wrists were tightly secured. From the cramping pains in her lower legs, her feet were too. Worse, she had something across her mouth. Eve was frightened of gags. She was very much a mouth breather. Several attacks of sinitis had left her with chronic rhinitis and a constantly blocked nose. The fear of being unable to breathe threatened to overpower her, so she took a series of shallow breaths and calmed herself. She was fine. She just mustn't panic. Concentrate on where you are and how you are. Then tell yourself everything you remember. The nausea was pretty intense, but she had to keep it down, because if she were to vomit with a gag over her mouth, she would die. Simple. Other than that, she'd had worse effects from a hangover, and she didn't seem to be injured either. Her head ached, and she recalled a blow that had stunned her, but other than that, she seemed to be unharmed. She knew that some kind of injection had been administered, but her recall of the incident was hazy. All she could remember, with any certainty, was seeing someone lying on the ground. Then she was waking up here. And where was here? She listened for noises, but heard nothing. Odd. There was always noise, wherever you were. Water, birds, the rustling of leaves or the sigh of the wind. Animals and people. Clocks, heating systems, fridges, alarms, creaking floorboards. Mice in the attic, phones, radios, cars, farm vehicles and planes. Here there was only silence. That smell, what was it? 
wet wood, a little like being in a wooden sauna but cold and damp rather than warm and aromatic, and something else too that Eve could not identify. She was lying on a narrow hard bed on a thin mattress covered in old blankets. There was a slight smell of dog. Eve closed her eyes and tried to remember what had happened, who had been lying on the path that skirted Monk's lantern. She thought it had been a man, but the drug had wiped the rest from her brain. Nicky. Nicky would be worried sick. So would Wendy and the others. She had been due to meet them, that much she did know. Oh, God, they would assume she was dead like Alan Jenny. She wriggled on the hard bunk, but only succeeded in chafing her wrists. Eve cursed silently, long and hard. How could she have been so stupid? How did she manage to let her guard down so badly that a single needle had felled her? Suddenly she froze. What was that sound? Where? She concentrated hard. It had been the sound of someone shifting their weight to ease a stiffening muscle. A rustle of material and a small creaking of a seat. Eve swallowed. She was not alone. Nicky and Joseph arrived at Cloud Cottage Farm a few minutes before Vinnie Silver. They had found nothing useful at Eve's home. Nicky had felt an overpowering need to touch her mother's belongings, almost as if finding her things safe and in order meant that Eve Anderson was too. Tactfully, Vinnie tempered his usual robust greeting. Nicky felt quite touched. Vinnie was one hell of a powerful masculine presence, and he was never afraid to express exactly what he thought. If he thought you looked good, he told you so. Somehow this wasn't offensive or sexist. He was no chauvinist pig. He simply appreciated what he saw, and Nicky couldn't help liking him. He had been a tower of strength when a sadistic killer had threatened the team. And bottom line, if Joseph vouched for him, he was okay with her. Having Big Vinny Silver at their side again was hugely reassuring. Your system will be fine. I'll run a diagnostic tonight and check out the covert cameras at first light. They might need a tweak or two, but I doubt it. He looked at Joseph. Then I'll add my gizmos and give you a swift tutorial on maintenance. You'll be all set for when the next nasty piece of work creeps onto the marshes. We've got to catch this one first, grumbled Joseph. Nicky made the coffee. I'm ashamed to say this, but right now Mad Tom is more of an inconvenience than anything else compared to finding my mother and her abductor. Vinny accepted his coffee gratefully. There's no chance she's gone into deep cover, is there? Joseph has filled me on the basics, and I was wondering if this woman is as amazing as you guys seem to believe. Maybe she thinks she can find out more by going underground. It's possible, but she would have found some way to let me know. Nicky sank heavily into an armchair. But would she? She loves you, so maybe she's protecting you. The less you know, the better. Joseph nodded. That has happened before. People go off the radar and purposely keep their nearest and dearest in the dark to keep them safe. Not Eve, Nicky said stubbornly. I know exactly what you are saying, and if I was some innocent young mother with a stack of kids, sure. But I'm a professional crime fighter. She would have told me. Joseph smiled rather sadly. But you are still her beloved daughter, Nicky. That makes a big difference, added Vinny. You have to admit that. Nicky wanted to cry. It brought the whole thing crashing down upon her again. Nicky summoned all her strength and brought back her former self. She didn't like the old Nicky very much, but she had to admit she got results. Play dirty, Joseph had said. Well, if he was prepared to step outside the playground, so was she. She sipped her coffee and tried to think. After a while, she looked at Vinny. Do you by any chance have a few days to spare? For you, dear lady, I have a lifetime of days. Good, because I want you to meet three extraordinary women. Even Nicky had to laugh at the expression of pure delight that lit up Vinny's craggy face. It'll be a tough assignment, Diagolina, but clearly someone has to do it. I'm game. Amid the laughter, Nicky's mind began to clear. Wendy, Renee and Lou were going to lead her to her mother. No matter what dark forces lurked behind Anne and Jenny's death, she would find the truth. It was all that mattered. That and getting Eve Anderson safely back home. While Nicky went to get clean towels for the guest bedroom, Joseph told Vinny more about Mad Tom and his threats. It worries me that he managed to get inside without leaving a trace and with no damage of any kind. Probably just a skeleton key. Do you think he's professional? Joseph thought for a while. No, I've never felt that he was. He seems too erratic for that, and slightly unhinged. He's playing a game, but the strategy is flawed, and he seems to lose the plot and do things spontaneously. Like killing people? Yeah, 
Even that was an act of random violence, not a deliberate and calculated taking out of one of the players. War games are violent. I've played a few in my time. Uh, zap! Uh, ah! Joseph smiled. Thanks, Vinny, I get the picture. But whoever killed that thief was off his head with rage. I cannot think of anything the kid could have done to cause such a frenzied beating. But you aren't root to, are you? Hopefully not. Joseph heard an incoming message on his phone. He prayed it wasn't Mad Tom. It was Rory, asking if it was too late to talk. He rang him straight away. I'm still at the scene, but I thought a few preliminary observations would be in order. Rory sounded tired. Joseph hoped that he would still be up for his trip to London. Please, go ahead. Luckily, my two Sokos are all hands at this stuff, so we put our heads together and came up with the same hypothesis. He gave a little chuckle. Whoever your lady sleuths are, they got it spot on. Our young detective was felled with a single blow that took him out of the equation instantly. It happened first, and he was left to lie there while Act Two of the drama unfolded. Rory was clearly getting into the swing of his story. Joseph switched his phone to loudspeaker and asked Vinny to go get Nicky so they could all hear. Our assailant then took himself off to a quiet spot in the shrubbery, where my Soko found a flattened area where he sat down. He left some blood on the foliage. He chuckled again. Blood on the foliage. What a lovely title for a murder story. Perhaps a dead gardener or a florist. Anyway, back to the story. We attacked your officer and retreated to wait. Wait for what? asked Nicky. Eve Anderson, I guess. But as to why... I have no idea. He might just have wanted to make sure she left the house and drove away before he disposed of the body. Or maybe it was her he wanted in the first place, and the detective cocked up his plans. They all digested this. Then Joseph said, And what happened next? This part gets tricky. Rory cleared his throat. All I know is that there was one hell of a punch-up. We found blood, saliva, snot, a ripped-off fingernail, hair. The list is endless. It makes no sense at all, Nicky murmured. Nor does it fit in with the other two deaths, which were meticulously planned and executed, added Joseph. But that's not all. Rory's dramatic pause had perfect timing. We found two syringes on the ground, one full, the other empty. From the residue in the bottom of the empty one, I'm certain they contained different drugs. Totally confused. Vinny threw in. Rory chuckled. Aren't we all? But there's one good thing, dear Detective Inspector. At present, my department is helping to trial a new version of the microfluidic system for rapid forensic DNA analysis, something I thought this case could benefit from. We're getting samples processed in under four hours, so, although I don't have all the answers yet, I can tell you all the residue from the fight was male. Wow, that gives us plenty of food for thought, Rory. Joseph said. What interests me most is the contents of the syringes. Rory sounded contemplative. I'd like to know what they might have been used for. Putting someone to sleep or causing death. When will you know that, Rory? Asked Nicky quietly, thinking of the implications for her mother. Tomorrow, along with a lot of other things, hopefully. And now I wish you all a very good night. I have travel brochures to browse. Madagascar is favourite at present. Then I have a long drive in just a few short hours. Oh, and did I mention, this will cost you. The line went dead. Where's he going in those few short hours? asked Nicky. Ah, Joseph coughed. I haven't had time to tell you this bit yet. Rory is going to bring Jenny Foxwell home. Nicky's mouth dropped open. How is he going to do that? No one knows where she is. I have no idea. But if he says that's what he's going to do, then that's what he'll do. Yes, Nicky said, shaking her head incredulously. Yes, you're right. Chapter 17 Cameron Walker spent a long night in Greenborough General Hospital visitors' room. On the low coffee table in front of him sat a row of empty coffee cups. He wondered how many more there would be before he had some news of his injured detective. At 5 a.m., it finally arrived in the form of a smartly dressed young Asian woman with the most luxuriant dark hair Cam had ever seen. He is in a medically induced coma, Detective Chief Inspector Walker, she said. Cameron, please, it's less of a mouthful. 
Cam stood up and stretched. Is that a good thing? An induced coma? Oh, yes. It's one of the best forms of treatment we can offer. It will help to decrease the swelling and reduce the chances of intracranial pressure. And how long would you keep him like that? Every case is different, but... The doctor gave a shrug. I'd say a few days. Maybe a little longer. He will be constantly monitored, don't worry. And his chances, doctor? He looked at her intently. I know it's difficult to answer that one, but I'm not going to hold you to anything. It's just that I really need to know. Honestly, I don't know. Not until he wakes up. She nodded to the seat and sat down beside him. Where are his relatives, Cameron? Cam heaved a sigh. He only has a mother. Darren's father died right here in ITU. Ah, I see. Too much for her. Too much too soon. I have someone with her at home and I'll go straight there now. He pulled her face. Not that I have much in the way of good news for her. Her son is alive, and we will do everything we can to keep him that way. That's good news. He smiled wearily. True. He's young and strong. With this induced sleep, he has the very best chance. You tell her that. She gave him an encouraging smile. If I were a betting woman, which of course I'm not, she gave his forearm a squeeze. I think the odds are in his favour. Cam wanted to feel reassured, but he wasn't. He'd seen too many head injuries in his line of work, and he'd seen the aftermath. There was a side to Professor Rory Wilkinson that few people ever saw. On the surface, he was flippant, even casual, although the people that worked closely with him knew he took his work very seriously indeed. Beneath the surface, Rory was a very moral person. Rory was an advocate for the dead. He spoke for them when they could no longer speak for themselves. He championed their causes, cared for them, respected and protected them. He had made some overnight inquiries with regard to Jenny Foxwell, ruffled a lot of feathers and disturbed several people's sleep. By the time the night was over, he had a clear picture of what had probably occurred, and a concise plan of action. At ten-thirty in the morning, he was to be found sitting patiently outside the back entrance to a small public morgue in East London. He had borrowed a last-ride wagon complete with black windows to facilitate her journey back to Lincolnshire. Even Rory had had to admit that his old and well-loved Citroen Dolly was not exactly appropriate for this particular job. To get this far, he had threatened, argued, demanded, and made numerous scenes. He had pestered the very highest-ranking Home Office officials until finally the red tape had been unwound. In ten minutes, Jenny Foxwell would be going home. The whole business had tired him out. What had happened made him sick to the stomach. This whole affair stinks, he muttered to himself. The minute seemed interminable, until at last two technicians pushed a shrouded trolley through the back doors. Rory had a photograph of Jenny, and before accepting her, he unzipped the top of the black body bag and double-checked that this was indeed the right woman. At last, he was ready for the trip home. Okay, lovely lady, the scenic route, or do you want to go straight home? Superintendent Greg Woodall paced his office. Look, I know all about keeping busy when something personal happens, but are you sure you are up to it? Damn right, I'm up for this, sir. We've already worked out an action plan. Do you have any objections to us using a consultant? Nicky looked up at the pacing figure, who stopped in his tracks. In what capacity? The free kind. Vinny Silver is sorting out my surveillance cameras at home, and he has offered to lend a hand where he can. Ah, Vinny, I remember his quick thinking in our cat's abduction. Well, he can't be privy to anything confidential, and no stepping outside the rules and regs of the Official Secrets Act, okay? But yes, if he is volunteering help in a civilian capacity, I'm hardly going to object. As if, said Nicky carefully, and there will be no strain on the budget, if that helps. Greg slumped into his chair. We can give you a bit of extra help with Mad Tom. A few more bodies during the inquiries wouldn't go amiss, would they? That would be good, sir. I'd pass the whole thing over to another DI, but I don't think Mad Tom would allow that. We are still not sure whether this is a vendetta against me personally, or the police force in general. That's why I didn't suggest taking it off your hands, Nicky. He is directing all this at you and your team and you've got a sort of handle on this Latin thing, so, no, you need to hang on to the reins, I'm afraid. I just wish we had a handle on the rest of it. Any luck in finding Tom's next target? What's his name? Lauren Aspen, sir. He's a diamond thief. Nicky grimaced. And no, not yet. We still have a few pubs to pin down. 
We thought we had contacted all the local landlords, but Uniform have discovered a few more outlying watering holes still to visit. Excuse the bad pun, but has Tom given you a deadline? Not yet, but I reckon patience isn't his forte. I'm expecting it very shortly. Just getting his ID was pretty good going. Perhaps he'll take that into account. And perhaps he won't. Greg leaned back. I'd better let you get on, Nicky. But remember, I'm here if you need anything. Anything at all. I want to know what's happening every step of the way in your search for Eve, understood? Nicky nodded. Thanks, sir. I am going to find her. I can promise you that. I don't doubt it for one moment. He looked at her steadily. Just be careful, Nicky. This has all the hallmarks of an undercover intelligence organisation. And if that's the case, I don't have to spell out the trouble we could be in, do I? Nicky's expression hardened. I'm going to find my mother. End of story. The CID room was heaving with officers, and the noise from telephone conversations, printers and loud conversations almost made Nicky feel dizzy. No one was slacking, that was for sure. Joseph hurried towards her. I think we have all the daily instructions in place. Dave is OIC of the office, along with the rest of the civilian staff. Cat and Ben and a whole bunch of uniforms are heading up the search for Lawrence Aspen, so that we, plus Niall and Yvonne, with a bit of extra curricular help from Vinny, can devote all our time to Eve. We have extra manpower available for Mad Tom. The super is arranging that right now. Excellent. I'll tell Cat. Joseph lowered his voice. I've just heard from Vinny. Cloud Cottage Farm is secure and he's got an app that allows me to access real-time footage on my smartphone. Phew. Nikki shook her head. Technology. Useful technology. If he fancies another stint of housebreaking, we'll have him in glorious Technicolor. I don't think he will, do you? I doubt it, but hell, I'd love him to try. Joseph looked fierce. So, boss, how do we proceed? I've checked with Cameron, and that young detective is in a coma. No news about his condition until he wakes up. So the next step is to talk to Wendy and the others. Vinny is on his way in. So do we take him along? I want him to spend some time with those women. She nodded, thinking of Vinny. He's a perceptive man, and he's ex-military. I think they'll speak the same language. And you're also thinking that if they are under threat, what better man to have there? You know me so well. I should hope so. What would you like me to instruct Niall and Vonnie to do? Go and liaise with Cameron's team, and talk to anyone who might have been in the vicinity of Monk's Lantern yesterday. I'm sure Cam has sat under control, but I need a presence there too, to relay anything of interest back to us immediately. Joseph nodded. Right, I'll sort that straight away. Then as soon as Vinny arrives, we'll pay a call on my mother's friends. I spoke to Wendy earlier, and she said they will meet us at the big garden centre on the Greenville Road. It's the busiest place in the area, and they have a massive cafe. We need to talk, and it cannot be anywhere that connects us to Eve or either of the dead women. Perfect. Just as long as Mad Tom doesn't stick his blasted oar in. He will at some point. Let's just hope we can get our hunt for Eve underway first. They certainly needed to work quickly, because until they knew more from Rory, they had no idea why her mother had been taken, other than that she, like the other women, had stumbled on a dark secret. Nicky's face hardened. If they didn't find it, more people would die. Joseph, ring Vinny. Give him the name of the garden centre and tell him to meet us there, in the cafe. We can't wait any longer. Rory's whole team were focused on the crime scene at Monk's Lantern, and he and Spike were preparing for Jenny Foxwell's second post-mortem. The two were clearly connected, so he decided that his first task was to find out what really happened to Jenny. He read and reread the autopsy report prepared by the pathologist in London. It wasn't a work of fiction, but it was clear that the man had been given limited information about the deceased herself and the exact circumstances of her death. He checked the medical records of Jenny Foxwell's GP, including all the inoculations for a trip to Machu Picchu. He then moved on to the very detailed medical examination that she had undergone in order to renew her pilot's license. This was interesting. The aeromedical examiner had declared her fit to fly and had duly issued a Class II medical certificate. The regulations were extensive, and the medical conditions that could stop you flying were numerous. One was taking drugs for heart problems, angina or heart failure. Rory narrowed his eyes. This woman of 68 had been extremely fit. He decided to concentrate his search on toxicology. This was the one area not covered in the first PM. It hadn't been deemed necessary, and that, Rory decided, was at the heart of the deception. 
He saw again his Soko picking up the two syringes at the Monk's Lantern crime site. Rory was very, very interested in what was in them. If he could link one of the drugs to something in Jenny's tox report, they would have proof of foul play. He drew in a long breath. There were days when he was grateful for the speed with which forensic science had progressed. No two substances have the same chemical fingerprint, and each one can be identified with mass spectroscopy. Right now, his lab's mass spectroscope was bombarding the contents of one of those syringes with a beam of high-energy electrons. Later, the fragmentation patterns would tell them everything they needed to know about the unknown substance. He closed the reports and stood up. So far, Jenny Foxwell had not been treated very well. That would change. He, Rory Wilkinson, would see that her last examination was undertaken respectfully and with extreme professionalism. Afterwards, he would tell the world what really happened to her, and if he didn't, he'd make damn sure Nikki Galena did. Aware of the danger they were in, Wendy had insisted that her two friends temporarily move in with her. Lou was widowed, and Renee had separated from her long-term girlfriend, so they readily agreed. It was not a perfect arrangement. Now all the eggs were in one basket, as it were, but they decided it was preferable to stick together. There was safety in numbers. Nikki thought it was a very good idea. She was glad they had each other at such an anxious time. The weather was fine, so they sat outside. They had managed to secure a secluded table, half hidden by attractive garden plants. Wendy was stirring her black coffee thoughtfully. In our opinion, you need to do a thorough check on the air commodore. Lou nodded. We can't really take it further without putting ourselves in the line of fire. She reached into her bag and produced a thin file. This is what we have so far. It's not much, but we daren't dig deeper. Nicky stared at the title. Air Commodore Edward Arthur Rawlings. She skimmed the neat handwriting. Now what would this dark cloud indicate, I wonder? Renee leaned closer. It's most likely something personal, I imagine. His professional record seems unblemished, as far as we could tell. And none of us have picked up anything dodgy on the old grapevine. Lou grinned. We keep in touch, and there is lots of juicy gossip. But his name has never come up. Joseph sipped his coffee. Do you know what his department was, in the MOD? He was a principal systems engineer working on navigation systems. Then he rose to some undisclosed executive level, Renee said quietly. And Anne Castledine was working for his family, cataloguing his books? Nicky asked. Wendy nodded. It seems that his father was a collector, and the Commodore shared the old man's love of old botanical books. Nan reckoned the whole lot was worth a fortune. Was it going up for sale? The women all nodded. We need to see this famous collection. Nicky looked across at Joseph. And we need an expert with us. If Anne found something that was serious enough to get her killed and anyone else she told, we have to discover what it is. I met a bookseller the other day, Lou volunteered. He knew the Air Commodore, and I'm guessing he knew him rather well. She smiled at Nicky. He was a nice old man, but I think someone had got to him. He was a bit edgy and uncomfortable when I tried to get some info on the Commodore. He took my car number when I left. I saw him looking furtively out of the window. That's pretty dangerous, Lou. Joseph stared at her. Aren't you concerned about that? Not really, Lou beamed. It was a hire car that I conned my friend's stepson to let me have for my trip to Rutland. I have no connection with that vehicle at all. Joseph smiled. Sneaky. I was wondering if I might go back and get a private word with the old chap. I may be wrong, but I think he could help us. Maybe just leave it to us, said Nicky. We could get a detective to talk to him officially. No offence, but I think I would do a better job. In fact, we could all go together. She looked at Wendy and Renee and lifted an eyebrow. Wendy nodded. We need to do something. We'll go crazy otherwise. Nicky knew how they felt, absolutely. I can't stop you, but for God's sake be careful. Meanwhile, we'll go the police route to discover all we can about the Air Commodore. Then we pay the family a visit. She looked at them sternly. You have until tonight. See what you can find out, then ring me. Joseph looked across the cafe and grinned. Oh, did we forget to say, you have an escort for your trip today, and under the circumstances it would be prudent to use his vehicle. Ladies, meet Finney Silver. It took about two minutes for this very diverse group to gel. By the time Nicky and Joseph left, Vinny gave them a huge thumbs up and an even bigger grin. He's a one, isn't he? muttered Nicky on their way out. Joseph chuckled. He hasn't changed since the army. Just as Joseph pulled away, Nicky's phone rang. Mum! Cat sounded breathless. We've had a call to the CRD room. Mad Tom says you have until midnight. 
Well, we've translated it as such. Then he will kill Lawrence Aspin. Nicky groaned. The bastard. She just did not have time for his bloody games. Any further forward in tracing Aspen, Cat? Maybe. We've had a possible sighting in a little pub we hadn't sent any officers to. Ben is following up as we speak. We're on our way back. See you in ten. Nicky shut off the call. Mad Tom. Mad fucking Tom. Nicky ground her teeth. If my mother dies because of this, this asshole, I will personally tear the son of a bitch limb from sodding limb. She sat back and said no more for the rest of the trip. She didn't need to. The old Nicky Galena was back with a vengeance. Chapter 18 Eve woke for the second time and realised she had been given another shot. As soon as she became aware that she wasn't alone in the darkness, she was waking up again. This time, although she was still tied up, there was no gag. Eve heaved in a deep breath and exhaled loudly. She looked around. It was still dim, but it was evidently now daytime, and she could make out her surroundings. She could also clearly see the outline of the man sitting on a stool at the end of her bed. She eased herself up, and suddenly recognised the oddly familiar smell. Aftershave. A very particular aftershave. Jimmy? She had only ever known one man to wear that particular fragrance. You remembered, Eve. Even after decades, you remembered me. Jimmy? What's going on? Why am I here? Where am I? What is this place? Still as impatient as ever, I see. This is not funny. For heaven's sake, untie me. Jimmy Fraser sighed. Sorry, Eve. I can't do that. Eve took her time and tried to recall everything she could about James Darius Fraser. He was RAF. He'd been one of the lads she and her friends often knocked around with. He had been on the disastrous tour of duty that had ended in the conflagration of the aircraft carrier. He hadn't been badly burned, but she had heard he suffered mentally, having seen some of his comrades die in front of him. She thought harder. Jimmy had always been on the periphery, never one of the brightest lights and no show-off, as were some of the other men. He was quiet, almost shy, and although he was a more than competent flight engineer, people tended to overlook him, especially the women. Eve hadn't seen him since the fire. She stared at him. If it hadn't been for the aftershave, she would never have recognised the bearded, haggard man in front of her. Did you drug me? I'm afraid so. But they tell me there are no serious after-effects. I should think you are already feeling much better. Eve tried to get a hold on what had happened, and failed. There is water beside you on the locker. And now you're awake, I'll get you some food. He smiled at her, and for a second she saw a flash of the old sweetness. I'm sorry, but I cannot untie you. That would be a big mistake on my part. I think you can manage, though. He stood up, and she saw he was limping quite badly. Then she saw that one hand was crudely bandaged and the dressing was seeping blood. The fight. There had been a fight of some kind. What the hell had happened? Jimmy, we really need to talk. I know, but later. We'll talk later. First you need to eat to counteract the effects of the drug. He pointed across the half-lit room. Over in that corner, behind the screen, there's a chemical toilet. You'll find antiseptic hand wipes, and later I'll bring you some water to wash with. You'll have to shuffle, but you'll manage. He paused. You are a very resilient woman, Eve Anderson. One that's getting madder and more dangerous by the minute, thought Eve. Just tell me why. For goodness sake, Jimmy, why have you brought me here? He stopped at the door and looked back, his eyes wide. Why? To save you, of course. Nicky was firing questions at her team, barely waiting for the answers. So this time he gave you no riddle to solve for the location. Kat shook her head. No, Mum. Just a time. Midnight. Right. Joseph, get Mickey on the phone. I want to know if the Carber Estate Villains Network has picked up the slightest hint of a theft planned for tonight. Lawrence Aspin is working outside the Leonard family remit, so it's a long shot. But they might have picked up something. She turned to Dave. Have you heard anything from Ben yet regarding this possible sighting? He's on his way back, ma'am. He says he'll fill us in then. And nothing from any of the pub landlords that we've already contacted? No, ma'am. Nothing. Damn, this is ridiculous! Nicky folded her arms and stared at the whiteboard. Maybe we are looking at this all wrong. Cat moved closer. How come? All the time, Mad Tom is directing us away from himself, isn't he? He's making us spend all our time trying to identify the next victim. 
Perhaps we should be trying to identify Mad Tom instead. Hmm, you're right. Cat tilted her head and looked at the information in front of them. It's all places, times, thieves' names, pub names, and cant translations. Nothing about Mad Tom at all, except that he loves to play games. She glanced at Nicky. So how do we do this? As soon as Ben is back, and Joseph has spoken to the Carver Underworld Godfather, get everyone together. We'll brainstorm it. Nicky looked around in irritation. Hellfire, it's so damn noisy in here. I can hardly think straight. Cat looked up. Suggestion, Mum? Well? Galena's Grotto? It's still more or less intact. Nicky raised her eyes to heaven. You angel! Brilliant. Tell everyone to bring notebooks and pens. The computers and the printers have most likely been removed, but that's the best idea ever. I'll go down and check it out. Cat hurried off with a broad grin on her face. A while back, essential repairs to a water leak in the CID room and a big, rather hush-hush case had sent Nicky and her team into the station's basement area, where they found an old disused mess room. They made a nice bolt hole for themselves where they could work undisturbed. Joseph returned from making his call. Mickey has heard nothing, but he's got Raymond to put out the feelers. He'll ring us if he gets anything. Nicky nodded. Oh, well, it was worth a try. She told Joseph about the grotto. Good thinking. And while we are waiting for Ben, I'll contact Bonnie and Niall and get an update from Monk's Lantern. At the mention of Monk's Lantern, her mother's disappearance crashed back into her mind. Please, Joseph, if you would. And could you ring Rory? We haven't heard from him all morning. I need to know that he's safe, and if he succeeded in finding Jenny. Joseph went to his office. Right now, Nicky hated Mad Tom even more than whoever had taken her mother. She was desperate to find Eve and the people responsible for the deaths of Jenny and Anne. Mad Tom stood in the way. She massaged her temples. It was very hard to think rationally with thoughts of her mother crowding her mind. She straightened her back. Somehow she had to work this out. She had no choice. Cat unlocked the old mess room door and went inside. The big old room was much as it was when they finally vacated it and returned to the CID office. The desks and chairs remained, as did the numerous additions that had miraculously appeared during their stay. Bookcases, a coat stand, a wall clock, and other items that made their sojourn there more comfortable. Only one person knew that Cat still came down here regularly. She undid the cap on a bottle of water and gave the tall potted palm a drink. She had looked after it ever since they left. Here they had solved a gruelling murder case, the first she had worked on with Ben Radley. They had been going out together for a whole year now, and Cat was happier than she could ever remember. She walked across to a long trestle table and removed the tea towels covering a gleaming stainless steel coffee machine. She plugged it in with a smile. She and Ben spent their break times here, away from the hubbub of the station. The coffee machine was her most treasured possession, and Cat knew Nicky would be delighted to see it still here. Its origins were shrouded in mystery, like most of the other items that had found their way below stairs. The missing men's room clock had passed into legend by now. Cat gave a sly grin. Well, for heaven's sake, what did a men's room need a clock for? This room would be their sanctuary again. With an involuntary shiver, she wiped the names Avril and Gordon Hammond from the whiteboard and wrote Mad Tom in capital letters. We are coming for you, she whispered, and a faint echo reverberated around the empty room. Rory Wilkinson marched back to his office and sank down in his chair. He let out a long, loud sigh. He was relieved that the first PM on Jenny Foxwell was such a thorough and neat job. He was also frustrated at having to wait for the toxicology results. He already knew about one of those two mysterious syringes. The second result would be back as soon as his forensic chemist had interpreted the spectrum results. His gut told him that there would be a match with the drug found in the full syringe and in the late Jenny Foxwell. A large manila envelope sat on his desk with FAO Prof. R. Wilkinson printed across the top. He leant forward, opened it and carefully removed the contents. This post-mortem report probably contained the only information he would ever have on Anne Castledine's death. Her body had been cremated almost immediately after the autopsy had affirmed that she had died at the wheel of her car, having suffered sudden cardiac arrest. Another fit woman with an out-of-the-blue massive heart attack? Rory didn't think so. Which led him to wonder where the ashes were. A research scientist he knew had used something called inductively coupled plasma spectroscopy on cremated ashes and succeeded in ascertaining the chemical composition of cremated ash. The result was a fascinating breakdown of oxides, carbonates, phosphates, sulfates and chlorides. He also knew that they used spectroscopy on samples taken from the scenes of arson attacks and serious fires. 
Virtually any suspicious sample could be analysed using a variety of gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Was there a chance that something could be found in Anne Castledine's ashes? He sat up straighter. He would ring his friend. Then a picture rose up in his mind of some teary-eyed relative casting handfuls of wispy ashes over Beachy Head, or off the stern of a boat into a wind-lashed sea. Perhaps it would be prudent to know if the ashes still existed before asking complex questions. This aspect of forensics was not his strongest point. His phone rang. Joseph? Ah, oh, you are chasing me for results, no doubt. I'm not hounding you, I promise. We're just desperate to know how your early morning quest went. Rory smiled. I could not tell you how much I enjoyed having my alter ego run roughshod over anyone that stood in my way. Joseph, I was a veritable Jekyll and Hyde. Mostly Hyde. He lowered his voice. She's safe with me now, Joseph, and she's staying here until this is cleared up. Sounding relieved, Joseph thanked him profusely. It was my pleasure to be of help to you, but I do have some other news. He cleared his throat. I was waiting for one further set of results before I rang you, but the upshot is this. Two syringes were found at last night's crime scene. One had a clear set of fingerprints on it. The other one was clean. Ergo, two assailants— one wearing gloves, one bare-handed. The full unused syringe, with no prints on it, contained a powerful drug with the base ingredient digitalis. Foxglove. Exactly, and highly toxic. It's given as digitoxin or lantoxin to regulate the heart rhythm in congestive heart failure, but it was neither of those. It seems to be a designer drug, a deadly cocktail including a rarely used drug called reserpine an antipsychotic that increases the toxicity of digitalis. I've never come across this before, and I still need to work out what the other ingredients were added for, although I suspect they were some kind of suppressant that delayed the effects for a short time. It was almost certainly designed to precipitate a massive coronary heart attack and death. Joseph took a moment to answer. Then he said, So would you think that this poison was meant for Eve Anderson? Considering the fate of her dead friends? Absolutely, dear heart. Absolutely. And the other syringe? Wait ten minutes and we'll both know the answer to that. My dear young friend Amy is searching a forensic library as we speak. Her initial interpretive guess is a kind of updated midazolam. If she's right, that one would not have a fatal outcome. Come to think of it, I have to pop into town shortly for more travel brochures, so I'll drop by with the results and tell you in person. Rory could almost hear Joseph's brain working. A change of heart, maybe. Ah, but consider the fight that took place, dear boy. Now this is how I see it. He adopted his best BBC voice. Our killer waits patiently for Eve to step from the safety of the Gothic chapel called Monk's Lantern. Then a pesky detective turns up and starts nosing around. The killer curses then realises that the copper has seen his car parked a little way away at the back of the chapel. He needs to silence a detective, so he hits him. Ah, but too hard. Said detective goes down, bleeding heavily. The killer does not have time to remove the unconscious man and dispose of him, for Eve is his prime target. He retreats to the bushes and waits again. His prey steps from the chapel and sees the man on the path. OMG! She runs to his aid and the killer sees his chance. Swinge at the ready, he lunges forward, but lo! Another mystery man is also waiting for Eve, and this man powers into him, knocking the swinge from his hand. In the time it takes for the killer to recover himself, man number two sticks Eve with a knockout drug, and all hell breaks loose. Rory exhaled. Exciting, or what? It's certainly that, but isn't it rather far-fetched? We have isolated four different sets of DNA, said Rory smugly. One is Eve, who happens to be on our database following a rather naughty incident a year or so ago. One is our young detective. And then we have two more identified males, proud owners of the aforementioned snot, saliva, blood, nail, and skin tags, i.e. the fighters. Add that to the clear evidence of a punch-up, two files of drugs and a missing woman, I'd say very probable. Wouldn't you? Joseph whistled. So Eve could still be alive? I'm banking on that. But what the hell did man number two want with her? I haven't a clue, 
but if he stopped man number one murdering her, he's practically a hero. Unless he has similar designs himself. Rory's tone became serious. Don't get too excited just yet, Joseph. It's very early days, and I very much doubt that the people who wanted her dead in the first place will give up. They are most likely pig-sick and flaming bloody mad. They won't leave it there, I'm sure. Wherever she is, Eve is still in mortal danger. Chapter 19 The ride to Uppingham in Vinnie's big Toyota was a welcome release after all the sadness and trauma of the last few days. Lou found the big security IT expert hugely attractive, no matter that he was much, much younger than her. She determined to enjoy their trip, despite its sombre purpose. Vinnie was one of those rare characters that people immediately warmed to. He chatted away, regaling them with stories from his days in the Special Forces with Joseph Easter. Lou sensed that Vinnie had a great deal of brotherly love for Bunny Easter. The conversation grew more serious when they got to Rutland. "'How long had Dan been working at the house?' asked Vinnie. "'A month, maybe more.' Renee gazed out of the window. She really enjoyed the first few weeks. "'She had an incredible mind. That kind of thing, cataloguing and classifying, would have suited her very well.' It felt sad speaking of Anne in the past tense. Anne was able to make sense out of chaos. She could look at some confusing problem and instantly see a logical solution. Not the kind of woman to challenge at cryptic crosswords, then. Vinnie laughed. They all laughed with him. Anne used to finish the telegraph cryptic in record time. So she could have chanced upon something maybe no one else would have noticed. Some ambiguity. Or a reference to something odd. If there was any anomaly, said Wendy. Anne would have spotted it. But I'm wondering if she just chanced upon something she shouldn't have. A letter or a memo. What if something was concealed in one of those dusty old botanical tomes? That's possible, said Lou. I've pushed things in between the pages of books before now to keep them safe. Or maybe she overheard something. The family talking about something that Anne found disturbing. A phone call, maybe? Renee interjected. Vinny glanced at Lou, sitting beside him in the passenger seat. Hey, Lou, what makes you think the old guy in the bookshop can help? Good question, thought Lou. Just a hunch. I get feelings about people. Sounds odd, but I can kind of read between the lines where people are concerned. She shrugged. She's being modest. Lou's talent is emotional intelligence. She instinctively understands unspoken communication. Wendy leaned forward and touched her shoulder. The MOD found it very useful in certain situations. Lou brushed this off, embarrassed. As I said, just a quirk. They parked where Lou had on her previous visit. The bookshop frontage was as worn as some of the old volumes inside, but she had loved it. She just hoped she was right about its owner. They got out and stretched. I hope he's open. There's a close sign on the door, but he may have just forgotten to turn it round, and, as I remember, the door sticks. Lou went first. The door opened smoothly. Must have found the WD-40. Hello? There was no answer. They stood inside the empty shop, listening. Lou called out again. Vinnie frowned. I heard something. Me too, said Rene. It's coming from the back. Lou began to run forward, but Vinnie held her back. Let me. A few seconds later, he called out, In here, quickly! The back room was a tiny, airless place containing an electric fire, a small sink, a mini-fridge, a kettle, an old-fashioned card table and a chair. Robert Callum was lying back in the old winged armchair, gasping for breath. In her early days in the forces, Wendy had trained as a medic. Now she was first to his side. She held his wrist. My God, his pulse is all over the place. It's his heart. Renee grabbed her phone and dialed 999. I'll wait outside and flag down the ambulance, said Vinnie and hurried out. Lou frowned. Heart attack. Another heart attack. Warning bells rang. Wendy asked the man what his name was. She reassured him that help was on its way. Robert, he wheezed. Then he looked over Wendy's shoulder, and a smile spread across his white face. My Matahari. Wendy looked askance at Lou. Are you really an international antique thief? Lou knelt down beside him and took his hand in hers. Try not to talk, Robert. But no, of course I'm not. Who gave you that ridiculous idea? Then she realized, of course, Last time he had been wary because someone had told him to look out for a rare book thief. Dear Fitch, he gasped. Horrible, 
horrible man. Shh, Robert, try to relax. She touched Wendy's arm. I have a bad feeling about this, Wen. Yet another heart attack? Wendy nodded. I'm thinking the same. I'm ringing D.I. Galena, Lou said. Okay, I'll try to keep him calm. Lou looked down at him. If he can, get him to tell you who this Fitch person is, but don't tax him too much. Grandmother and eggs to you. Just bugger off and ring the police, Lou. Joseph Easter answered, and Lou told him what she thought might have happened. Hold on, Lou. There's someone here who can help you. I'm passing you over to Professor Rory Wilkinson. Rory got straight down to business. I think he has been given a drug that contains digitalis, so listen. I want you to get him onto the floor and keep him lying down. It will lessen the strain on his heart. Is there someone with you? Lou said there was and told Wendy what to do. Strong tea. Make him strong tea and get it down him as fast as possible. Tannic acid will help counteract the effects of the digitalis. It's his best hope until you can get him to an emergency department. Lou barked this out and Renee went to put the kettle on. Thank you, Professor. We appreciate it. Lou hung up and raced back to where Wendy was getting the old man to the floor. Hang on in there, Robert. He looked up at her with frightened eyes. He lied, didn't he? That dear Fitch. She nodded. Was he a local police officer, Robert? Robert made a slight movement of his head. Art and antiques unit. From the Met. Oh, yes, thought Lou. I'll bet he was. And, of course, he had a warrant card and ID. He nodded. Then René knelt down, holding a mug of very strong tea. You have to drink it, Robert, Lou said. It will help you, I promise. It wasn't easy to convince the paramedics about the tea, but finally they had to admit that his erratic heart rate had slowed enough for them to get him to hospital. Wendy asked where they were taking him, and told Lou to get back to Nicky Galena. We need to know how to deal with this. We should get the police and forensics here. But maybe Nicky should be the one to explain. It looks a little suspicious that the three of us have again happened upon a serious crime scene. At least this time one of us isn't the victim. But that poor old guy, Robert. Such a lovely man. He really didn't deserve this. Lou hoped to God that she wasn't to blame for what had happened to Robert. And he really liked you, Matahari. Lou gave Wendy a playful cuff. At least I wasn't wrong about him. You never are, clever clogs. Now, make that call. There was something rather comforting about being down in the bowels of the police station again. The last time they were here, they had managed to solve a very complex murder, and Nicky prayed that the old mess room would be lucky once again. Before we start, Ben, what news on that possible sighting? Nicky said. I've asked Uniform to get involved, Mum. It's a funny little pub, really out of the way. The barmaid recalled two men talking to a rather well-off couple, but she only works there part-time, and she didn't know the couple or where they came from. I thought it was worth following up, so the Sarge downstairs is getting a couple of officers to dig deeper. They'll keep us informed. Excellent. So, now we need to know Tom's reason for killing these thieves. Nicky scribbled the word motive on the board. And why he uses some secret language to communicate with us. She added the word can't, followed by a question mark. Was there anything about his voice, Mum, or the way he spoke that stood out? Asked Ben. I'd say it was a local accent, but it wasn't very strong. Age? Asked Dave. Nicky frowned. I'm not good at ages, especially from a voice. I'd say he is certainly not young, but he sounded strong and very threatening. Maybe over forty. I'm wondering if he uses the same method as the thieves to find his next mark, said Cat. He either knows these criminals and their habits, or he hunts them down. Ben looked at her. And if he does that, maybe one of our pub landlords has noticed him sitting quietly with a pint and watching the other punters. Good point, said Joseph. I think we should contact them. Nicky nodded. Yes, but what about your first thought, Cat? The one about already knowing them? What if this is a vendetta? Not against us, but against other thieves who have upset him? That's a real possibility, said Dave. Someone could have cut him out of a lucrative deal or maybe even left him to take the rap for something he never did. Want me to check out anyone who has recently been released from jail on a robbery or burglary charge? Asked Ben. Why not? And have a look for any unsolved crimes of that nature, but something pretty big, where the ill-gotten gains never turned up. I'm thinking along the lines of someone trying to hog the booty and leave Mad Tom out in the cold. Ben made a note on his pad. I'll do that, Mum. Joseph shook his head, clearly not convinced. 
do you think that is worth killing for, in such a violent manner? Dave shrugged. It could be, if there was a very large sum involved. Maybe if he did go down for their crime, something happened to Tom in jail. Perhaps Tom's just barking mad and devised this game just for the hell of it, Cat added. Nicky stared at the board. They were getting nowhere. Right, back to Cat's idea about hunting for them in pubs. Ben, consider this. You are not a criminal yourself, but you want thieves to pay dearly for something that happened to you. You stalk them, watch them, read up on them, and finally kill them, violently. Then, not content, you taunt the police with games and riddles. She looks at Ben. Why? Ben screwed up his face, and then his eyes lit up. Because they hurt me, badly, and, regarding taunting the police, maybe we never caught them, or perhaps the investigation was botched in some way. Sadly, it does happen sometimes. He thinks we let him down. A smile crept over Nicky's face. I think we now have our motive and an action plan. Mad Tom was a victim, and now he's taking his revenge. And taunting us for our original incompetence. Finished off Joseph. Nice one, Ben. Ben looked at Nicky knowingly. I think the boss already knew. She just wanted me to put it into words. Not really. Maybe the seed was sown, but you got there first, so credit where it's due. Maybe this was a lucky room. Nicky knew without a doubt that they were right on track. The trouble was, it didn't help them find Lawrence Aspen, the diamond thief with a death sentence hanging above his head, that he didn't even know about. Joseph's phone rang. He listened and handed it to Nicky. Lou Fawcett. She's wondering about the old guy at the bookshop, and what to do when the local police turn up. I'll handle it, Lou, said Nicky. Where are you exactly? Lou told her the address. I'll ring them now and explain the situation. I'll get them to secure the scene, and I'll tell them we'll use one of our so-calls since it's most likely part of an ongoing situation here. Whatever, just leave your contact details with the first officer to arrive and get yourself safely home. Is Vinny still with you? Lou said that he was. Keep him with you. I'll contact you later. Nicky ended the call. I need to get back upstairs and talk to Leicestershire Police. Can you finish up here and get the team onto chasing up old cases? There are especially ones where our performance was rather less than spectacular. No problem. Joseph smiled. I really think this is the right way to go. Me too, but let's hope Uniform find our thief, or soon we'll have a dead thief on our hands. Chapter 20 Jimmy Fraser carefully placed a mug of tea on the table next to Eve and quietly explained about the place he had brought her to. He was careful not to get too close to her, despite the fact that her wrists and ankles were firmly tied. He backed away and sat down heavily on a chair a little distance away. He's no fool, thought Eve. According to Jimmy, she was lying in a log cabin, one of four that Jimmy's father had built on the shore of a small private fishing lake in the grounds of his home. The enterprise failed and the cabins had been left to rot. Jimmy had kept this one in reasonable condition and apparently stayed here regularly. But why? What were his reasons for saving her? Above all, Eve needed to find a way of contacting Nicky. She would be distraught. So, no one knows about this place, she said casually. A few locals might remember it, and we've had the odd squatter, but no one bothers to come here. And your dad died. When? Way back. Not long after I came out of the services. Do you live here in the old family home? Jimmy narrowed his eyes. No. It's gone. Eve decided to take a different approach. I'm not being nosy, Jimmy. It's just that it's been so long. I wondered what you'd been doing with yourself. Jimmy stared down at his hands, clasped together in his lap. Let's just say I never had the glorious career that you had. His voice became hard. Not all of us came through the carrier incident as well as some. She would have to tread carefully. I know I was one of the lucky ones, Jim. But you did survive too. You think so? You asked me where I live. Well, right here. Or on the streets, or in alleyways, or in the woods, or someone's derelict barn. I can't sleep inside. Not since I came back. I have to be out in the air. I'm so sorry, Jimmy. I never knew. Why should you? Even back then, you were never interested in me. No one was. His voice rose. Eve didn't like his tone. That's not true. I really liked you. She lowered her voice. I always thought we were good friends, weren't we? Good friends? Not really. I knew you all just tolerated me. He paused. Eve... You only ever had eyes for Frank Reed, and who could blame you? He was handsome, really brave, and a very nice bloke. I did love Frank, that's true. 
but you knew you couldn't have him. So I waited. I hoped. But then you disappeared. Oh dear. Eve did not like this one bit. How long had Jimmy Fraser been waiting and watching her? Frank's dead, you know, she said quietly. I know. There's not much I don't know about the old group. Like I know that Anne and Jenny are dead too. Now that was not common knowledge. Anne maybe, but there was no way anyone other than the police, her closest friends, and maybe a few beach lacy locals knew about Jenny. Nothing had been officially released, and Jenny's death was still under wraps. How did you know, Jimmy? He tapped the side of his nose. I keep abreast of things. Eve had grown impatient with all this cat and mouse stuff. Enough pussyfooting around. I think you need to tell me exactly what the hell is going on. And why am I your prisoner here? You said it was to save me. Well, damn it, Jimmy, save me from what? Jimmy flinched. For a moment, Eve thought he would cry. He swallowed a few times, then stood up. I can see you're upset. I'll leave you for a while. No, come back and explain what this is all about. But he was already halfway out the door. When you were calmer, Eve, I can't talk to you when you were like this. And he closed the door. Eve lay back, seething, cursing herself for being so stupid. Jimmy Fraser was going to require very careful handling. She let out a sigh. She'd better use her time alone to decide how best to approach strange, damaged Jimmy. And next time, Eve, she told herself, try to hold your temper. Narl and Yvonne were back from their day working with Cameron's team. Nicky asked how D.C. Smith was doing. No change, Mum, said Yvonne, although they hope to try to bring him round tomorrow. The whole station is in shock, added Nile. Apparently nothing really serious ever happens in Beach Lacey, and he's a really popular officer. It's always a good guys, Nicky sighed. Any news from Monk's Lantern? Yvonne shook her head. The problem is that the lay-by at the end of the drive is used all the time, since the lane's too narrow to park on. One couple did spot the car with dark-tinted windows, Mum. It stood out because most cars around there are farm vehicles. And my mother's car. Yvonne squinted at her notebook. The vicar of Beach Lacey Parish Church, uh, Rev Rosemary Creasy, she saw Eve drive in and thought she might call and have a chat with her about the arrangements for Jenny Foxwell's funeral. Then she decided it would be more tactful if she just left a card with a phone number on it. Yvonne looked up. Then she remembered that she was due to see another parishioner and forgot about it. She didn't see the car leave, but... Niall took over. I'm running a check on the nearest CCTV cameras. If we can pick it up in the area, we might at least be able to see whether she was driving alone or not. Nicky nodded. Well, her car is certainly gone. But as you say, was she driving it? Yvonne looked crestfallen. I'm sorry, Mum. We've turned up pretty much nothing, really. The whole lay-by is a mishmash of tyre marks and mud from the tractors. It's useless to try and identify anything. Nicky shrugged. I know you did your best. She suddenly felt as if her head were about to explode. Amid the mounting pressure, she somehow had to balance the two cases. She must not on any account make mistakes. They could be very costly indeed. They could cost lives. Nicky rubbed her hands together and tried to get her thoughts into some kind of order. Vinny Silver was riding shotgun with her mother's friends. They were as safe as it was possible to make them. The team were working flat out to identify Mad Tom, and she even had the criminal fraternity helping to pinpoint a possible location for a theft that night. She could do no more. Or could she? She had a passably good photo of Lawrence Aspen. What if she hit the TV news with his picture and a request for sightings? She could say he was under considerable threat from an undisclosed source, and she was anxious to speak with him as a matter of urgency. She would make no mention of his being a diamond thief. If nothing else, seeing his face staring back at him from the TV screen might scare him straight back to London. It would not do his career much good either. What thief would want to be associated with such a public figure? She looked around for Joseph, but he wasn't there. Okay, Nicky would take her idea to Greg Woodall and see what he thought. Somehow the super managed to get her a slot on both local and national TV, the downside was that he insisted that she should be the face of Fenland Constabulary instead of him. She argued that he had far more gravitas than her, and would come across so much better, but he was having none of it. Think about it, Nicky. Mad Tom is aiming all this your way. If he sees you up there, he should realise that you are playing his game in earnest. Nicky was a private person, and normally avoided cameras like the plague. She felt frumpy and badly dressed, and her hair was a mess. Bugger it, she muttered, staring into the woman's room mirror. I'm a working copper, not a bleeding celebrity. I'm delivering an urgent police message, not advertising sodding shampoo. 
Actually, you look great. Kat's face appeared in the mirror beside hers. You look the part. Not like one of those high-fashion, high-ranking officers that they usually dredge up to try and give us a human face. Nikki pushed an offending stray lock of hair from her face. Thanks, Kat, I think. I'm not actually sure how to take that. Kat grinned and produced a long chiffon scarf in various shades of blue. Wear this, Mum. It matches your jacket and softens the neckline. She wrapped it expertly around Nikki's neck, then stood back and nodded. Perfect. Really classic and dead smart. Suits you. Nikki nodded, wondering not for the first time whether she ought to put more effort into her appearance. Yvonne stuck her head around the door. They're here, Mum. They want to talk to you from the station steps with the Fenland Constabulary badge just behind you. Well, at least it's not pissing down with rain. Nikki grinned at Cat. Better get this over with, I suppose. Knock him dead, Mum. Cat grinned back. Not literally, though. On her way down to the foyer, Nikki wondered if she could get a message out to her mother. You never knew. She might be somewhere with a television. Nikki shook her head. Stupid idea. It went well. She sounded assertive and in control, but still managed the right tone of encouragement in urging the public spirited to rally around and help find this man. Then it was over and she was back in her office. Now there really was nothing more she could do. In Wendy's home in a small village north of Greenborough, Vinnie and his three wards sat eating a Chinese takeaway and watching the television. Joseph had phoned and told them to watch the news. The women didn't know the background. Vinnie told them that someone was making death threats against this man. It must be odd for the police to know the victim before the murder happens, said René, and reached out for another spring roll. And very frustrating if you don't know where the hell they are, added Wendy. Poor Nicky has an awful lot on her plate right now, doesn't she? I'm sure it would be a great help and a big relief if she knew where Eve was. Lou sounded contemplative. Don't you think? Wendy looked at her warily. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Quite possibly. Ladies, Vinny put on his best head teacher expression. It is my sworn duty to look after you. So? Renee smiled sweetly. We aren't stopping you. Look after us. While well, you do what exactly? While well, we find Eve. Lou stated. Now, Mr. Silver, are you in? Vinnie let out a noisy groan. Oh, well, and damnation. What have I let myself in for? All I came here for was to set up a couple of security cameras, and now I find I'm knee-deep in Jason Bourne territory. But so much more exciting. Renee gave him a conspiratorial smile. You'd be helping your friends and allowing them to get on with finding their murderer. They'll kill me. Believe me, you don't know Nicky Galena like I do. As if realising what was being asked of him, Vinnie became serious. Ladies, please reconsider this. If one or all of you gets hurt, there will be serious repercussions and it might all come down on Eve Anderson's head. We have no idea what has happened to her, and if we barge in where we aren't wanted, it could make things worse for her. Vinnie, she could be dead already. Jenny and Anne certainly are. Wendy looked straight at him. And we are probably next. Would you sit around and wait for your enemies to come for you? Would you throw up your hands and say, take me? I don't think so. Do you? Vinnie exhaled. What have you got in mind? That's better, soldier. Lou patted his knee. Right now, some more of that delicious Sichuan beef, I think. And afterwards, another glass of wine. Then we hold a council of war. Chapter 21 Night had fallen. Darkness closed in on two people, far apart but both angry and embittered. Eve was still cursing her runaway tongue. Jimmy had not returned. She had drunk the tea with some difficulty considering her tied wrists, and now she was starving hungry. Earlier she had hobbled to the chemical toilet, which was an experience she hoped not to have to repeat too often. On her way back to her bunk, she had managed to see a little of what was outside the window. The old site was overgrown and derelict. Two of the other cabins were in a state of complete collapse, while one appeared to be used as some kind of store. The windows were barred with lengths of wood nailed across them, and she could see dull light reflecting off a heavy padlock. Even the lake itself, nothing but a pit filled with water, looked dark and unwholesome. Weeds and rushes met in a jumble on its banks, and the wooden pontoons and jetties where fishermen once spent happy hours away from their wives had rotted and were now just jagged spars sticking tooth-like out of the water. She noticed a dark hump not far from the cabin. It took her a while to realise that it was a car, 
and from its shape and size most likely her car, camouflage with a net and leafy branches. So he had brought her here in her own car. Eve straightened. Hidden inside that car was another mobile phone, fully charged and ready to go. She nibbled on her lip, if she could somehow get outside. She stood at the window for some time, looking out and doing stretches to ease her cramped muscles. She could not afford to stiffen up. At her age and with no exercise, that could easily happen. She needed to keep moving, and if, no when, she told herself, the time came for escape, she would be fit enough to take her chance. But there was no chance of freeing her hands. Jimmy had used strong nylon straps that worked like cable ties, with a series of small nylon teeth that locked tightly. If you struggled, they tightened. Her feet were tied with the same straps, but Jimmy had allowed enough leeway to let her shuffle to the toilet. Eve sat down on the bed and tried to fathom Jimmy Fraser. He seemed to be a man of contradictions. He slept rough, but still wore the same expensive cologne. What was that all about? He'd saved her from something. He professed to care about her, and now he was starving her. Eve lay back. She needed a plan. When he came back, assuming he would, she was going to have to tread on eggshells to get any answers from him. She closed her eyes. She had been in worse situations in her life, but not many. It dawned on her that whoever Jimmy had saved her from might still be hunting for her, and if they found her now, trussed up like a bloody oven-ready chicken, no one would save her. The second angry and embittered soul was also wondering what to do. He had watched the early evening news in horrified disbelief. D.I. Nicky Galena had called upon the entire bloody country to keep a lookout for his mark. There was no way he could kill him now, and Lawrence Aspen would probably be halfway across the country by midnight. He paced the room. Oh, she must be feeling very smug right now, must D.I. Galena. His eyes narrowed. Well, she wouldn't feel like that for long. There were plenty of targets out there. He would find another, and she'd be back on the treadmill again just like a hamster, running its little legs off inside its wheel and getting absolutely nowhere. The thought of this pleased him immensely. He continued to pace. Something was bothering him. But why? He, the game master, should be applauding her strategy. And he wanted such a worthy opponent. He should be pondering his next move and reaching for the appropriate piece. But he wasn't. He felt as if, by using the media to block him, she had swept the pieces off the board. He sensed that D.I. Nikki Galena was far from wholeheartedly committed to his game. She had seemed distracted, facing the camera but with her mind elsewhere. But the game would go on. In the game, he was in control. A vicious smile spread across his face and he whispered, I wonder, Detective Inspector, how you'll feel if I bring the game a little closer to home. Their search was starting to throw up names, and no one on the team wanted to leave it now and go home. Cat and Ben seemed to be making the most headway. They worked together really well. It had been a gamble taking Ben into the team, knowing that he and Cat were on the verge of a serious relationship. But it had paid off. Joseph sent out for food and they all worked on, checking and cross-checking old cases involving bungled thefts. The hours ticked by towards midnight, and Nikki found herself constantly looking up at the clock. No one mentioned it, but she was sure they all wanted to be there together when the hour finally struck. Several times she encouraged them to get home, but no one even looked up. At around nine o'clock, Cat raised her hand. We've whittled it down to four old cases that could fit the bill, ma'am. Nicky beckoned her to the front of the room, where there was an empty whiteboard. Let's hear em, Cat. All of these occurred within the last eight years, ma'am, and in each one, somebody was injured or incapacitated. Here's the first. Cat wrote Levi Sellers in large letters on the board. Levi Sellers returned from an evening at the local with his fiance and discovered two thieves ransacking his home. Maybe he'd had too much to drink, but anyway he took them both on. He suffered two broken legs. We never caught the robbers, even though he gave a very good description of them. She pulled a face. He was not best pleased and understandably so. Where did he live? asked Dave. One of the Greenborough South Villages. She glanced at her notes. Burnfleet, pretty rural, a small farm cottage in a lane that runs onto the fens. Now, number two, Andrew Falcon. She wrote the name on the board. This man and his family were awoken one night to find three men downstairs in the lounge. Mr Falcon was a former golf pro. He had a considerable amount of silver plate in a display cabinet, 
plus a rather valuable collection of antique French miniature portraits. Two of the men restrained his wife and daughter, and the third explained to Mr. Falcon exactly what would happen to them unless he unlocked the cabinet that held the miniatures and handed over all the money he could lay his hands on. It turned out to be quite a sum. In this case, although we caught the thieves, there was a mix-up concerning contaminated forensic samples, and the CPS threw it out of court. Bloody great, muttered Nicky. His daughter then started having nightmares and finished up a nervous wreck. Falcon hounded us for months, then backed off for some reason. They live somewhere near you, ma'am, about a mile or two from Cloud Fen. Big posh drum, apparently, a refurbished farmhouse, stables and a couple of acres of paddock. Nicky frowned. Do you mean Falcon Mere? Yes, ma'am. That was one of D.I. Jill Mercer's inquiries. I recall she was livid with the private forensics company that handled those samples. Moving on. Cat wrote another name on the board. Thomas Newstead. This man lived with his son and daughter in an outlying village called Colby O'Dyke to the north of Greenborough. He was a have-a-go hero too, but took a battering. His son decided to wade in and help his father and also received a good thumping. The thief, a single-masked man, had already packed up a nice haul of booty while they were out. We found some DNA at the scene, but we couldn't tie it to any known criminal and, frankly, we gave up after several months of investigation. Another unhappy bunny, added Ben. He spent a lot of his own money trying to find the man and get his stolen items back. Private investigators, media coverage, the works. But nothing ever came of it. And number four, asked Nicky, with another glance at the clock. My best bet. I'd put good money on this one. Dieter Haft, Lincolnshire born and bred, but had a German-Jewish father. His mother died tragically when he was a teenager, and he lived with his father in Carttoff Village. They had a respectable house, not grand, but pretty upmarket. His grandfather, a survivor of the concentration camps, made a lot of money just after the Second World War, and Dieter's father, another shrewd businessman, had invested wisely. By the time of the robbery, he was crippled with arthritis, and Dieter was practically a full-time carer. "'Can you hear the violins?' asked Dave, placing a cupped hand behind his ear. "'This is more like a soap.' "'Don't worry. It soon turns into a crime thriller,' Cat said ominously. Dieter Haft went to Lincoln one afternoon to collect a new wheelchair for his dad. He arranged for a friend to call in and give his father his tea and generally check that he was OK, then went shopping and treated himself to a meal out. He arrived home at 8.30 in the evening and found his father tied to his chair, blindfolded and gagged. He couldn't find any signs of a break-in, and there was no mess and no damage. The thieves had taken irreplaceable family heirlooms and jewellery worth a small fortune. Don't tell me, Joseph said grimly. We cocked up. Right royally, Cat looked glum. Whatever could go wrong with an investigation did, from day one. Oh, yes, and I was involved in it. Nicky remembered it well. She had every reason to. All eyes turned to her. I don't know if any of you knew DCI Redhead. Dave nodded. Went by the nickname of Blackie. Not the most distinguished career, as I recall. Not entirely his fault, said Nicky. He was sick, but no one knew it, including Blackie himself. He made a lot of errors, including several during the Haft robbery investigation. I was roped in when he took a turn for the worse and his illness was diagnosed. But by then the damage was done. As Cat said, we failed that man right royally. So, said Ben thoughtfully, that could be why he picked on you to play his game. The DCI is no longer here, but you are. And he would have every reason to feel antagonistic towards thieves, said Joseph. He would. Cat looked at the four names. But the reason we have chosen these particular cases is because each one had some sort of backlash, and that makes them even more likely. She looked across to Ben. Explain, please. Ben picked up an A4 notepad. Levi Sellers became something of a recluse after the incident. He lost a very good job, and then his fiancée called it a day and moved away. He looked at his notes. Andrew Falcon's marriage ended in divorce as a result of the occurrence. The wife took the nervous wreck of a daughter, and Andrew blamed the incompetence of the police force. Thomas Newstead is a bit of an enigma. We can't be too sure about the effect it had on his family. Both the son and the daughter went off the rails after the attack, but it was possible that they had been heading that way anyway. Whatever, Thomas caused a furor, and used social media and the local rag to slag us off. It was intimated that he lost something very precious, and that was the reason for the P.I.s. But it's all a bit... He waggled his hand. Iffy. I guess Dieter Haft's story needs no afterword, asked Joseph. Actually, it does, Cat chipped in. Ben? The father, who'd previously been sharp as a knife, 
never got over his treatment at the hands of the intruder and developed a severe mental disorder, something called acute stress disorder. In the end, Dieter couldn't cope with him, and he had to be hospitalised. He died soon after. Nicky groaned. Jesus, I didn't know things got that bad. I guess we don't always see the next chapter, do we? Dave said gravely. Things don't just go back to normal for the victims and their families after the case is closed. At least we have somewhere to start now. First thing in the morning, we'll get Nile and Yvonne. Then we'll split into pairs and take all four of these at the same time. Check everything you can before you go banging on their doors. For one thing, none of them will welcome us, and one could be very dangerous indeed. Extreme care, folks, okay. And now, it really is time to go home and get some rest. We have no idea what tomorrow might bring. She smiled at them. Get the message. Go. As the team trooped out, Nicky noticed it was close to ten. Joseph took out his phone. Before we head off, I'm going to ring Mickey and see if there is any news from the streets. This waiting is killing me. Hey, Joe. Great minds and all that. I just had my finger ready to call you. Mickey sounded excited. Got something for his kid? Oh, yes. Mr. Aspen has hightailed it. A couple of Uncle Raymond's men saw him bundling cases and bags into an Audi. They decided to check the room he had been renting, and it had been cleared out. Uncle doesn't think we'll see him again. And by the way, he says to tell Inspector Nick, respect. The bulletin on the telly was a very nice move on her part. I'll be sure to pass it on, said Joseph with a smile. There's more. Aspen wasn't alone when our men spotted him. He was having a right barney with someone. Luckily, they knew the other guy, and they know who he runs with. He paused for effect. A gang of thieves, Sergeant Joe. And Raymond knows the names and whereabouts of most of them. Thing is, do you want them? Or should Uncle Raymond do the business? Tempting as it is to hand it over to your uncle. Maybe we should take it from here. Thought you'd say that, Mickey chuckled. So I've made a list. Shall I email it to you? That would be great. Uniform can make a few surprise house calls. You do know that you are going to deprive some of the family of hours of fun, don't you? Sorry to hear that, but at least we won't be knocking on their doors. True, but frankly, I think they'd chance that. Mickey laughed again. Whatever, if a few of those names are taken out of the running, we will all benefit. Joseph frowned. Mickey, you are starting to sound like a proper Leonard. You aren't thinking of joining the family business, are you? Relax, Sergeant Joe. I'm really enjoying my apprenticeship right now. Once I'm a qualified engineer, I'll see what the money is like. Then maybe I'll make a few career changes, but not until I'm much older. Joseph took a few breaths. Mickey added. Chalk! It had better be, young man. You are the one shining light on the Carborough estate. I'd hate to see you go the way of the others, especially after what you went through. Thank you for caring. But don't worry. I couldn't let Fran and Peter down, could I? Or you and Inspector Nick. Hell, I wouldn't dare! Peter was the late Archie Leonard's only legitimately employed son. Having lost a young son of their own, Peter and his wife Fran had adopted Mickey, the problem child, and made a damned good job of turning him around. Joseph had always wondered about the pressures and temptations of living so close to a family of rogues. They said goodbye. Joseph waited a few minutes and checked his emails. There was Mickey's message. Joseph scanned the list of names and smiled grimly. If these guys were brought in, even if just for questioning, it would cause chaos within the newly formed Thieves' Guild. In fact, with the Diamond Thief's hasty departure, the whole association might well collapse. It usually happened when the police got too close. Cut and run, regroup in a different area. Start again. And good bloody luck, thought Joseph. Just leave our patch and don't come back. Chapter 22 It was late, and Eve was alone in the dark. She heard the sound of a car pulling up outside the cabin. But wasn't Jimmy a vagrant? How could he afford a car? What if it wasn't Jimmy? Eve tensed and took a few deep breaths. The sound of a key in the door relaxed her somewhat. It would be Jimmy and she sincerely hoped he had brought her some food. She needed to gather her wits and not blow it this time. I'm sorry it's so late. I got held up in town. He sounded like a husband, late home from a busy day at the office. Jimmy brought in numerous bags and boxes and took them out of her field of vision. She supposed there must be some sort of kitchen area. Do you have a dog, Jimmy? She inquired rather too brightly. I do. How did you know? I guess he's missing a blanket. There was a short pause. Then he laughed. I did wash it first, and it's good quality. It's better than my own. So where is the dog? Looking after my things while I'm away. 
Shall I bring him to visit? Away from where? thought Eve. That would be nice. I love dogs. To her relief, she heard the clink of cutlery and crockery, and shortly the smell of cooking filled the cabin and made her salivate. Stay where you are for a moment or two, he told her. It won't be long. You must be starving. I'm bloody ravenous. I am rather. Those few minutes seemed like hours to Eve. Then he said, Make your way to the dining room, please. It took Eve a while to stretch her stiff legs and then shuffle over to where Jimmy Fraser waited for her. Jimmy was dressed in smart black trousers, a crisp white shirt and a dinner jacket. Eve stopped mid-shuffle. There was a table with two chairs on either side. There was a white linen tablecloth, a small candle holder with two flickering candles, and a slender glass vase with three red roses in it. The reason I was late. He pointed to the table. I needed to get some money from the bank. My lifestyle doesn't allow me to carry more than very small amounts of cash on me. And I wanted this, to be special. Play along, Eve told herself, and be very careful. I'm speechless. Well, that was true. It's beautiful, Jimmy. He held out a chair for her. Please, sit down. He stepped back quickly. Now, we've got Italian food, as I know it's one of your favourites. It's from Mario's in Greenborough, so you know it's going to be good. There is wine if you wish, but I can't join you, I'm afraid. Water is fine, thank you. Eve wanted a clear head, even though the desire for a massive glass of wine was almost overpowering. Eve had no idea what was going on. She decided not to try to understand. Above all, she needed sustenance. Could you untie my hands? Or at least slacken the ties off a little? I understand why you see the need for it. I really, I do. But it will be so difficult to eat. Regretfully, no. If you use just the fork, you will find it quite easy after a while. I did it myself to see how it worked. You'll soon get the hang of it. He smiled encouragingly. Eve wanted to stab him. Only she didn't have a knife. There were other options. If she got close enough, she could get her secured wrists over his head and twist. Only that would mean killing him, and she really didn't want to hurt him, just get away from him. And there was the matter of his saving her life, if indeed he had. He had been right. After a while, she found a way to shovel food into her mouth with a fork, though quite a bit of it landed in her lap. The food tasted heavenly. When I was younger, I would have given everything I owned to be able to do this. Jimmy sounded wistful, and Eve was tempted to ask if he meant having dinner with a woman shackled to her fork and throwing food around the room. She didn't reply. Still, better late than never. Jimmy, can you tell me who threatened me? Who you saved me from? Jimmy carefully laid down his fork and said, The same people who killed Anne and Jenny. And who are they? They don't have names. They are just employees who have been sent to do a job. Eve didn't want to push it, but it seemed Jimmy knew more than everyone else put together. And thank you for helping me. Would I be dead now if you hadn't intervened? Undoubtedly. She noticed that he almost beamed with pleasure when she offered her thanks. I wish you'd been around for the others. He gave her an odd look. I wasn't interested in them. In fact, I didn't know that something was going on until I heard that Anne died. Do you know why they were killed, Jimmy? She asked tentatively. He stared down at his plate. Clearly, he knew exactly why. I need to know. Really, I do. It's best that you don't. His voice was soft. For your own safety. What about Rennie and Lou and Wendy? I have to talk to them, tell them about the danger they are in. You could help them too, Jimmy. He started to shift around uncomfortably. Can we talk about something else? This is ruining the meal. Eve backed off. Of course. What's your dog's name? Skipper. Jimmy immediately cheered up. He's a four-year-old German Shepherd lab cross. They call them German Shepherdors. With expensive bedding. She must keep the conversation light. That's true. But there's a lot of nice things that I salvage from my family home. He poured her some more Perrier water. I'm truly sorry about the restraints, Eve. But I know you. You would escape. You would go after those people and they would kill you. You were inches away from a syringe full of a deadly drug, you know. I can't lose you again. The last five words struck more terror into her than the threat of being murdered by a faceless assailant. 
She fought her rising panic. I seemed to remember someone else. Someone lying on the path. He was just a decoy. He had been knocked unconscious. The idea was that you would go to help him, and then it would be curtains for Eve Anderson. The memory surfaced. The young detective. His car was still parked at the bottom of the drive. Oh, no. It was Darren Smith. Jimmy shrugged. That poor young man, he was hurt because of me. They don't care. He happened to be there, and turned out to be useful to them. Eve decided that Jimmy didn't care much either about Darren or her dearest friends, but he did care about her, and in a very unhealthy way. She was beginning to change her mind about hurting him, but he was a precious commodity. Jimmy was the only person that knew who was behind the murders, so she would have to find another way to escape. Where do you live, Jimmy? She asked. Here and there, I told you. You told me where you slept, but not where your home is. The place where Skipper looks after your things. Would you like pudding? She needed all the energy she could get. If Jimmy disappeared again, she would be hungry again by tomorrow night. Thank you. That would be lovely. Jimmy served her a delicious-looking panna cotta and said, You really must wonder about me. I certainly do. You're an enigma, that's true. Not many rough sleepers have bank accounts, cars and dinner jackets. I have money, Eve. A lot of money. But I don't have a life. The fire put paid to that. Well, the fire was part of it. There were other things that ruined my life. He stopped talking. Eve realised that her love for Frank had damaged him too, and she had never known. I'm sorry, Jimmy. Really, I am. Well, let's hope things change from now on, shall we? He lifted his glass and toasted her. Sorry, the toast isn't quite possible when you're tied up, but cheers anyway. He looked crestfallen. This is difficult for me too, you know. What if I promise not to run? I wouldn't believe you. How sensible. Well, you've certainly got all your marbles, Jimmy. She gave a knowing chuckle. Oh no, that's where you're wrong, Eve. The doctors have assured me that's not the case at all. He smiled sweetly. They used a lot of long words. But apparently I'm clinically insane. Chapter 23 Cameron Walker was sitting up in bed, leaning back against the padded headboard, one hand resting lightly on Kay's shoulder, deep in thought. He had only met Eve once, but he liked her. Cam liked strong, independent women. He never found them threatening or intimidating. He admired people who tackled the world head-on, he glanced down at his sleeping wife. Kay was a beautiful example of strength, and so, in a very different way, was Nikki Galena. And Eve Anderson was the epitome of the fearless female. He sucked in air. He silently prayed that wherever she was right now, her strength would not fail her, if she were alive at all. Just before he left the station that night, two more people had come forward with unusual sightings in Beach Lacey at around the time that Eve disappeared. One man had seen a car that he didn't recognise parked off the road and partially concealed from view on the wooded edge of a field not far from Monk's Lantern. The other had seen a vagrant, an older bearded man in dirty clothing, walking towards the old chapel. The witness was not certain about the exact time, but it was definitely around the right time. He stroked his wife's hair and stared into the shadows. Dressing up as a dropout was a great way to move around unheeded. Very few people wanted to talk to them, and they mostly passed completely unnoticed. If the man really was a vagrant, he would have no connection to the empty car. If he were just pretending to be a tramp, he could have driven to Beach Lacey, concealed his vehicle, and proceeded on foot. Proceeded to abduct Eve Anderson. Cameron rubbed his chin and told himself to concentrate. He closed his eyes and tried to visualise the chain of events, using the information from forensics along with this new addition to the equation. After a while, he had something approaching a scenario. To make it a real possibility, he needed to know how long the strange car had been parked close to the field. Cam went over it again. Stranger, dressed as vagrant, arrives in Beach Lacey by car, leaves it and goes to Monk's Lantern with the intention of either talking to or abducting Eve. As he waits for her to come out, concealed in the shrubbery, another man arrives and also waits for her. Young Darren Smith leaves the chapel, and the second man attacks, fells him, and leaves him lying on the ground. Eve comes out of the house, locks up, and then sees Darren. She runs to his aid, and the second man jumps her with a syringe of some fatal poison. Now Vagrant leaps on him, and knocks a needle from his hand. He sticks Eve with a knockout drop of his own, 
and then the fight begins. Man number one finally overpowers man number two for long enough to bundle Eve into her car and drive away. Man number two recovers and flees the scene. Later our vagrant returns on foot and retrieves his own car. Cameron exhaled. It was a bit of a flight of fancy, but it fitted in with what they already knew from the forensics at the site of Darren's attack. First thing in the morning, he would find out about that car. If it had been there for some time, then he had a plausible chain of events, which gave rise to another interesting thought. If this person took Eve somewhere, left her and walked back to his car, it meant that she was being held close by. With a contented sigh, Cameron slid down into the bed, turned on his side and put his arm around Kay. Solved another one, she mumbled in her sleep. Not solved, but hopefully a big step closer. Sweet dreams, sweetheart. And you, honey. He closed his eyes, knowing that his own dreams would be far from sweet. Having run out of guest bedrooms, Wendy made up a bed on her couch for Vinny. His feet hung quite a long way over the end, but he had no intention of sleeping. These three women were in grave danger, and he was not going to have them die on his watch. They had finally hatched a sketchy plan. Their intention was to find out what Anne Castledine had discovered while she was working for the Arthur Rawlings family. Now Wendy and Vinnie had to convince Nicky Galena to agree. Vinny was not sure Nicky would go for it, but it was worth a try. Wendy and Lou wanted to look at the book collection Anne had been working on. Eve had already given them the coded message she had found at Monk's Lantern, so they had somewhere to start. It consisted of a series of dates, with a single number beside each one. It wasn't much, but it was all they had, and in Renée's words they would discover bugger all hidden away, just sitting on their fat bums all day. They needed a convincing way into the Air Commodore's home, and with police permission that might just be possible. Nicky could send them in as a team of experts, working officially with the police, looking for something in the book collection that might indicate why Anne and Jenny had died. Nicky had already suggested that the police get some of their own people in there, so why not let Wendy and Lou do the job? It was risky, especially if the family were involved in some way, but they had to start somewhere. Vinny lay back on the sofa and wondered what on earth was going on. To kill two women and attempt to murder an innocent bookshop owner, it had to be something way serious. Above all, he wondered who was behind it, pulling the strings. In the special forces, they had been given some pretty scary ask-no-questions jobs to carry out, and he got the feeling that this was a civilian version of the same. So it had to be either a matter of the defence of the realm, or a cover-up. He gazed up at the ceiling. Ten to one, it's a cover-up, he whispered to himself. Either someone's blundered, or someone has been very naughty indeed, and the security services have been sent in with a giant broom to sweep the whole thing under the carpet. Having sorted that out in his mind, Minnie closed his eyes to catnap. It was the kind of semi-sleep that he was used to as an army special operative, so shallow that a leaf falling from a tree at the bottom of the garden would wake him. Vinny was taking his job as bodyguard very seriously indeed. After Joseph had double-checked the security cameras at Cloud Cottage Farm, he and Nicky could finally relax for a while, or pretend to. They were both horribly aware of the approach of midnight. If Aspen had indeed vanished... How would Mad Tom take the news? Would he graciously retire to regroup? Or was he a mad-as-hell bad loser who was about to run amok? Joseph had a niggling suspicion it would be the latter. They sat in the lounge drinking cocoa. Neither of them wanted to go to bed, but Nicky was looking so tired and worried that Joseph suggested she give in and get some rest. He would wait up in case anything happened. If only we had some news of Mum. I can take anything else in my stride, but this awful not knowing is eating me up. Joseph put his arm around her. I know, but at least we know that whoever took her didn't mean to kill her, don't we? He only used the sedative, and it looks as if he knocked seven bells out of the guy with the lethal drug, so they can't be on the same side. We assume that's the case, said Nicky, not moving away from his embrace. But why did he take her in the first place? What on earth does he have in mind? I suggest you don't go there, Nicky. It's all supposition. We can't guess at his motives. We need hard facts. He smiled at her. One thing I do know, if there is the smallest chance to get a message to you, or to escape, Eve will find it. Hmm. Joseph heard her breathing change. Nicky was asleep. He held her for a while, then eased his arm out from behind her, and gently let her lie back on the sofa. 
He covered her with his duvet and turned the lights down. Then he sat in an armchair and watched her sleep. He thought about Mad Tom. From what Mickey had said, the group of thieves that Uniform would shortly give a dawn awakening to were just some band of outliers. There was a very good chance that the raid would send them all packing and the thieves' guild would collapse. So would Tom be pleased about this? If he hated thieves and was waging war on them, seeing them in disarray might be the best thing ever. Or would he be angry that the police had got there first? He might well be very upset indeed. Joseph went and fetched a blanket and returned to his chair. He didn't want to leave Nicky, and he was comfortable here. He wished he had phoned Tamsin, but she would understand. Joseph's thoughts turned to his daughter. She had changed beyond belief since marrying Niall Farrow. She supported him all the way, and had put so much work into prepping him for his sergeant's exam that he should fly through. Joseph smiled. Never in his wildest dreams had Joseph imagined that his daughter would marry a police officer. On his next day off, he was going to help them with some decorating, and he was looking forward to spending time with the two kids. He let out a contented sigh. After years of animosity and bitterness between him and Tamsin, peace had broken out, and he reveled in it. Then he thought of Eve Anderson, and wondered how she was. If she hadn't contacted Nicky, it meant that she couldn't, and Joseph was afraid to even think why that might be. Suddenly he was filled with hate for Mad Tom. Why had he appeared now and taken Nicky away from her search for Eve? Joseph sat in the dark and made a promise. He would hunt down Mad Tom. He would finish this damn game forever. Just after six in the morning, the phone rang. Nicky woke with a start and for a moment wondered where she was. She could hear Joseph in the kitchen taking the call. She sat up and stretched. She had slept for almost six and a half hours. Joseph came in with a plate of buttered toast and a mug of tea. What news? she asked. He looked grave. I'm afraid you need to get that down you. We are wanted on the Carver estate. She took the plate and stared at him. Mad Tom? Most likely. Uniform hit four addresses at dawn. At the fourth, the thief they were hoping to have a chat with wasn't talking. He couldn't. He'd been beaten to death. Nicky groaned. I really hoped that wouldn't be the case. Me too. Now eat up. It could be a long day. Chapter 24 Nicky and Joseph were locking their car when Mickey materialised beside them. Good news travels fast, but bad news travels faster, so they say. Joseph gave Mickey's shoulder a friendly squeeze. Nothing goes on in this estate without a Leonard hearing about it. His face fell. But it seems that we might have signed that poor guy's death warrant. Nicky shook her head. It's nothing to do with you, or the names on that list. This man was just the next in line. Did you know him, Mickey? asked Joseph. Not really. His family steered clear of the Leonards. They were small-time petty thieves, a lot of them. I saw Ryan around sometimes. He wasn't really into the whole thieving thing. I reckon he wanted out. Well, he got his wish, poor guy. Nicky pulled a face. So, why are you here? Because this time, your killer slipped up. Mickey's voice was low. Someone saw him. Nicky's eyes flashed. Really? Look, I know you've got business to sort out in there. He jabbed a thumb at the cookhouse. But when you were through, ring me. And we'll meet, okay. And I'll bring you your witness. Not to the station, I'll never agree to that. But we'll meet somewhere quiet. Where? Nicky asked. Mickey thought for a moment. The seat's by the war memorial. Nicky nodded. Wait for our call. And thank you, Mickey. You're a good lad. Less of the lad, if you don't mind. He walked away, grinning. See you later. Has Tom really made a mistake this time? Joseph was half talking to himself. Let's pray that's the case. They watched Mickey go, then checked in with the officer at the door. They pulled on paper suits, masks and shoe covers and stepped inside. That coppery metallic smell of blood was something Nicky had never got used to. A uniformed inspector beckoned them forward. He's in there. I was overseeing the dawn raid, but luckily we copped the pong as soon as we entered, so the scene is relatively uncontaminated. Sokos are already hard at it. Nicky saw two figures in protective suits taking photographs and marking the floor. She stepped forward, with Joseph at her side. Oh, shit. Nicky had seen more crime scenes than she cared to remember, but something about this small, untidy room struck a hollow chord. It was a kind of shock. Beside her, Joseph tensed up. He felt it, too. The body on the floor looked twisted and distorted, like some discarded ragdoll. The boy was unrecognisable. 
If someone had told her he had been mauled by a lion, she would have believed them. How can a man be capable of this much rage? It's almost too much to comprehend. Joseph touched her arm. The echoes of the murderer's fury seemed to shimmer there still, causing the shabby room to tilt slightly. One of the Sokos looked up. It's even worse when you consider that this was done with bare hands and heavy boots. Nor weapon! The crime scene officer shook her head. I could be wrong, but the prof will confirm it, I'm sure. Nicky backed away. We'll let you get on. There is nothing we can do here. Out in the hall, she gulped in a breath. Where were the rest of the family? She asked the inspector. Was the kid alone in the house? The policeman nodded. The rest of the family had gone down south to a funeral. They're due back later today. They have been notified. Are we sure he is Ryan Cook? Hard to tell, but yes. His father told us that he was the only one in the house, and there are credit cards in his wallet that confirm it's him. He made a huffing noise. I really wouldn't want to have to ID this one, would you? There was no answer to that. He added, The killer would have been in one hell of a state after that. His clothing would have been covered in blood. And his DNA should be all over Ryan's body, said Joseph. Skin particles, blood, sweat. Nicky looked at Joseph. We need to act quickly. You ring Mickey. I'll contact Kat and Ben and Dave and get them to arrange with uniform for some very swift visits to those people on our list, the victims of old botched cases. It would never be that easy, but if one of them answers the door looking like he works in an abattoir, we've got him. Joseph made the call. Mickey's on his way to the memorial. Right, let's go. They arrived to find Mickey sitting with a kid of around nine or ten. Nicky's heart sank. Not a reliable witness. Then she remembered that the boy was from the Cabra. Most of the kids there were sharp as stilettos. This is Dion. He wouldn't normally talk to you guys, but Uncle Raymond has kind of insisted that he does. Mickey looked long and hard at the tousle-haired youth. So we'll tell you everything he saw. But that will be that. No formal interviews, no statements. If it helps, good. If it doesn't, no harm done. Our little Mickey has grown up, Nicky thought. Okay, Mickey, we understand. Talk to us, Dion. Mickey gave the skinny lad a gentle shove. Dion took a deep breath and reluctantly began. One of the cook boys stole my granddad's wallet. I knew the money would be long gone, but my granny gave him that wallet, and it has his favourite picture of her in it. He sniffed and wiped his face with his sleeve. I knew the family was away, and with only Ryan in the house, I reckoned I could get in and swipe it back. So you broke in? Asked Joseph. Didn't get the chance. He sniffed again. There's this little window round the back. The catch is broken and the cook boys use it all the time. So I thought that's how I'd get in. Anyway, I heard voices. And it wasn't the telly. Someone was really angry and shouting, so I hopped it back to the road and waited in the alley opposite the front door. How long were you there? Asked Nicky, desperately wanting to give the boy a tissue. About ten minutes, I suppose. Then this man comes out and one of them sensor lights came on. He had blood all over him. Dion shivered. He had probably seen a lot in his short life on the Cabra, but this had shocked him. It's okay, Dion. Can you describe him for us? Joseph asked gently. Tall, about your height. He had dark hair, a bit long and straggly, and he was wearing some kind of all-in-one suit, like what workmen wear. A boiler suit? He shrugged. If you say so. Colour? Dark. Couldn't tell the actual colour. He paused. Oh, and he had them boots with the steel toe caps. I recognise them because my brother's got a pair. They've got this yellow flash round the top and I saw it when he ran away. Nicky saw again the broken body of Ryan Cook. Steel toe caps. Which way did he go, Dion? Towards the town. I might have imagined it, but I think I heard a car start up a few moments later. He stared at the ground. Then I legged it. Mickey nudged Dion. Sure them. Dion stared back belligerently. They'll take it off me. Sure them. Nicky glanced at Joseph. Finally, the boy pulled a smartphone from his pocket. It's rubbish anyway, but I chanced a picture. For insurance, just in case he'd notice me. Joseph took the phone and stared at the image. Then he passed it to Nicky. It wasn't clear, but it was better than a hell of a lot of the CCTV footage she'd seen. Brilliant. She handed it back to Joseph. Can you send this through to the station? Joseph took Dion's phone, sent the picture to his, and then erased his number from Dion's call log. He handed back the smartphone. Mickey said, See? What did I tell you? Can I go? My dad'll kill me if he is about this. Then you can tell him you were working for Raymond Leonard, can't you? Dion's face shone, and he grinned. 
but can I go? You'll get no more, said Mickey with a smile. Thanks, Dion. Of course you can go. Nicky passed him something from her pocket. You take care. Mickey raised an eyebrow. It was a tissue, she said defensively. Wrapped around a fiver? Must have got caught up in my pocket. Right. Joseph was staring at the photograph. Do you know this man, Mickey? No, Joe. Never seen him before. He's not from round here, and he's taken one hell of a risk even setting foot on the Carver estate. The Leonards don't take kindly to outsiders upsetting things and bringing the filth, sorry, the police, into our patch. Mickey straightened up. I have to go and get ready for work. I just hope that helps. He pointed to Joseph's phone. We owe you one, Mickey. Whatever. We'll never be quits after what you guys did for me. Now, I've really got to go. Bye. Watching him go, Nicky felt a pang of sadness. She had seen more of Mickey than she had of her own daughter. She had seen him grow up and move on. Her darling Hannah would never grow up. Joseph seemed to read her thoughts. She felt his hand on her shoulder and heard him say, Come on, Nicky. It's time to get back. We need to get uniformed to do a house-to-house -house along here, see if anyone got a good look at the killer. Thanks to Mickey, we have another piece of the jigsaw. Back in the office, Joseph found a string of emails waiting for him. One was from Vinnie, sent at some god-awful hour of the night. It briefly outlined what the three women wanted to do and asked how he should tackle Nicky. Joseph exhaled. Then he called Vinnie. Just tell her, mate. She wants to get a small team in there anyway. I can't see why she'd say no if you have a couple of uniforms with you. Our resources are limited and your ladies probably know what to look for better than the whole of the station put together. My thoughts precisely. The plan is that Wendy and Lou go in with the police as the experts. Renee and I will stay in my car with a couple of laptops that I've set up so our searches can't be traced and try to discover something about that coded message Eve found in Jenny's house. Just ring her, Vinny. Don't say we've spoken, but I think she'll go for it. We are up to our ears in blood and gore this morning, so anything you can do regarding Eve's disappearance will be a help. No news. Nothing. And time is passing. We'll do what we can, my friend. I appreciate it. Now ring my boss, okay? We'll go. Eve had hardly slept. After Jimmy's confession, she knew that her situation was dire. She needed to get free. Her best opportunity would be after breakfast. Yesterday, Jimmy had brought her biscuits and a mug of tea quite early. Then he went out and she didn't see him for hours. If he did the same today, she would have time to work out how to escape. She had already wandered around looking for something to cut her ties with, but Jimmy had been thorough and she found nothing of use. But surely a resourceful woman like her must be able to adapt something. At least she knew where her belongings were. Her bag and her jacket were bundled up and pushed on top of a tall cupboard. Her jacket was a very distinctive turquoise, and she had seen it last night in the flickering candlelight. She couldn't reach them, but she was sure she could find something to hook them down with. Eve looked up. She heard an engine and what sounded like a dog barking. Maybe he had brought Skipper to meet her. She steeled herself for yet another gruelling conversation. He entered the room. Sleep well. He sounded in good form. Not bad, but not being able to move easily gives me cramps. Poor lamb. Let's hope we can find a way to make things more comfortable. Leave it with me. I've got you some breakfast. He placed a tray on her lap. This time there was cereal and fresh milk and a banana. She thanked him. I thought I heard a dog bark. Did you bring Skipper with you? He frowned. No. I was planning on bringing him tonight when I come back. Must have been a stray or something. Now she knew how long he would be away. Good. The roads are full of police cars. I suppose they are looking for the thief killer. Eve stiffened. As far as she knew, it was not common knowledge that the man who died a few days ago was a thief. So how on earth did Jimmy know? He's killed another one this morning. Eve thought about Nicky and Joseph. They must be frantic with worry. Two murders and a missing mother, as well as Jenny and Anne's mysterious deaths and the threat of her other friends. Where? she asked trying to negotiate her spoon to her mouth without covering herself in milk. Greenborough somewhere. It will be another lowlife like the last one. Sorry, what do you mean? He's killing thieves. Why would he do that? Because... He paused. Because he needs to. Eve tried to take this in. Jimmy, do you know who this killer is? Yes. How's the breakfast? Lovely. Bit difficult to eat, but I'm managing. Good. He walked to the door. I brought you a battery radio, for company while I'm gone. I'll get it from the car. 
Eve thought fast. Did he really know the killer? Or was it fantasy? He'd admitted he was unstable. Was this just his imagination? He returned and placed the radio close to her bed. You were joking, weren't you? Saying that you know the man that's killing people. Oh, no. I probably know him better than anyone. We have things in common. He's a friend of yours. Jimmy considered the question carefully, then said, No, I don't have friends. We met in therapy. He flashed her a wide smile. I must be off. I hate to leave you, but I'll be back later. I promise. And then he was gone. Eve eased herself off the bed. There was no time to lose. Somehow she had to get in touch with Nicky and tell her what she knew. She stood up and straightened her aching back. Right, Eve Anderson. Time to call upon some of those old, half-forgotten tricks. Your life might depend on them. Information was coming at Nicky from all sides. The Igil Mercer had offered to help and had found a lot about Simon Arthur Rowlings and his family. Nicky was particularly interested in what had been described as a dark cloud hanging over his career. It doesn't seem to be anything criminal or underhanded, said Jill. More a falling out, some disagreement with another high-ranking official in his department. Apart from that, the man was as clean as a whistle. In fact, his earlier military service is smothered in gongs and decorations. He must have looked like a Christmas tree on formal dress occasions. Nicky smiled at the thought. And yet he seemed to harbour a secret that people have been killed for. Her smile faded. I just don't get it. Jill shrugged. Maybe it had nothing to do with his work. Maybe it's more personal. What about the family? Serena, the wife, is from an old county family. There's two sons and a daughter. The sons are married with children of their own. The daughter, Fiona, is still at home. They've all got their own businesses and are pretty loaded. Jill ran a hand through her hair. Frankly, I can't find anything even vaguely dodgy about any of them. Then I wonder if it does have something to do with that famous collection of rare books. Though I can't imagine how some musty old books full of pictures of flowers could generate enough passion for murder. Me neither, so I thought I'd try to look deeper into this apparent falling out with the colleague. It's hard to know who to approach with something like this. They are so tight-lipped. I'd appreciate it, Jill. I'm up to my neck with bloody mad Tom. No problem. Would you like me to send a couple of my team to the house to check the family out first hand? If you could just stick with the background stuff... I've already arranged for Nile and Yvonne to accompany a couple of book people to go in and look at the collection. Rutland police know about it. Nicky particularly hated lying to Jill, but the fewer people who knew who those book people were, the better. Jill nodded. Fine, but if you need another couple of bodies, just give me a shout, OK? Nicky thanked her and saw Kat waving at her from her desk. We got hold of two out of the four suspects for Mad Tom, Mum. They have solid alibis for the time of the killing and neither look anything like the man seen leaving the house. So who did you see? Levi Sellers and Thomas Newstead, Gov. Sellers was at A&E, having cut his hand quite badly. We've confirmed that with casualty, and he was on the CCTV in the waiting area for a couple of hours, so he's out. And Newstead? Nicky rather wanted Thomas Newstead to be Mad Tom. Then at least they would have got his first name right. He was passed out drunk at a neighbour's house. The neighbour said he'd been there for hours and it had taken two of them to get him home and into bed. Plus he's really short, and he shaves his head. Nothing like the photograph of the killer. So we are left with Andrew Falcon and Dieter Haft. No answer from either address, but we found a photograph of Falcon on Google, and he is tall and dark-haired. Ben joined them. Sadly, we haven't any pictures of Haft, and so far we haven't found anyone who knows him to give us a description. We'll keep trying on that. We need to speak to both of these men urgently. Nicky knew it was one of them. It had to be. Find them. I want them both in here for questioning. Cat and Ben jumped up. Right, Gov, we're on it. We'll keep in touch. Nicky saw Joseph coming towards her with a pile of papers in his arms. Phew, I'm going into overload here. Don't tell me all that is for me. Joseph dumped the paper on her desk. No, it's okay. This is just a load of research I've been doing into online games. I think I found the one he plays. That could help us, especially if we get hold of his computer. She leaned forward. What's it called? Thebes Domain. It's very much what Cameron and Kay were describing. I had hoped it would be one where you sign up and pay to join, but it's free. Still, as you say, it might help. Ah, before I forget, Vinny rang me. Nicky took Joseph aside. God knows if I've done the right thing here, but I've okayed him to take the women back to Rutland. I've asked the Arthur Rowlings family if some book experts can take a look at the collection. Rutland local police are fine with it, and Nile and Yvonne are meeting them there. Good. Joseph seemed quite unconcerned about what she had done. Nicky frowned. He was too unconcerned. You knew? He grinned. Actually, I think it's the best thing to do. 
and it keeps those women out of mischief. Plus, they really do know what they are looking for, and we don't. I'm the last one to know anything around here, Nicky muttered, secretly glad he agreed with her. Nicky's mobile rang. Come, how is young Darren? Any news? They're hoping to bring him round this afternoon if his vital signs are okay. We're hanging on by our eyelashes. It's a trying time, all right. We're crossing everything for him. Thanks, Nicky. Now I've had a theory, and I've got every available man following it up. Nicky sat down and listened to him tell her about his late-night epiphany. A vagrant? That doesn't sound like a covert mission, does it? Far from it. But I'm not even trying to fathom out the whys and wherefores. I'm sticking purely to logistics. We haven't found anyone connected to the parked car. No one in the village had a visitor that day. The farmer didn't have anyone working that field. There were no tourists, because we don't get tourists here, so it had to belong to whoever went to Monk's Lantern, and the only person seen in the vicinity at that time, who was not known to us, was the vagrant, if he was a vagrant. Nicky digested the new information. And you think he took Mum in a car, then came back for his? I'm still waiting for my guys to tell me how long the car was parked there, and then I can calculate how far afield we need to be checking for likely places to hide and abduct tea. We've already started close by. Barns, outhouses, empty houses, and so on. You're assuming he is acting alone, aren't you? It could be a lot further if he has an accomplice, someone to drive him back to Beach Lacey. True, but my gut instinct tells me this man is a loner. He certainly didn't have any help in that fight. Actually, I agree. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Well, I'll keep you up to speed, and you steer clear of Mad Tom. I hear he's struck again. Ah, oh, Cam, he's just so angry. Even I was taken aback at the violence of that last murder. You'll get him, Nicky. I know you will. I have to, Cam. I have to stop him somehow. We'll talk again later. Good hunting. You too. Chapter 25 Eve made her way to the nearest window and checked it carefully. She had decided to try and get outside. There was nothing inside the cabin that would help her get free from her bonds, but outside would be a different matter. There were two derelict cabins, which might contain something she could use. She just had to get herself out of this prison. She had heard him unlocking the door, and knew it was also padlocked. It would be wasting precious time to even try to get out that way, but the windows might just prove a route. Of course, it would be easy to break the glass, and then somehow ease herself through the hole, but that was not what Eve had in mind. The thing was, she had no intention of escaping, at least not yet. Jimmy knew things. She had to get them out of him, and she knew that would not happen in a police station. Then she had to find a way of getting the information to Nicky without his knowing. Painfully, she moved from window to window. The third one seemed the best prospect. For one thing, it was at the back of the cabin, and at some point in its life it had already been forced. It had no locks per se, just old-fashioned catches. Jimmy had nailed them shut, but had not been very thorough. She moved the faded drapes away and started to work on the window. The nylon restraints dug into her flesh, but she concentrated on what she had to do. The window pushed open from the bottom, and was secured by a metal strut with holes in it that held it open. Bad weather and no upkeep had caused it to warp. Earlier, Eve had found some firewood stacked beside a small log burner, the only means of heating the cabin. She selected a solid piece of chunky hardwood. Now she had propped open the bottom catch and was methodically pounding on the bowed bottom right-hand corner. As soon as that was free, she moved to the other side. It took around fifteen minutes to free the wood from the nails. She pushed the window open. Stage one, complete, she thought, and no time to hang around. There was only one way to accomplish stage two, and Eve knew that it would hurt. But at least it wasn't too far from the ground. Holding her tethered arms in front of her, she leaned through the open window and tipped herself forward, praying that she didn't break an arm. Her weight carried her out of the window, and somehow she managed to propel herself forward into a roll, not easy with ankle restraints. Then she was sitting on the ground, and in one piece. Stage two complete, she whispered, and hurriedly collected the bent and discarded nails. Thank God. She eased herself to her feet and hobbled along to the next cabin. This one was little more than a hovel, and to her delight, Eve saw that the ground outside it was littered with broken glass. She selected a big shard, and then sat down on the rotting veranda and tried to work out what to do with it. The urge to just get away was almost overpowering, but other people's lives were at stake. She needed to get Jimmy Fraser to open up to her. She'd never live with herself if someone else died because she had run away. She stared at the jagged glass. This was the only thing she hadn't worked out. 
If she cut through the ties, Jimmy would notice, and there was no way to retie the nylon straps. But she couldn't get to her car and get hold of her precious mobile phone while she was still tied up. Her only hope was to find some more of these ties. She looked across at the cabin that was heavily padlocked. If he kept tools or anything like that, they would be in there. Well, if it went totally wrong, she'd just have to run for it. Eve picked up an old discarded piece of material, wrapped it around one end of the shard of glass, and placed it firmly between her feet. She gripped them tightly together, leaned forward and began to move her wrist ties backwards and forwards, sawing at her ties. And then at last her hands were free, and not even a drop of blood spilt. She exhaled and felt the hot tears welling up. Concentrate, she told herself. Silly cow, you are far from being home and dry. Get on with the job. She flexed her stiff hands and wrists and rubbed them hard to get the circulation moving. When they felt almost normal again, she cut just one side of her ankle ties and left the other intact. This way, she could walk freely, but secure it again later. She hid the glass shard under the veranda and stood up. It felt weird to walk after being restricted for so long. She stumbled across to where he had camouflaged her car. In light of what had happened to Anne and Jenny, she had thought to make a few provisions, just in case something happened to her as well. Her car was not new. Eve liked her engines, growly and traditional. Careful not to disturb anything, she lifted the cover and reached for the bonnet catch. She pushed back the heavy cover and let out a long, relieved sigh. It was still there. Jimmy had not thought to check the car's engine. She removed the small Tupperware container, taped to the inside of the engine housing, and closed the bonnet with a dull clunk. Eve replaced the cover and checked for any signs of interference. She hurried round to the back of her cabin and sat on the ground. She opened her precious box and removed the mobile. She wasn't expecting him back until the evening, but she couldn't be certain. She needed to hurry. With shaking hands, she turned it on and dialed Nicky's number. They had been expecting the family to object, but on their arrival in Rutland, Yvonne Nile and the two experts were politely shown in and offered tea. Fiona Arthur Rowlings, the Air Commodore's daughter, was the perfect hostess, and Wendy and Lou seemed perfectly at ease. Nile, however, felt like a fish out of water. He wasn't used to grandeur, and there was plenty of that here. Just the long tree-line drive had given him the heebie-jeebies. Now he was trying to balance a fine bone china cup and saucer under the sightless gaze of dozens of lace-ruffed Arthur Rowling's family ancestors. My mother will be down to see you later, but she has taken my father's death very badly. Fiona pushed a lock of long blonde hair away from her face. I'll help you as much as I can, although I'm not quite sure what this is all about. Did you know Anne Castledine, Miss Arthur Rawlings? asked Yvonne. Fiona, please. Of course. Anne spent quite some time with us. I liked her enormously. Awfully gutsy. She gave a rather robust laugh. Jumped out of planes, imagine, at her age. I hope I feel so inclined in my later years. The laughter faded. I am truly sorry to hear of her death. We were told it was a heart attack. I'm afraid not, Miss, uh, uh, Fiona. Yvonne carefully placed her cup and saucer on a coaster. She died under suspicious circumstances. We suspect murder. My God. Fiona's finely chiselled jaw dropped. Murder. At first, her death appeared to be caused by a heart attack while driving. Niall said somberly. We now believe that it was not due to natural causes. Please, do not tell my mother. Fiona stood up and began to pace. She is very frail, and she was extremely fond of Anne. This news could be the death of her, too. We will be discreet, of course. I'm afraid we need to see the work Anne Castledown was doing for you. Fiona looked perplexed. Yes, I'll show you, of course, but what on earth could my father's book collection have to do with Anne being... being murdered? Probably nothing at all, miss. Niall said. Any suspicious death needs to be investigated thoroughly, and she was in your employ at the time, so... He smiled at her, in what he hoped was a reassuring way. Naturally, we have to try to piece together exactly what she was doing in the days and weeks prior to her death. Oh, I see. Fiona nibbled on her bottom lip. But as I said, please don't frighten my mother. Let me tell her after you've gone. Yvonne nodded. All right, but it could take some time, I'm afraid. Perhaps we can make a start. Fiona stood up. Come with me. They filed after Fiona through the beautiful old property until they reached the door to the Air Commodore's library. Niall had to stifle his exclamation of surprise when he saw what was inside. There was a long table down the centre of the room, with chairs around it. There was a massive bay window with heavy drapes on either side, and an ornate carved fireplace with an open fire. 
but what took Niall's breath away was the sheer amount of books, floor-to-ceiling shelves on every available wall, all full. And was cataloguing all this? Wendy's voice had shot up an octave. Oh, no. My grandfather started collecting as a young man, and my father took over from him, but Daddy liked a lot of different genres, not just the botanists, although they were his passion. Fiona gazed around rather sadly. Anne was concentrating on the botanical studies collection. That is this section here. The single wall that Fiona pointed to must have held at least five hundred books. Everything she did is in that file on the table. She stepped back towards the door. I'll leave you to get on. I'll send some drinks along later, and if you need anything, I'll be in the drawing room. After she had gone, Niall let out a low, long whistle. I wish Tam could see this. You could fit a whole cottage into this room. Yvonne looked at the rows of books. Where the hell do we start? And what on earth are we looking for, anyway? Wendy sat down at the table and pulled the thick file towards her. A very good point, officer. Right now, I have no bloody idea. Lou sat beside her. But we'll know when we find it. She took several sheets of A4 paper from her bag. This is what we have. The numbers found at Jenny Foxwell's home. She gave them each a photocopy. It appears to be dates, followed by a single number. It means nothing right now, but hopefully something will present itself. I suggest we start with Anne's work, said Wendy. See what she was doing and how she was doing it. She looked up at Niall and grinned. I think you might find this part a bit tedious, so why don't you take advantage of the time and go grill the family? Niall gave her a relieved smile. I'll do that. See what I can discover about that mysterious shadow hanging over his work. Tread carefully, Yvonne advised. We need to keep the family on our side. At least until we're through here. Vonnie, you know me. I'm the height of discretion. Yvonne raised an eyebrow. Er, uh, I do seem to recall a size eleven boot landing us right in the doo-doo on occasion. Fear not. I shall be charm itself. With a smart salute to his crewmate, Niall went in search of Fiona. Outside, parked just off the road, Vinny and René were conducting a search of their own. Using Vinny's secure laptops, they were trying to make sense of the same sequence of numbers. They're clearly dates, Vinny observed. But what about the single numbers? Renée shook her head. That's not clear. Because she was working on books, we thought maybe chapter numbers or plate numbers. So you would need to isolate one book. I'm thinking there are going to be quite a few to sift through in that library. Frankly, unless we get a lucky break, this could take months. René looked downcast. Well, maybe we should stick to looking up these dates. They are all within a two-year window, from the 2nd of January 2006 to the 14th of August 2007. OK, let's kick off with the first one. Vinnie nodded. I've signed us up for a newspaper archive site so we can access their back copies. We'll see what happened in the news on those specific days, then cross-check them for connections. René heaved in a breath. I just wish we knew what kind of thing we were looking for. Vinny leaned back and stared at his screen. Nicky told us it seemed like something personal, not connected to national security or anything like that. The Air Commodore was pretty well off, wasn't he? I mean, look at his house. It's almost a mansion. Maybe he got involved in one of those social scandals that you hear about. And what about this bad feeling between him and another toff in his department? Maybe they are dates of assignations. The woman involved could have been his colleague's wife. René raised her eyebrows. Could be, but surely something like that doesn't warrant killing people off a decade later. Vinny sighed. No, you're right. Back to the drawing board. Let's hit these numbers, shall we? Chapter 26 Nicky, got a minute somewhere quiet? I've just the place. Galena's Grotto is once again available. Perfect. Diagil Mercer followed her towards the stairs. Is the men's room clock still there? Funny that. All Kat's acquisitions are still in situ, and remarkably dust-free. So it was Kat who was the magpie? Jill laughed. Has she admitted it? No way. And she has no idea that I know that she and Ben take their breaks down here. Sweet. True love. I believe that's exactly what it is. Nicky undid the door. Grab a pew and tell me what's on your mind. Jill pulled out a chair and sat down. I've found someone who is prepared to talk about your air commodore and his feud. This woman, Alice Steele, was a secretary. She was always very supportive of air commodore Arthur Rawlings. She left at the same time as he did, so I tracked her down and had a very informative talk over the phone. Nicky sat back and listened. She couldn't name names, 
but she said that the man Arthur Rawlings fell out with was very high up the ladder and is now a prominent public figure. Arthur Rawlings felt obliged to resign, but his secretary said that he was in no way in the wrong. He believed the other man had committed some sort of serious indiscretion and confronted him about it. It was hotly denied, and afterwards Arthur Rowling became something of a pariah within his department. Jill frowned. She's pretty sure that Arthur Rowlings was still trying to prove the man's guilt, well after he lost his job. Nicky bit her lip. If this prominent figure knew that, maybe he sent in the heavy mob. That's what I'm thinking. Some people will stop at nothing to protect their reputation. You would think Arthur Rowlings would have told people in his office. Nicky mused. Alice said they closed ranks. Arthur Rawlings was told to keep his thoughts to himself or leave. He chose to leave. Why didn't he go public if he was so certain? asked Nicky. Alice said he believed his family would be threatened. He finished up almost a recluse, eaten up with resentment, and bitter right up to his death. Do you think your Alice might be persuaded to give us a name of that prominent figure? If we could find something damning without it leading back to her, I'd say she might. Nicky stretched. Thanks, Jill. That's a real step towards finding a motive for these deaths. If Anne Castledine has found something, and told Jenny Foxwell, maybe our mystery high-profile man found out, and had them quietly removed from the equation. If it wasn't for Rory, we'd still be thinking they were natural deaths. Jill stood up. Better get back. Go ahead. I'll lock up. Nicky sat thinking for a moment. Her phone rang, interrupting her reverie. Nicky, darling. Mum! Oh my God, are you all right? Nicky's heart thundered in her chest. I've been so worried. Listen, Nicky, I don't have long. I want you to listen carefully to what I have to tell you, all right? Nicky stiffened. Was someone there with her, directing her words? Okay, Eve, I'm listening. I'm safe. Remember that. And I don't think the man who took me wants to harm me. The thing is, I have escaped from where he was holding me and got hold of a phone to tell you I'm still alive. Please tell Wendy and the others. They'll be worried too. Mum, get as far away from him as you can. It's not that simple, Nicky. This man knows who is behind Annie and Jenny's deaths. And not only that, he says he knows who your Mad Tom is. I don't have a name for you yet, but I can tell you that Mad Tom has spent time in therapy for a mental condition. What? Nicky was beside herself. No matter, just get to safety. Where are you? I'll get a team organised. I'll come and get you. I don't know where I am, and that's the truth. But listen, please just trust me. This man is crucial but he will not talk to you, whereas he might open up to me. I'm going back to where I've been held, and I'll try to find out all I can to help you catch both your killers. No, Mum, please. It's not worth risking your life. Nicky was starting to panic. I couldn't live with myself if I just ran away and then others were hurt or died. Please, darling, don't try to check my phone because it's a pay-as-you-go with an unregistered sim, and do not look for me. If he feels threatened, then he might well hurt me. Remember... I can get away if I think it's getting too dangerous. Leave this to me. I love you, Nicky. The call ended. Nicky was left staring at the phone and whispering, And I love you too, you fool. Nicky felt as if someone had sucker punched her. On the one hand, her mother was alive, thank God. And on the other? Well, she couldn't even begin to understand what was going on. Oh, Mum. She shook her head slowly from side to side. Why do you have to be such a bloody hero? Back upstairs, Nicky ran into the CID room. I've heard from Eve. She's okay. A cheer went up. Joseph raced across to her. Where is she? What happened? Shaking her head, Nicky beckoned him towards her office. Cat hurried across to her side. Before you go, Gov, we've tried the homes of both of our suspects for Mad Tom, and neither are there yet. Dieter Haft's neighbours told us he has a caravan somewhere up the coast and often takes himself off there, and no one knows anything about Falcon. Cat, look up everything we have on those two and see if one of them has ever received therapy for a mental illness. Cat looked perplexed. Right. Nicky and Joseph went into her office, and he closed the door. Spill the beans. This is not straightforward, is it? Nicky sank down into her chair. Is it ever? She shook her head in disbelief. Mum got away from the bastard that took her, and now she's going back. What? Exactly. It seems her abductor knows who is behind Jenny and Anne's murders, and for some unknown reason also knows the identity of Mad Tom. Is this a wind-up? Joseph's face was a picture of confusion. I wish, Nicky growled. She reckons this man will tell her things that he won't tell us. She doesn't think he wants to hurt her, but he's clearly deranged because she added that if we look for her, that's when he might harm her. And no clue about where she is? None whatsoever. 
She swears she has no idea. And although theoretically that might be true, she has eyes. She'd know her surroundings. She could have described the place, but she didn't. Fear flooded through her. She's in as much danger as she was before. Maybe worse. If he realises that she's trying to get info out of him. Joseph spoke calmly. She's alive, Nicky. She was able to escape and contact you. Eve Anderson is firing on all cylinders. I think we have to trust that she knows what she's doing. That's what she said, Nicky whispered. But do you have any idea how difficult that will be? Oh, I do. Believe me. His eyes were full of compassion. Can you tell me exactly what she said? Nicky closed her eyes, and as near as she could, repeated what Eve had said. Then it would appear that the man who is holding your mum was in therapy with Mad Tom. If we can find the name of either of our suspects, Haft or Falcon, in a psychiatry therapy group, then we could check the other participants and maybe get an ID on the abductor. You're right. She doesn't want us to wade in and rescue her, but she can't stop us trying to find where she is, so we're ready if we are needed. Quite right. Should we go and help Cat? Sure. What are you waiting for? Niall sat with Fiona Arthur Rollings on a small terrace crammed with planters filled with brightly coloured flowers. He was much more at home in this more casual setting, and Fiona was more relaxed. It was clear to Niall that she had adored her father, and was devastated not just by his death, but at how he was after leaving his job at the MOD. They vilified him, Niall. It was horrible. He was a good man, brave too. He served his country right from when he was a boy, and then... She sighed. To be honest, none of us know what really happened. He refused point-blank to talk about it. I thought he would unburden himself to my elder brother, Clive, but he didn't. Do you have any idea who was involved? asked Niall. He thought he was finally getting the hang of the delicate cup and saucer. She shook her head. Whoever it was, he was someone powerful. He must have had the whole department under his thumb. She shrugged. Because of the nature of the work they did, we were kept in the dark, both about what had happened and who he was so angry with. Fiona swirled the last of her tea around in her cup. Do you think that whatever my father uncovered was the reason for Anne dying? Did she find something out? Niall puffed out his cheeks. To be honest, miss, we do suspect something along those lines. Fiona cried out. Oh, Daddy, what did you do? Why didn't you tell someone? Niall set down his cup and put his arm around her shoulder. He handed her a clean white handkerchief. Come on now, don't blame your dad. I'm sure he only kept quiet to protect you and the rest of your family. But at what cost? Fiona dabbed at her eyes. This is awful. If it helps, miss, we are here because we believe that before he died, he tried to leave some sort of message. And we think Anne Castledine, who was herself an MOD worker, chanced upon it and possibly understood what it meant. A sudden thought crossed his mind, and he frowned. Whose idea was it to catalogue the book collection? Oh, it was Daddy's. Before he died... He insisted that the botanical books were very carefully checked and listed before going to auction. He knew that none of us would want them, and he felt they belonged in another collector's library, hopefully a national one where everyone could see them. What did he stipulate exactly, if you can remember? Niall was writing in his notebook. Well, he wanted each individual book to have an annotated catalogue record, and he wanted this to include exactly when the book came into his or his father's possession, along with the full title, author, publisher, date and edition— then he wanted a description of the condition of the binding and the paper and the prints, and an opinion of its rarity and value. Phew, a lot of work. So how did you find Anne Castledine? Fiona smiled. Oh, that was Daddy. He knew her from years ago. He said that if anyone could be trusted to get the job done, it was Anne. Niall sat back. Yvonne had taught him well during their years together on the streets of Greenborough, and he knew to listen when those warning bells began to chime. Your father specifically asked for Anne Castledine to work on his books. He insisted. In fact, he contacted her just before he died. He was due to meet her personally, but a few days before she came to see him, he had his fatal heart attack. The bells grew louder. He already had a diagnosed heart condition. Fiona shook her head. No, never. It was a terrible shock to us all. Niall stood up. Excuse me, I have to make a call, but can I talk to you again later? Of course. Have I helped at all? Niall thought she looked so very sad. You certainly have, miss. And if he had lived, I think your father would have told Anne everything he knew. He paused. Don't blame him. He loved you. If he'd told you, then maybe right now it would be your murder we'd be investigating.
Nicky hung up. That was Niall. We need to get more people over to Rutland to help with the search of the book collection. She repeated to Joseph what Niall had told her. He says her daughter is being really helpful, so rather than send inexperienced officers, I'm going to ask her to allow Vinnie and Renee to join the others in the library. Now we know we aren't chasing rainbows, I think their combined efforts will be more effective. Joseph nodded. Good idea, and we can continue to hunt for Mad Tom. From what Mum said, it seems that whoever took her is a link between the two cases. And that is truly weird. He knows who is intending to kill Eve because he got to them first and put his own life in jeopardy to do so. I'm thinking that she's right. He doesn't want to hurt her. Joseph grimaced. But in that case, what does he want with her? Nicky shivered. I'm not going down that path right now. Joseph's phone rang. Mickey? Joseph talked for a few moments. When he ended the call, he turned to Nicky and said, From the horse's mouth, the plan to inundate this area with housebreakers and thieves has been abandoned, officially. Raymond has spoken to a few villains in the know, and they have confirmed that the outsiders have moved on. One less thing to worry about. Nicky looked around the busy office. It won't please Mad Tom, I'm sure. I'm guessing he did a fair bit of research on those thieves. Now we'll have to content himself with random local tour rags. Like young Ryan Cook, said Joseph. Or maybe one of the Leonard family, and then we will have a war on our hands. I hope to hell that doesn't happen. Joseph rubbed his forehead. Is there anything back from uniform regarding the house-to-house -house on the man seen running from Cook's place? Nothing more than we have already. There are a few sightings confirming that his clothing was bloodstained, but nothing more. Then we'd better get on with this psychiatric therapy lead. Joseph turned towards the door. I'll go and speak to Cat. Nicky nodded. And I'll ring this Fiona what's its rollings and clear the way for more experts to join the party at the old rectory. Nicky could feel a headache coming on. Part of her wanted to rejoice that she had actually spoken to her mother and that she was unharmed. But the policewoman in her knew how much danger her mother was putting herself in. The man who took her was unstable and his motives were highly questionable. That made him volatile and dangerous. Her phone registered a message. Could it be Eve again? Why are you not taking me seriously, dear Galena? What do I have to do to get your full attention? Shall we find out? There will be no more games, but you'll find the next one in the tombs. Nicky tried to find the number, but the call log merely registered unknown. Shit! She grabbed her printout directory and leafed through to T. Tombs! She stared at the lists, but couldn't find tombs anywhere. Damn! She jumped up and ran from the office. Joseph, we've had another bloody threat! Chapter 27 Eve knew that Jimmy could return at any moment. He had told her he would be back in the evening, but he might change his mind. She needed to work fast. She switched the mobile phone off and decided to chance taking it into the cabin with her. If she could find somewhere safe to conceal it, it would mean that she had a way to get in touch with Nicky, or call for help without needing to get outside. She emptied her Tupperware box and hid it deep in some brambles at the back of the cabin. She took the contents with her. Now she needed to find a way to refasten her wrists and ankles. That locked cabin was her best bet. As she had expected, the door was securely fastened. It seemed that the windows were the weak point, and she hoped for a second helping of luck. At the third window, Eve decided that the angels must be with her. Jimmy had not deemed it necessary to nail these closed— probably because he had no woman imprisoned in his cabin and they were simply secured by a simple window catch. Eve opened the slim bladed knife that was one of her emergency items and slid the catch up in seconds. The window itself stuck a bit, but it was soon freed and Eve peered inside. It was a storeroom, just as she had thought, full of stuff. Some stacked, some covered, some heaped and strewn around. Maybe these were some of the things he said he had retrieved from his old home. Concentrate she urged herself. Time was not on her side. She pushed the window up, sat on the sill, and swung her legs over. Once inside, she could see that the cabin was considerably bigger than the one she was being held in, and had three separate rooms. Passing items of furniture and piles of packing boxes, and being careful to touch or disturb nothing, Eve moved silently towards the door on the far side of the room. She gave an ah of relief. The second room was full of tools, hardware, electrical items and various bits of office equipment. This was the place to find what she wanted. She took out one of her emergency items from her pocket, a torch, and turned it on. She used its light to sort through the trays and boxes, almost despairing at the sheer amount of stuff. 
She found herself staring at a toolbox filled with bundles of ties. Cable ties, adjustable tree ties, Velcro straps and, praise be, the very nylon ties he had used on her. She took four from the bundle and pushed them into her pocket. Then she selected a small reel of very fine wire from another box and pocketed that, too. Time to go. She was just making her way back to the open window when she noticed the door to a third room. She knew she should get out, but curiosity got the better of her. It was a small room, probably intended as a second bedroom, and unlike the rest of the cabin, was devoid of junk, having only a conference table and a single chair. Eve looked at the walls, and fear gripped her heart. It was like a military operations room. Maps, diagrams, notes, dates, locations, newspaper cuttings and hundreds of photographs lined every wall. And every photograph was of her. She swung the beam from picture to picture. Her as a girl, as a young woman, as a new recruit in the RAF, as an aircraft woman, with her friends Jenny, Anne, Wendy, Renee and Lou, then a picture of her on the fateful aircraft carrier prior to the fire. She moved to another wall. These pictures were recent, some very recent indeed. They showed her house, maps of the surrounding area, and even a shot of her walking into Greenborough Police Station. Eve reined in her racing thoughts, hurriedly closed the door and retraced her footsteps to the escape window. Outside she drew in a few deep breaths, and then raced back to the smaller cabin. Every single nerve in her body was tingling with fear. She should get back inside, climb up to where he had secreted her bag, and if her car keys were still inside, get in the car and drive like hell until she was far, far away. She sat on the rough grass between the window and tried to think rationally. That small room had been shocking, but it told her no more than what she already knew, that he was obsessed with her. In that case, surely he wouldn't hurt her. But could she afford to trust someone with such severe mental damage? Whatever, she needed to make a decision and stick to it. Eve checked that she had left no evidence to show she had been exploring Jimmy's creepy playground, muttered a prayer, and climbed back through the window. Tombs! What are these damn tombs? Is he being literal for once, or is this more sodding Thebes Latin? Nicky was striding up and down the CID room, clenching and unclenching her fists. She was angry. Angry with her mother for risking her life. Angry with the faceless coward that had seen fit to kill decent people to protect his own position and reputation. With herself for not being able to see the wood for the trees. And most of all, angry with Mad Tom for his games, threats, and terrible cold-blooded killings. K, Joseph called out. Ring K Walker. Nicky went back to her office. Where was Kay's number, for God's sake? She rang Cameron. Cam? You sound a bit fraught. Boiling, she said through gritted teeth. Cam, can I have Kay's number? Mad fucking Tom has issued another threat, and I'm damned if I can understand what the hell he means. What has he said? Don't forget, you're talking to a man who used to wallow in his bedsit, playing games all night through. Tombs? He said we'll find the next one in the tombs. Damn, not one I know. Got a pen? She wrote down Kay's mobile number and was about to hang up when she remembered the injured detective. Sorry, Darren Smith. Any news? Breathing unaided, but has no inclination to hurry back to this world. Cam sounded very dispirited. His mother has finally decided that she needs to be with him, so that's something. They hope that her presence and the sound of her voice will help. Nicky felt a lump in her throat. It all came flooding back to her. She remembered sitting for hours on end talking to her unresponsive daughter. I'm sure it will help, she murmured. I think Hannah knew I was there. Although, of course, I have no way of knowing that, but I just felt that she knew. I'm sorry, Nicky. This must be really tough on you. Not nearly as tough as it is on his poor mother right now. It is one situation where I really do not know what the other person is going through. Tell her not to give up hope, won't you? Of course I will. Now ring Kay, before she goes into the lecture hall and switches her phone off. Then Nicky was talking to Kay Walker. Tombs. Yes, let me think. Uh, it's a term used for both the courts and police headquarters. Nicky's throat constricted. Was Matt Tom about to live up to his nickname? It would be total madness to try to murder someone in a court or a police station. She thanked Kay and hung up, wondering. Would he? Could he? Was it even possible? Of course it was, if you were crazy. The enormity of it hit her. She stood up and hurried out into the CID room. I want an emergency meeting in half an hour in the major incident room. Joseph, alert uniform. I'm going to see the super. Mad Tom? asked Joseph as he made for the door. Yes, Mad Tom. And unless I've read this wrong, he's coming for one of us. Chapter 28
Superintendent Greg Woodall listened to Nicky in silence. When she had finished, he said, I'll notify all the local stations to be on high alert, although I'm sure it will be Greenborough he targets. And warn the court too, sir. Personally, I don't think he'll attempt to go there. I'm with you on the fact that it's us he's after. She rubbed her hands together nervously. Then I have this problem with Eve. She filled him in on what had happened. Greg's expression grew more amazed at every word. My God, I can't forget that last time. Does your mother realise how old she is? Is she reenacting Mission Impossible? I just hope the time will come when you can ask her yourself, sir. But since she's just walked straight back into the lion's den, I can't promise you'll get the chance. Greg gave her a disapproving look. I certainly wouldn't be too dismissive of her particular talents. I bet you a fiver she'll manipulate this nutter into coughing to everything he knows. Just as long as she gets home safely, I couldn't give a damn. Yes, you could, Nicky Galena. You care very much. Now, anything else? Nicky relaxed. It was quite a relief to hear someone have such confidence in Eve. Maybe she should take a leaf out of the super's book. One more thing, sir. The team that are checking Air Commodore Arthur Rowling's book collection, well, PC Nile Farrow to be accurate, thinks there's a chance that the Air Commodore's heart attack was actually another suspicious death. She looked at him hopefully. I was hoping to get Professor Rory Wilkinson to make a few discreet inquiries. More money. But yes, we'll cover it somehow. If it was murder, we'll need all the help we can get. Thank you, sir. I'm holding an emergency meeting in fifteen minutes. Will you come down? No, you take it. I'll get the wheels in motion from here. And as soon as you ID Mad Tom, get some photos for me to circulate. That hunched bloody figure on Cook's doorstep is no good to anyone. Okay, sir. And Nicky? She paused at the door and looked back at him. Have faith in your mother. She won't let you down. After making sure there were no obvious signs that the window had been tampered with, Eve looked around and tried to decide on the safest place to hide her phone. The knife was easy, the blade folded down into a wooden handle, and the whole thing was small enough to tuck into the elastic of her bra. It was horribly uncomfortable, but massively reassuring to feel it there. Her torch she secreted under the broken wooden base of a fishing tackle cupboard that was fastened to the wall of the cabin. She needed the phone to be close to her, but where? She looked around, and her eyes alighted on the radio he had brought her. She looked at the back. Yes, there was a cavity where a mains lead would normally be stored, but it was missing. There was no electricity in the cabin, so Jimmy had put in new batteries. She slipped the knife from its hiding place and used it to undo the screws on the back of the radio. To her relief, her little throwaway phone fitted into the cavity perfectly. She double-checked that the ringtone was on mute and that the phone was switched off. Then she replaced the plastic back plate and screwed it up securely, but not too tightly, in case she needed it in a hurry. That done, she selected a mellow music channel and left it playing on the table next to her bed. Perfect. Next, she checked the soles of her shoes. She didn't want Jimmy seeing any telltale mud or dampness on them. Happy with those, she prepared for the hard part, her restraints. She had taken careful note of exactly how Jimmy had secured them, and now set about replicating it. She started with her ankles. She had cut the tie on the underside at the back of her ankles, and as she had left one side attached, had only to loop a new tie around her other ankle and make a small repair with the fine wire she had found in his storeroom. It had to be strong enough to withstand her shuffling walk, but not too firmly fastened should she need to make a run for it. She tested the fastening by walking to the kitchen and back, and then began on her wrists. It took three attempts to get it right. She would be eating with him later, so she had to secure them exactly as before, though she did make them a little looser. And then it was done. Eve settled back on the bed, listened to Michael Bublé, and waited for her crazed admirer to return. Fiona took Vinny and René to join their colleagues in the library. I phoned my brothers and they want me to help you all I can. We all liked Anne and her death, well, if she was... Her voice tailed off. That's really helpful, miss. Niall had not told her that he suspected her father might have been killed too. Whatever you can tell us, we'd appreciate it. Please, Niall, call me Fiona. Miss makes me sound like a primary school teacher. They all sat around the table and began to pool ideas, buoyed up by the news that Eve had contacted Nicky. Wendy summarised what they knew so far. Your father, the Air Commodore, was ex-RAF, and then worked at the MOD, right? Fiona nodded. 
He knew Anne Castledine, but none of us knew him, so they must have met at the M.O.T. There was a murmur of general assent. He discovered something while working there that eventually forced him to leave. It bothered him intensely, enough to be afraid for his family's safety. He thought about getting Anne down here to talk to her about it, but the threats must have been so serious that he decided to leave a secret message for her, in case anything happened to him before he could tell her what he knew. And it did, added Fiona glumly, and Anne discovered it. Now she's dead too. She told one friend, Jenny Foxwell, who was also murdered, and someone took great pains to cover up her death, said Lou angrily, to the point of trying to make her body disappear. Renée finished off the sentence for her. What? Fiona's eyes widened. What on earth did Daddy know? Whatever it was, it gets people killed, replied Vinny. We need to find out what it was and stop it before more innocent people die. Anne obviously discovered something right here in this library said Wendy. Fiona, you told us Anne was really enjoying the work, then suddenly she became unsettled. That's right. For around three weeks everything was going swimmingly. Then one day, well, she seemed really distracted. For instance, she always went and had a few words with Mummy when she arrived. Never failed. But on this particular day she came directly here and Mummy wondered if she was all right. I asked her and she said she was sorry but there was something that had been bothering her all night and she really needed to get on with it. She didn't say what? asked Yvonne. No, she kind of brushed it away and I left her to it. Would you know when that was? Lou asked. Funny enough, yes. It was the day before Mummy's birthday. I remember wondering if Anne would forget that I'd asked her to join us for lunch. Wendy sat up straight. Right. Then we can find which book Anne was working on the day before. It had to be the day before if it had been bothering her overnight. They checked the date with Anne's folder of computer printouts. Got it. Renée jabbed her finger at an entry. A Grammar of Botany, by Robert John Thornton. Lou jumped up and began to search the shelves. Come and help me, Renée. Some of the print is really small and faded. It didn't take long to locate the volume. Lou handed it to Wendy. You look first. Wendy found a small Roman numeral penciled in at the bottom of one of the pages. Next to it were the letters G.V.S. What is the numeral? asked Lou. X1X, 19, answered Wendy. Lou looked at the first number on the list that Eve had found at Monk's Lantern. 19, we are on the right track, I know it. So what is GVS? Fiona walked around the table and stared down at her father's neat penciled handwriting. I think it's a name. I was never very taken with Daddy's books, but I did like the works of one of the Flemish painters, Gerard van Spandonk. Genius. Wendy pointed to Anne's catalogue list. There was the book. I think you are right. Plates in art books are usually given in Roman numerals to differentiate them from chapter numbers in the contents, added Lou. Vinnie walked across to the bookshelves. What's the book called? Wendy called out the title. And it's the only book by the artist in the collection, purchased by the Air Commodore on the 2nd of January 2006 for, wow, a lot of money. Fiona smiled sadly. Now you see why we agreed to have Daddy's books checked by an expert. Some of these volumes are worth a fortune and really do belong in a museum. That date? Did you say it was purchased on the 2nd of January? Lou stared at the list. That's Jenny's first line of numbers, with 19 as the final number. This is where she was directing us. Here. Yeah. Vinnie handed Wendy a beautiful leather-bound volume. Check plate 19. They all stared at the picture. Beautiful whispered Lou. But what does it mean? This, breathed Wendy. One corner of the plate had come away from the page it was stuck to. Tweezers. Anyone got a pair? Renée produced a manicure set from her handbag. There you go. Soon they were all looking at a slip of paper. The writing on it was tiny and very neat. It's a woman's name and a date, and the words the first. Wendy squinted at the scrap of paper. Fiona. Is this your father's handwriting? Fiona nodded. Vinny opened his laptop. Give me the woman's name. Elizabeth Riley, and the date is when Air Commodore Arthur Rowlings purchased the book. That's odd. After a few minutes, Vinny looked up with a disappointed sigh. Nothing. We need the police computer, Yvonne said. Can I use the phone, Fiona? I'll get one of our colleagues to check the name there. Help yourself, it's right here. Fiona stood up and went to the door. 
I'll go and organise something for you to eat. It's a bit late for lunch, but I guess some sandwiches might go down well. They all thanked her, and Wendy went back to Anne's file. Meanwhile, we'll check the next book she was working on and see if the Air Commodore has left us any clues in that. She looked at Jenny's list of figures. There's a hell of a lot to do still, but at least we're on the right track. They gathered in silence around Anne's file, all aware that if what was scattered through those old books was bad enough to kill for, they were on the verge of uncovering something very dangerous indeed. You're not going to believe this, but they've both been in therapy. Kat slapped a report down on the desk. Falcon and Haft both attended group sessions at Greenborough General Hospital. I've spoken to their GPs, and it seems that they had similar problems. Both were considered suitable candidates for anger management therapy. Someone should tell them it didn't work in Mad Tom's case, Ben muttered. So that's another bloody dead end, Cat grumbled. Not entirely, said Nicky. At least we know we are probably looking for either Haft or Falcon. Any news from the search? Nothing yet, Gov. Uniform did locate Haft's caravan. It's up Mablethorpe Way. But they said it was all locked up, and the site office said they hadn't seen him for months. We need an up-to-date photo of those two men. But since they've both gone to ground, I'm not sure how we can get hold of one. How long ago were they attending Greenborough Hospital? asked Joseph. Last year. Damn. I was thinking of a CCTV shot, but they won't keep them that long. Everyone was tense. Following Nicky's emergency meeting, the team members had become irritable and frustrated. Plus, of course, they were all under threat. She was forced to admit that right now their best hope was her mother and her harebrained scheme of trying to coax a madman into spilling the beans. For the first time since she had spoken to her mother, Nicky smiled to herself. Well, if anyone could pull off something like this, Eve could. Tell me again, Dave, what was the situation when our guys went to the two suspects' homes? Nicky was afraid of missing something. Falcon's got a pretty big house. I think you know it, Gov. He kept it going after his wife left. They had pots of money from his golfing days and she wanted something new. Dave moved a half-eaten cheese roll off a pile of reports and picked one out. Uniform looked around, but there was no one there and no cars in the drive either. They couldn't see into the double garage, but there were windows into the hallway. Nothing out of place. No signs of anything untoward. And Half's place. Bit of a dump by all accounts. But again, no one around and no car. Half does have neighbours, and they were happy to talk, but their properties are a fair distance away, so they couldn't help. I wonder. Nicky gnawed thoughtfully on her bottom lip. That sounds ominous, said Joseph. We can't force an entry. There's not enough evidence to go to a magistrate and ask for a warrant, and one of those two guys is innocent, so we can't just break in. But... Ah, Joseph smiled. But if we happened to find a window open, there would be nothing to stop us taking a look around, just to check that all is well, right? Absolutely. Fancy a ride? It's a bit risky, isn't it? What if he's waiting for you, Mum? Cat sounded concerned. No more so than waiting here in the tombs. Nicky grinned. Don't worry, Joseph will be with me, and I'll bag a couple of uniforms too. You guys keep chipping away. Monitor every bit of info that comes in. And stay safe, all right? I guess. Cat didn't look convinced. Where does Half live? He had the worst deal, so probably he would have the strongest motive to turn renegade. Cart off village, Gov, said Dave. Fifteen minutes south of Greenborough. He lives in what was a biggish property just off the Satterthorpe Road. He was nice once, but he's let it go. Good. The property maintenance is not high on his list of priorities. The window catches could just be a little dodgy. Nicky liked how she was feeling. Let's play dirty, Joseph. We'll get in there one way or another, and warrant be damned. Eve could not have timed it better. Instead of arriving late and dressed for dinner... Jimmy came back less than thirty minutes after she had finished tying herself up. Wearing shabby street clothes and looking distracted, Jimmy hurried in and peered around. For one moment Eve had a terrible thought that he somehow knew what she had been doing. I'm sorry. I meant to make tonight's special a real treat, but... He shook his head. Things have come up. I need to sort them. Forgive me, Eve, I can't stay and I won't be back till very late. Eve needed to know about his murdering therapy buddy and she wouldn't if she was stuck in the bloody cabin all night on her own. She thought fast. 
Surely you have a little time, Jimmy. It's really lonely here. And I was hoping for a proper wash. I hate feeling so dirty. Jimmy screwed up his face. He seemed undecided. Then he said, Of course. I'm so sorry. This is awful for you, but if things work out, late tomorrow I'll be taking you to a different place. Somewhere you will be really comfortable. With a shower and a proper bed. And even TV. Whoopee! thought Eve. A premiere in, and I won't miss bargain hunt. She smiled bravely. Oh, yes, that would be good. I'm glad you were using the radio. Oh, yes, Jimmy, it's turned out very useful. I brought you these. He placed two Daily Telegraph cryptic crossword books and a short stub of a pencil on her bed. I know how you like them, and they will help to keep your brain active. So important at times of inactivity. He stared at her. Thank you, she added quickly. I appreciate the thought. Now please, sit for a few minutes and then maybe a bowl of water to wash in. He reluctantly sat. It's not my choice to go, you know. I'd spend every minute with you if I could. I believe you. And she did. She'd been in the other cabin and seen his shrine. She assumed a look of concern. Is there something wrong, Jimmy? It's not to do with the people who are trying to kill me, is it? indirectly. But don't worry about it, I've got it covered. The main thing is, they don't know about this place, so you were safe. I am worried, she said. Yesterday you told me you knew who that murderer was. If you know him, then he knows you. What if he came looking for you, and found me tied up like this, he'd kill me without a thought. Jimmy laughed gently. And he wouldn't hurt you. He kills thieves, I told you that. He'd never hurt you. And even he doesn't know about this place. No one does. Got you. I suppose I'll have to believe you then. But this is awful, Jimmy. She thrust her bound hands toward him. You know me, Jimmy. You said so yourself. You know this is killing me. My friends are in danger and I can't help them. You saved my life and I'll be eternally grateful. But Jimmy, have a heart. Please let me go. Jimmy looked miserable and pathetic. I can't, Eve. You told me you'd explain everything. I will. But not now, I have to go. He stood up and took a package from his bag. Sandwiches, crisps and a chocolate bar to keep you going. And tomorrow, not only will I get you a proper meal, I will tell you everything. Then, when it's dark, we will move out of here. He hurried away to fetch a bowl of water, then returned and placed it on a small table close to the chemical toilet. There's a fresh towel and flannel, but I haven't time to sort the dunny. He looked at her with a strange mixture of devotion and curiosity. Eve, I... I... His words trailed off. Eve breathed a sigh of relief. She really hadn't wanted to hear the rest. As soon as the sound of the car faded into the distance, Eve wrestled the knife from her bra and undid the back of the radio. She switched her phone on and waited impatiently for it to find a signal there was none. Eve swore and tapped out a text to Nicky, hoping it would get through. All she could do was keep trying to get hold of her daughter and give her the vital information she was waiting for. Then she needed to find out about her friend's deaths and she could get away from Jimmy Fraser for good. Joseph had checked out a pool car. They took with them two uniformed officers, WPC Carol Greengrass and PC Adrian Lomax. They were good officers, who had done well in their training. Carol knew Cartoft and the Haft House well, so she drove. Her uncle lived a few doors away from Dieter Haft. Carol lived in the next village. Uncle Jack says he felt really sorry for Dieter after the burglary. Apparently the poor guy's world just fell apart when his dad went into a home. He reckoned he was never the same after that. Did he say Haft was dangerous in any way? asked Nicky. No, he just said he was hurt and bitter, and very angry at the way things turned out. Understandable, thought Joseph. I'd feel pretty pissed off too if my father had been subjected to such a horrible ordeal and then the police got everything wrong. Just down here, ma'am. Shall I go into the drive or park on the road? Go in, and we'll see if we can gain entry without setting too many neck curtains flapping. Not too many along this stretch, ma'am. It's pretty secluded. My uncle can't see this house from his. They left the car and walked around the property, checking the downstairs windows and doors as they went. Then Carol called out, Addy, come and give me a hand. 
Her partner hurried to where she was looking at a narrow, overgrown passageway that ran between the side of the house and the garage. It was piled with rubbish bags and bins and smelt pretty awful. There's a door down there, and a small window. Carol hefted a couple of bags aside while Adrian moved the heavy bins. Carol peered through the window. Looks like a side entrance to a utility room and a downstairs toilet, she said. Adrian tried the door. It's locked. But the window isn't, Carol smiled happily, and I do believe, she gave a hearty yank and it flew open, I'll weigh in. She stepped back to let Joseph pass, Nicky close behind him. Here goes nothing, he whispered. The house smelt almost as bad as the bin bags in the alley. Nicky put her hand over her mouth and nose. Lovely. Carol Greengrass looked around. Not exactly grand designs, is it? He really has given up on it. Joseph felt rather sad. It must have been a lovely home once. Now it was little more than a doss house. Can't see us finding any recent happy snaps here, can you? Nicky said. But still, perhaps there's a passport or a driving license. They moved from room to room, but found nothing of use. I get the feeling he hasn't lived here for a while, Joseph commented. Me too, and I think we'll find proof when we reach the kitchen. Nicky wrinkled her nose in distaste. I can't see him stopping by to wash up, clean the sink, and check the food in the fridge, can you? Probably not. Joseph picked up a newspaper lying discarded on the floor. Two weeks old. He looked around the cluttered, untidy room. Nicky, Mad Tom is organised, well, to a degree he is. After all, he's done all this research on villains and thieves. He knows Kant, probably from computer games, but I haven't seen a computer, have you? No, and I've seen only chaos in this place. There's no organisation at all. I don't think. Nicky's phone shrilled out. She answered it, and her face lit up. Thanks, Mum. We've just about come to the same conclusion. Now, for heaven's sake, get out of there. Nicky frowned. Listen, I've heard from Wendy. They are well on the way to cracking the secret thing, so you don't need to hang around any longer. We can do this without your mad captor's help. Just get out before it gets dark and come home, Mum, please. Joseph watched the anguish on Nicky's face and prayed that Eve would listen. Nicky ended the call. Mad Tom's name is Andy. Andrew. Andrew Falcon, probably. So where is Dieter Haft? Joseph heard shouts from outside. Adrian and Carol were running up the overgrown garden path away from a ramshackle summer house. Mum, you'd better see this. Carol's face was white, and Addie looked as if he was about to throw up. Nicky turned to Joseph. I guess we're about to find out where Dieter Haft is. Shall I? Joseph asked. No, we better both see this, and then get every man-jack in the division out looking for Andrew Falcon. Dieter Haft was lying in a sleeping bag in the summer house. The stench told them he had probably been there for a full two weeks. His body was surrounded by tablet packets, several spirit bottles and a used syringe. Belts and braces, muttered Nicky. He really made sure he wouldn't be coming back. I'll ring it in. Joseph stepped back and away from the stink of the rotting corpse. He looked at Carol and Adrian. You two wait outside the front door. No one in until the cavalry arrives. He smiled at their white faces. You'll get used to it. You think, Sarge? Adrian looked worse than Carol. Happens every time with me. This one is bad. Even I'm feeling queasy. He wasn't, but he wanted the young copper to feel less ashamed. He rang the station. Then he rang Cat with the news about Falcon. Let's get out of here, said Nicky. This is not how I wanted it to turn out, but mission accomplished. We know who Mad Tom is, so let's go home. Chapter 29 Eve Anderson stared at the mobile phone. So, Wendy and the others had been busy. If they were that far ahead, perhaps she should do as Nicky said and get out. There was a lot of unfinished business here with Jimmy Fraser, but she was prepared to admit that there was grave danger too. Eve rarely listened to anyone's advice. She had always relied on her own judgment to keep her safe, but now she had heard the deep concern in her daughter's voice. With a grunt, Eve made a snap decision. She took out the knife. Soon her wrists and ankles were free once more. She stood up, stiff and uncomfortable, but the adrenaline was starting to pump through her body. All of a sudden, getting away from here seemed like a very good idea indeed. She took the stool that Jimmy had used, stood on it and reached up to pull down her things. She put the jacket on, checked her bag, and cursed out loud. No car keys. She had a swift look around the kitchen, but found nothing. 
Then she remembered. She hurried over to the fishing tackle cupboard and took out her torch, and the last item from her secret emergency kit, a spare key to the Volvo. This time she wasn't careful with the window, and it flew open. She glanced back to her temporary prison and wondered what on earth Jimmy was involved in. Then she double-checked her bag and dived out of the window. Outside, Eve paused for a moment. It would have been helpful if he had given her some idea of where this place was. He had told her it had been part of his father's land, but she had no idea where that was. She moved quickly to where Jimmy had left her car and tore off the camouflage netting. She unlocked her trusty old Volvo and then stopped. In the distance was the sound of a car, and it wasn't Jimmy's. Eve had heard Jimmy's car and knew that it was a small, cheap one. The vehicle she was hearing now was smooth and powerful, and it was coming her way. Fast. By five o'clock, the book club at the old rectory had a list of six women's names and a series of dates. Yvonne, assisted by Cat and Ben back at Greenborough, had found that all these women, every one of them young, had either met with a fatal accident or disappeared. Lou closed the last book with a long sigh of relief. Thank you, Air Commodore. You could have made it a little easier, but we are finally there. Niall stretched. Time to hand this over to CID. I think we've done our bit, don't you? Well and truly, said Finney. Excellent work, ladies. And you, of course, Niall. But Wendy couldn't seem to feel elated at what they had achieved. As far as she could see, things were looking very dark indeed. Who was to blame for these deaths? It's all well and good to celebrate, but don't forget we are no nearer to knowing who is quietly executing any and everybody who has a connection to this case. And in case you might have forgotten, that includes us. Rene huffed. Always did know how to bring a girl down, Wendy Avery. What's even more annoying is that you are perfectly right. Vinny nodded. Yes, I'm afraid you were going to have your bodyguard for a bit longer, ladies. Wendy almost broke into a smile when she saw the look on Lou's face. She was clearly enjoying Vinnie Silver's company rather a lot. I was just wondering, before we go home, could we find out how that lovely old guy at the bookshop is? Lou asked. The paramedics said they were taking him to Peterborough City Hospital. Want me to ring for you? Vinnie volunteered. Lou smiled at him. That's kind of you. I just hope he made it. If I were you, I'd ring the local police, Renee suggested. I doubt whether you'll get much joy from the hospital. Don't forget, someone tried to kill the old guy, so he's probably unlisted, and hopefully there's someone keeping an eye on him. I'll do it, Yvonne said. I might get more out of them. A few minutes later, she put the phone down and gave a thumbs up. One of the Rutland officers told me he's recovering well. They said whoever suggested the strong tea was a genius. It saved his life. She pulled her face. But we won't tell him. He's always reminding us himself. Good old Rory, said Niall. He became serious. Guys, I haven't told Fiona that we suspect her father was murdered. I'd be grateful if you could all keep shtum until we know more. Of course, said Wendy. It might never be proven. Professor Wilkinson is on the case, so if there is anything untoward in that PM, he'll find it. Niall replied. So our work here is done? asked René. Wendy didn't answer immediately. Perhaps. Perhaps not. Lou frowned. I don't like that look on your face, Wen. I was wondering, Wendy said thoughtfully, what you might think about offering to finish the job that Anne started. I mean, when the threat to our lives has lifted. The women looked at one another. Rene nodded. A sort of tribute. Wendy flicked through the folder. She did a fantastic job until she was killed. We could do it. I'm game, I guess, if the family allows it, added Lou. Renée smiled. I'll vote even as well, if she ever stops playing Modesty Blaze and gets herself back home. Wendy felt a rush of warmth for her friends. It would be a tribute to Anne and to Jenny too, because without a doubt, Jenny would have been the first to offer to finish what their friend had begun. Jenny hated loose ends. Thanks, I appreciate it. Now talk to Fiona before we go. She stood up. If only we could find the black heart behind all this. Oh, no, you don't, cried Yvonne and Niall in unison. Niall tried a stern smile. It's our job now. This goes over to D.I. Nikki Galena and her team. Time to back off, ladies. Wendy hoped their innocent expressions would convince him, but somehow she doubted it. Eve had to make a very swift decision. Her life might depend on getting it right. 
Her old Volvo was no match for the approaching vehicle, and she had no idea where she was. She could drive straight into a dead end. Should she drive or run? There was no choice, really. She threw her bag over her shoulder and ran. She headed for the scrubby bushes and windswept trees behind the bigger cabin. She could still hear the car approaching, so she wouldn't have been seen. Jimmy had said his old home was gone, but did he mean bulldozed or sold? If there was a house here, she might find somewhere to hide. Silently she cursed Jimmy for tying her up. She was stiff and crampy and running like, as she put it, an arthritic crab. Still, things could be worse. Couldn't they? She crashed through the trees and found herself at the edge of a second lake. Keeping to the trees, she put as much distance as possible between herself and Jimmy Fraser's hideaway. Then she was at the far side of the stagnant lake, looking out over miles of flat fields, all ploughed up and ready for planting. You could spot a partridge out there at a hundred metres, no cover. Eve crouched down in the shelter of a big hawthorn tree. This was not what she had imagined. She thought she would be on an estate of some kind. Maybe she was, and she'd run in the wrong direction. This could be the very edge of the old Fraser land. She wanted to ring Nicky, but dare not use a phone or speak out loud. If the men in the car were the ones who had already made one attempt on her life, they could already be creeping silently towards her. She glanced over her shoulder, but there was no sound at all. Still, they didn't call them ghosts for nothing. Her common sense told her that they would have to search the cabins before they took off into the woods after her. She needed to go back and see what was on the other side of the wooded area around the lakes, but that would take her perilously close to the men in black. She sat down and wondered what to do. She could hide. There were thickets of reeds and brambles close to the water, and she had seen a big pile of small dead trees that had probably been blown down in a storm and never cleared. Eve sat silently and weighed up her options. Then she smelt something that made her shiver. Petrol. She crept back the way she had come. The stink got stronger. She stood beneath the trees at the edge of the lake and looked towards Jimmy's cabins. Already an orange glow was creeping along the bushes closest to his little sanctuary. Then spikes of brighter yellows and reds were staining the sky. Oh, my God! She breathed and sank back into the dark, damp woods. You thought they didn't know about this place, huh? That was perfectly safe, was I? From the speed and the extent of the fire, she surmised that they had driven in and torched the place without looking further. Her car was still there. The door was locked and the radio still playing. As far as they knew, she was still there. Then the enormity of it hit her. If she had not listened to her daughter, if she had not acted so quickly. Eve swallowed. After surviving the fire on the aircraft carrier to then burn to death in that cabin. What a cruel fate. Her memories rose up like flames, images of her and Frank trapped inside that burning ship, the screams, the cries and the horrible moans of the dying, the stink of smoke and burning flesh. It had taken years to forget that smell. Oh, poor Jimmy. His phobias, his fears, the terror that he lived with. Her memories were nothing compared to his persistent nightmare. He would come back and find that the one thing he held dear, the person he had fought for, had perished in an inferno. All thoughts of getting away evaporated. She had to stay now. She had to wait until Jimmy returned, so that he could see her, still alive. In minutes, the whole dilapidated fishing hamlet was consumed. Then she heard the dull whump of an explosion, saw a plume-shaped black cloud ascend, and knew that her beloved Volvo had gone with the rest. Eve sat down and watched. Later, amid the crackling and the roaring, she made out the sound of an engine, a powerful, smooth engine fading away. Chapter 30 This time they went into Andrew Falcon's front door by way of an enforcer, swung by a muscled sixteen-stone PC known as Tiny. Nicky had not expected to find Falcon there, but nevertheless the superintendent had arranged an armed response vehicle to go with them. The firearms officers led the way in and shortly reported that all rooms were clear. Mom, there's a room upstairs that you might like to see the officer said. Nicky raised an eyebrow. Interesting, is it? Could say that, considering the kind of guy you were looking for. Nicky and Joseph hurried up the stairs and soon located the room. Its main feature was a PS4 console and a big screen, but that was not what caught their attention. The walls were decorated with posters and fantasy paintings, some of which looked pretty pricey. All the art related to computer games. Joseph walked around, looking at the pictures. 
I think this clinches it, don't you? I should say. Look at this. Nicky pointed to a monster poster depicting an underground chamber lit by flaming torches and featuring hard-faced men battling over treasure chests. Beneath it were the words, Thieves' Domain. Is this the one you were talking about? That's the one. Then we have what we need. Andrew Falcon is Mad Tom. I'll get a couple more detectives out here and ask Uniform to do a search for anything that might indicate where he's gone, and then we can get back to base. They were walking back down the stairs when Nicky's phone registered an incoming text. She read it and heaved a sigh of relief. It's Eve. She says she's done as I asked and she's safe. She has just one thing to do, then she'll be home. Joseph frowned. And what is the one thing? I'm not looking any further than the word safe right now. With everything else that she had on her plate, Nicky decided to hang on to the fact that Eve had actually got away. Knowing her mother, that was a minor miracle in itself. Time to stop worrying about Eve and concentrate on the threat from Mad Tom. Nicky knew she would never be able to call him Falcon. He would always be Mad Tom, until she read him his rights and marched him up to the custody sergeant to be booked in. Back in the CID room, Kat asked if she could speak to her. I've been going into Andrew Falcon's background, Gov. She placed some typed sheets on Nicky's desk. I know he's got to be Mad Tom, but I wanted to try and back it up with some facts. It seems that his daughter was his whole world. She pulled her face. Idealised, if you ask me. He idolised her, bought her everything she wanted, and showered her with gifts. From the photos I found on social media and from talking to his friends and people around him, he seemed to be trying to be the perfect father. She was his perfect little princess, even though she was twelve at the time of the incident. So then she went to pieces after the burglary. Cat nodded. The wife divorced him and took the daughter with her, and Falcon's world fell apart. Cat sat back and looked at Nicky. I've read through some of the things he said at the time on social media. He said he wanted criminals to know what it was like to be targeted and the things they loved violated. Pretty damning. He also said that our useless police force needed a wake-up call and how they would probably act differently if it happened to them or their loved ones. Nicky sighed. So, he has had his fill of villains and he's turned on us. I think he's lost it, Gov, said Cat emphatically. I think he doesn't care any more. He just wants revenge and we're in the firing line. Do you think he really would attack someone in the nick or the courthouse? With all the security, it would be suicide if he did. As I said, Gov, he doesn't care. So yes, I'm certain he'll try something, and he won't give a damn about what happens afterwards. After Cat had gone, Nicky sat and wondered how she could keep everyone safe. She came to the conclusion that she couldn't. All she could do was pray that all her friends and colleagues were watching their backs and those of everyone around them. Eve knew that she had no time to procrastinate. On this flat landscape, the blaze would be noticed quickly, and soon the whole place would be filled with fire appliances and emergency vehicles. How the hell was she going to find Jimmy when she knew so little about him? She forced herself to think. First, she had to find out where she was. She had no transport now, so she had better get moving. Both Jimmy and the recent visitors had come and gone by the same route, so that was the way she would go too. She set off, keeping to the tree line, moving as swiftly as she dare in the last of the twilight. Soon it would be dark, and then things would get really tricky. After about ten minutes, she knew she had been right about being on an estate. When she finally reached the end of the lane, she found herself at a junction between the road and an overgrown gravel driveway, flanked by two high stone pillars that had probably once supported iron gates. Scraggy bushes and huge old trees lined the entrance to the property. It was clear that it had been many years since anyone had maintained it. Was this Jimmy's father's old home? Eve removed her torch from her bag and shone it at a weathered sign that hung drunkenly off the crumbling remains of a wall. She read the faded words. Darius Lodge. James Darius Fraser. It was a family name. Jimmy had once told her. Eve looked up. In the distance she could hear sirens, and way across the farmland on the other side of the road she saw blue flashing lights. A short while ago they would have been the answer to her prayers, but right now she did not want them to see her. Once again she was uncertain. Maybe Jimmy really did still live at the old house. Perhaps he just didn't want her to know it. So she would look here first. At that moment, a torch beam picked up something red under the trees, a little way down the drive. The gravel was impacted by tyres. Someone with a fairly light vehicle evidently used this track regularly. 
there was a slight bend in the approach to the house itself. She rounded the corner and caught her first glimpse of Jimmy's old home. She stopped in her tracks and stared. She could just make out that a good half of the building was just a black skeleton of charred bricks and stone and timbers. Jimmy had meant it when he said it was gone. A house fire. Another terrible fire in Jimmy's already traumatised life. What he must have suffered was almost beyond belief. Eve hurried towards the glint of red and realised it was a parked car. It was a Suzuki Ignis, and she knew immediately that it was Jimmy's car. She ran the last few yards and saw that there was someone inside. Jimmy was slumped in the driver's seat, the side of his head and the collar of his jacket covered with blood. Oh no, Jimmy! Despite what he had done to her, Eve felt a surge of anger towards the men who had done this. Jimmy had been a kind and gentle young airman who had been damaged during active service. He did not deserve this end. She pulled the door open and took his wrist. To her surprise, she found a pulse. It was erratic and faint, but James Darius Fraser was still fighting to live. Eve eased him back into the seat and talked softly to him. Then she pulled her phone from her pocket and dialed 999. Ambulance and hurry! And before you ask too many questions, I have a man who is unconscious, bleeding profusely and seriously injured. I believe he's been shot. When asked for an address, she said, Darius Lodge, that's all I know, but I can tell you it's on the same estate as a massive fire and you have emergency vehicles approaching now. If there is an ambulance among them, can you divert it? Please. This man is dying right before my eyes. Eve opened the back door and found an old blanket. She dragged it out and wrapped it around him. He was horribly pale. Come on, Jimmy. You hold on right. You do it for me, for Eve. I don't want you going anywhere, my friend. You still have a lot of explaining to do. His eyelids fluttered. Still bossing me about. Damn right, you idiot. Relief coursed through her, and momentarily she wondered that she should feel so concerned for the man who had imprisoned her. Now you stay with me, understand? Help is on its way. It arrived faster than she had anticipated. An ambulance had been diverted and was now bouncing up the uneven drive. She waved it down and told them what she knew, which wasn't much. He's in a bad way, but as soon as we've stabilised him, we'll get him to ITU. The paramedics were already putting in lines and attaching monitors. What's his name? Jimmy Fraser. Will you follow us or come in the ambulance? Oh, I'll go with him. One way to get a lift into town, she thought, and probably one of the safest, all things considered. Even she couldn't see the security services hijacking an ambulance speeding on blues and twos. Niall and Yvonne didn't arrive back from Rutland until the evening. Nicky and Joseph made sure all the others got off home and then sat down to wait for them. Nicky felt happier knowing that everyone was well away from the tombs. Somehow she was not surprised to see them walk in, accompanied by Wendy and Lou. Lou grinned. So Eve has turned Houdini and done a runner? I knew we shouldn't worry about her. I'm not totally happy about her having one thing to do before she came home, said Joseph. Ah, that is a trifle ominous, Wendy shrugged. But Eve will be fine, I'm sure. Nicky thought she didn't sound very convinced. Well, Wendy must be aware that whoever killed Anne and Jenny was still at large, and they were still in danger, all of them, including Eve. Niall flopped into a chair. These ladies have been amazing, ma'am. But we seem to have unearthed a rather nasty can of worms, Wendy said. We have had experience of this kind of thing in the past, and it usually doesn't end well. So speaks the prophet of doom, added Lou. You know exactly what I'm talking about, Lou Fawcett. Then don't deny it. Lou sighed. Of course I do. I'm just trying to be a little optimistic. Wendy looked around the empty office. We did a little research on one of Vinnie's computers on the way here, and we found some rather worrying, what you might call, coincidences. Oh? asked Nicky, regarding the list of girls. There is a connection? Joseph asked. The connection, although it's a little tenuous, is a someone— me think it might be the person that worked with Air Commodore Arthur Rowlings. You have evidence to support that? Nicky said. Of course not. But if there were someone with a little more clout than three female retired government workers, we do know the questions they might want to ask. Wendy raised an eyebrow. Then you'd better fill us in, and I'll take it to the superintendent. Please be careful who you share this knowledge with. I'd trust Greg Woodall with my life, Nicky said bluntly. 
then he's the one to tell. But Nicky... Wendy lowered her voice. The higher up the chain this travels, the more chance there is of some nameless bureaucrat pulling the plug on it. So don't be disappointed if your case just vanishes into thin air. But people have died, been murdered. They can't hush that up. Oh, they can, said Lou grimly, and rather easily, I'm afraid. Nicky let out a long breath. What on earth did you guys find? A cover-up. Wendy looked angry. A vile man in a position of power abused that position, and Air Commodore after Rollings found out about it. Sadly, the man he was prepared to try to bring down had better connections than Arthur Rollings. Lou took over, and when the Air Commodore realised how serious it was and that his family was in jeopardy, he decided to enlist Anne Castledine's help. And that was the start of the string of deaths, Joseph concluded. In her mind's eye, Nicky saw that car with the darkened windows driving past Monk's Lantern, and she knew that what Wendy was telling them was true. Joseph interrupted her thoughts. So what are these coincidences that you've uncovered? Wendy almost whispered her reply. One of the fatal accidents, a pretty young girl called Amélie Beauvais, fell from a motorboat and was dragged into the propeller. The person the press named as the boat owner was a man from the very top of the pile in national security. Another young woman from our list, apparently high on drugs, took a corner at speed while driving a friend's sports car. She crashed and died at the scene. Lou paused. A scene that was only a few miles from the country home of our shadowy friend. Do we have a name? asked Nicky. We'd rather someone else took our information and made that connection for themselves. Wendy suddenly looked tired. He's got some very influential friends, and if his name were to come out and he was dragged through the mud... He would take a lot of other people with him. Mud sticks, muttered Lou. I very much doubt that the powers that be would allow such a thing to happen to a prominent person such as him. So how do we stop this cycle of violence? asked Joseph. Whatever we do, there will be casualties. But if we make enough waves, something will have to happen. We just have to make sure that it doesn't happen to us. Wendy looked deadly serious, and Nicky knew that they were in over their heads with this one. Mom. A uniformed PC entered the room with a manila envelope in his hand. Came for you, from forensics. It has private and confidential on it. She thanked the officer and opened it up. It was from Rory. She had spoken to him earlier. It simply said that he had had a quiet word with the woman who had conducted the PM on Air Commodore Arthur Rollings. She had been surprised at his having a heart attack, as his general health was very good. Given his age, she did not suspect that anything was amiss. She believed it was just a catastrophic cardiac arrest, but to cover all angles she had asked for a tox report. But oddly, there had been a mix-up at the lab they used, and the samples were accidentally destroyed. By the time she found out, the family had gone ahead with the funeral. I firmly believe, dear Inspector, that you can add the dear Air Commodore to your growing list of underhanded and dastardly executions. Ta-ta for now, Rory. Kiss-kiss. P.S., have you ever been to Mexico for a holiday? Nicky pushed the letter back in the envelope and turned to Wendy. What do you think this sinister, influential man got up to? We think he used his money and power to influence young women. There are rumours that he has a penchant for teenagers. Others mention that he indulges in some rather perverse activities. This is not common knowledge, and could just be made up but Vinny showed us a few rather interesting websites where gossip and hearsay are rife. And then maybe the girls wanted out. Maybe they wanted money. Maybe they threatened him with exposure. Whatever, we think they were disposed of, Lou added. And then our lovely old air commodore found out and became a thorn in his side, Nicky mused. Joseph added, but he couldn't be removed so easily. He had been a hero, an officer in the RAF, and was still a well-respected MOD official. He wasn't the sort of man you could pay off or scare off, for that matter, until he started to fear for his family's safety. So he left a trail of clues, then decided not to leave it there and contacted Anne. Wendy looked sad. Anne was well known in the MOD. If anyone was watching the Air Commodore's home and saw her visit, they would have put two and two together, and so poor dear Anne had to go. Wicked bastard, growled Nicky. She was so mad now that she barely heard her phone ringing. Cameron, slow down! She opened the loudspeaker. 
Our fire service has been attending a big fire, Nicky, on the outskirts of the next village to Beach Lacey. Some old cabins that were part of a defunct fishing lake complex. And what are you telling me for? Nicky already had a very good idea. Your mother's burnt-out Volvo was found there. What? It's okay, Nicky, it's empty. But we think it was where she was held. And the fire chief assures me that as far as they can ascertain, there are no human remains anywhere in the debris. So he must have taken her with him, then torched the place. Nicky frowned. I don't think that's what happened, Cam. I heard from Eve earlier. She escaped. She's with you. Fantastic. Not quite. She said she had something to do first. You don't think she started the fire? Cameron sounded incredulous. I'd put nothing past my mother, but no, I don't think that. I just won't be happy until I see her in person. Well, I'll keep you posted as to what we find in the ashes, although it was one heck of an inferno. They said goodbye, and Nicky's brain went into overdrive. So her mother had no car, but she had a final job to do. She shook her head to try to clear her thoughts. Wendy and Lou were sitting quietly. They had heard the conversation. They found out where she was being held. Lou's voice was low, and they tried to kill her again. And they failed again, added Nicky grimly. But are they aware of that fact? That's a very good question, murmured Wendy. Very good indeed. Chapter 31 You aware? Nicky sounded as if she were at breaking point. RTU, in Greenborough General. Calm down, I'm only visiting, Eve replied. Mum, you are worrying me sick, what now? Who are you visiting, for heaven's sake? And are you all right? Are you hurt in any way? Hearing her daughter's concern, Eve smiled fondly. I'm perfectly safe and unharmed, so relax. But I wondered if you could come here tonight. There's a lot I need to tell you. There is someone you need to meet, if he regains consciousness. I'm on my way. Eve shut off her phone and looked through the observation window at the still form in the hospital bed. There had been a scary moment on the journey when Jimmy flatlined, but the medics managed to bring him back. Now his life hung in the balance, and Eve found herself praying that he would make it. Maybe she was wrong, but she had a feeling that someone would be able to help Jimmy. With the right kind of help, maybe he could make a life for himself. Eve reminded herself to check on Jimmy's dog as soon as she was out of the hospital and had organised herself a car. She guessed he was back at Darius Lodge. If he wasn't, she'd have to hope that Jimmy woke up and told her where to find him. She hated the thought of the faithful creature waiting patiently for his missing master. She almost laughed. This was crazy, the victim chasing round the countryside with a tin of dog food and a bonio for the abductor's dog. Not for the first time, Eve decided that her world was not like that of other people. She went back in and sat with Jimmy until Nicky arrived about twenty minutes later. Who the hell is this? were Nicky's first words. Meet James Darius Fraser. He saved my life, Nicky, but he's also the man who drugged me and snatched me from Monk's Lantern. Her daughter was speechless for once, but he did it to protect me from some very nasty people, people who not long ago tried to cremate me. Nicky sank down into a chair and stared at her mother. Why couldn't you have been a hairdresser? Or maybe a florist? I'm sure they retire gracefully and do not attract death threats on a daily basis. Excuse me, but aren't you the police detective who is under threat from a certain maniac? Isn't that so? Touché. You got me on an easy one. Nicky smiled at her. But Mum, you have no idea how worried we've been. Believe me, we know exactly what these men are capable of. I'm terrified that they're going to try again and make it third time lucky. I think they believe I am dead. I came here in the back of an ambulance and my darling Volvo has been incinerated. I obviously need to keep my head well below the parapet and I dare not go home. I'll make sure you have somewhere safe to go, somewhere with no connection to anyone you know. Nicky sat forward. Now, tell me what happened to you. Eve spent the next ten minutes telling Nicky everything. She finished off with, Jimmy took a hell of a beating to rescue me. I know he has a bit of a thing for me, but there's no denying that if it wasn't for him, I would be stone bloody dead. A bit of a thing? Nicky rolled her eyes. Mother, he's obsessed. And thank God he is. His obsession means you still have a mother. Nicky exhaled. So where do we go from here? I need to locate his dog. Pardon? Jimmy has a dog. He's left it somewhere. Possibly at his father's old house, Darius Lodge, next to where I was held. Mother, 
We have murdering spooks stalking you and your friends. We have a killer who intends to take out police officers. And you want to turn dog catcher? She glanced across at the heavily bandaged man. For him? Yes. Eve couldn't think of any other way of putting it. I see. There was a silence. Then both women burst out laughing. What sort of dog is it? A German shepherd crossed Labrador, called Skipper, I think. Nikki shook her head in disbelief. Okay, but you're not going, end of story. I'll ask Yvonne and Niall to go take a look for you. Yvonne's barking mad about dogs, but he'll have to fend for himself tonight. I'll get them out there tomorrow. Deal? Eve nodded. Suddenly she realised how exhausted she was. Thank you. Now tell me about Wendy and the others and what they have discovered. Nicky explained, and Eve felt a rush of warmth for her old friends. Tenacious, aren't they? You're not kidding. I'd quite like the whole lot of them in CID with us. Nicky's voice became serious. I've moved all of them, with Vinnie Silver still riding shotgun into a small and private hotel until we get something sorted. Wendy's place is no longer safe. That's where I'm taking you, too. It's out of town and barely known except by its regulars, and it doubles as a safe house. I want to stay here until Jimmy wakes up. Okay, but try to get some rest. There will be a police officer outside all the time. After all, whoever shot him could come back to finish the job. Her daughter looked so worried about her that Eve made a silent promise to herself. In future, she would try not to cause her too much anxiety. Ring me when you are ready to go. And I, or possibly Joseph, will come and get you, okay? Nicky stood up. I don't really want to let you out of my sight, but I still have a murderer to catch and we all need to grab some shut eye. I'll ring, I promise, but I can't just leave him. She looked at the pathetic man in the bed and caught the tiniest hint of his aftershave mingled in with the smell of antiseptic and blood. No, I can't leave him. He has no one else left. At around three in the morning, Eve opened her eyes and realised that Jimmy was waking up. She pressed the buzzer and two nurses hurried to his bedside. Maybe you could give us a moment or two. He needs a bit of attention. The young nurse smiled at her. We won't be long. Eve wandered outside and saw that Nicky had been true to her word. A tall, bull-necked uniformed officer was standing just outside the door. Everything all right, Miss Anderson? I'm PC Ken Chivers. I think he's coming round, Ken. Lucky guy. The officer pulled a face. Not too many people survive a point-blank shooting. He's got a way to go yet. They talked until the nurse called her back in. We've changed his dressings and checked his drips and drains, but he's a bit restless, Eve. We've got him on fifteen-minute obs, but call as if there is any change. Eve sat down and started talking softly to him. Jimmy seemed to calm down and dozed for a while. The next time he woke, he was quite lucid. Skipper, he croaked. Under control, Jimmy. We'll pick him up in the morning. Is he in Darius Lodge? The old summer house, in the gardens. Eve nodded and took hold of his hand. We'll find him. Don't worry, okay? He gave a painful smile. So, they didn't get you? No, they didn't. But I failed you. No, you didn't. You saved me, remember? Jimmy tried to move his head and grimaced with pain. I left you there. Completely unprotected and vulnerable. I never dreamed they would find the cabins. What a fool I was. But I'm safe, and I'm here now. No thanks to me. Don't play the martyr, James Fraser. We survived, that's what counts. Although your cabins didn't, I'm afraid. It's all a blur. He coughed, then closed his eyes tightly. I saw flames. Let it go, Jimmy. Just tell me who those men are covering up for, if you know. She guessed Jimmy was fighting to rid himself of the sight of the flames. Then he heaved in a rasping breath and said, A man named Giles Esprit. He's high up in intelligence services. Involved in the defence of the realm. <laughs> His lip curled. Someone who should be whiter than white and above temptation, but beneath the skin. He's a monster. How do you know this? Because he killed my sister. It was made to look like a tragic accident, but he killed her all right. 
He felt as if she had been poleaxed. What? I've been trying to find a way to bring him down for years. But with all my problems and the time spent in therapy. He gave a small shrug and winced. It wasn't until Anne Castledine died, while she was working for the Air Commodore, that I realised I wasn't the only one trying to expose him. This was more than she ever expected to hear, but Jimmy was still talking. Then I saw you and the others in Greenborough, and I thought that finally I'd been sent an answer. If anyone could help me, you could. So I decided to meet you at Jenny Foxwell's chapel. But you had a syringe with you. Eve was confused. Thank heavens I did. I only brought it in case you refused to listen to me. I was so intent on making you understand that I was prepared to give you the drug, so that when you came round, I would have a captive audience. And then when I got there, I almost chickened out. I retreated into the garden and sat down to think what I was going to say. That's when I saw the other man. He sighed. You know the rest. Why didn't you tell me all this immediately? I would have helped you. When I realised how ruthless they were, I didn't want your help. All I wanted then was to keep you safe. And I failed at that too. Jimmy, I think you should rest now. She didn't like his colour, and his breathing was becoming laboured. Get some sleep. Don't leave me. I'll be right here. Promise. I promise. I love you, Eve. I always did. I know. Now you rest, and I'll be here when you wake up. Eve watched him, and his breathing seemed to ease again, so she continued to hold his hand and talk softly to him. After a few minutes, she noticed his breathing once again becoming erratic, and she pressed the call buzzer. A nurse appeared almost instantly, and after a quick examination, she threw Eve a worried glance. Before she could say a word, warning lights flashed on the monitor and an alarm sounded. The nurse shouted for assistance and hurried Eve from the room. Then there was a the sound of running footsteps, and Eve stepped aside for the crash team. She stood in the doorway and watched them as they worked quickly and expertly, but Eve knew that Jimmy wouldn't be waking up again. While they pronounced time of death, she slowly walked out to the corridor. I think you will soon be asked to stand down, PC Chivers. Ah, oh, oh dear, well, I'm sorry for your loss, Miss Anderson. Me too, thought Eve. But I can't leave while you are on your own. I'm here for you as much as for him. I'll ring my daughter. She will collect me. Would you like a drink? We can walk down to the vending machine if you like. She was suddenly aware that she was parched. Good idea, Ken. I could kill for a strong coffee. Not sure about the strong part, but it will be hot and wet. And if you stick enough sugar in it, you can pretend it's coffee. Better than nothing. She suddenly had a picture of Jimmy in his dinner jacket offering her wine with her dinner, while he slept rough and attended therapy groups. Then she looked at the tall, tough-looking policeman and thought, Stay safe, young man, because time in the services can seriously damage your health. I have a name for you. Eve looked sick with tiredness, but I need to tell you away from here. Nicky nodded. OK, Ken, we've got her now, and thanks for your help. Pleasure, Mom. PC Ken Chivers gave her a salute and walked off down the corridor. We'll talk in the car. Joseph's with me. Good. I'm not sure how I feel about your Jimmy Fraser right now, but I can see you were quite upset, and I am sorry that he didn't make it. Nicky had never seen her mother look so deflated. It's complicated. I will explain later. Are we going to that hotel you told me about? Yes. It's the safest place for the time being. Then let's wait and I'll tell you and the others at the same time. They will want to know this too. They drove the twenty minutes to the hotel in silence. Nicky sensed that her mother needed quiet to get her thoughts in order. As dawn broke, Joseph gathered the others and they all met in the biggest bedroom. They were a motley-looking group, all with tousled hair and borrowed nightclothes. Eve told them the whole story. When she had finished, Wendy said, Apart from being so shocked to hear of Jimmy Fraser's involvement, I have to say that we had come to the same conclusion. What was Jimmy's sister's name? I've forgotten if I ever knew her. Emma, 
Emma Fraser. Vinny unfolded the list of dead women and traced his finger down the names. Emma Fraser fell to her death from a roof garden in Paris. For a while, no one spoke. He has to be stopped. Eve looked around, one way or another. There was a low murmur of agreement. Eve looked across to Nicky. I suggest we carefully prepare a report of everything we know. And you, my love, how do you see it? You take it upstairs. Apart from all chipping in and renting a hitman ourselves, I think that's the best we can do. Nicky said flatly. Finney visibly brightened. Well, if your official route fails, perhaps we could talk about that first idea of yours. After all, I am a man of many talents. Let's not go there, huh, Vinny? growled Joseph. Not with this bunch. I'd put absolutely nothing past them. After Nicky and Joseph had left, Renee and Vinny went back to their rooms, and Eve and Wendy stayed to talk. Looks like you need those cuts dressed, commented Wendy. Eve looked down and realised that her wrists had several nasty scratches from when she undid the ties. Come on, said Wendy. I've got some plasters and some antiseptic cream in my bag. Let's get them washed and I'll patch you up. Not as dexterous as I used to be, Eve said rather sadly. I think it really is time to think about that allotment. Or maybe designing a new fern garden would be more appropriate. Jenny's last project, wasn't it? Wendy said as she filled the sink. And it needs to be completed, said Eve determinedly. And while we are on the subject of Jenny, do you remember her influential friend in the M.O.D.? The one called David something? Wendy gently sponged her cuts and dried them with tissues. David Danbury. He moved across to Cheltenham to GCHQ. Funny that I was thinking about him before you arrived. And I bet we were thinking the same thing. Wendy gave her a knowing smile. Jenny never talked about her work, did she? The only thing she ever said was that if ever she was in a tight spot, David would be the man to go to. Even years back he held a position of some importance. I'd call several murders and several more attempts to kill a pretty tight spot, wouldn't you? Eve nodded. Very tight indeed. His private number is in Jenny's telephone book. Excellent. Wendy applied the plasters. All done. Now, will you ring him ASAP? Just as soon as I can get across to Monk's Lantern, and I'll ask for a police escort if necessary. Chapter 32 As soon as they arrived at work, Nicky sent Yvonne and Niall over to Darius Lodge with instructions to find an old summer house and a hungry dog. That should keep Mother happy, she remarked to Joseph. Well, I've just received her next request. He grinned at her across her desk. Who is actually running this place? Top Brass or Eve Anderson? Don't make me answer that. What does she want now? She's texted me asking for someone to escort her to Monk's Lantern. She says it's vital that she gets hold of Jenny Foxwell's address book. Nicky frowned. I'm not sure I want her out and about at all, even if someone is with her. Joseph nodded. I suggested that we pick it up for her, but she's not sure where it is. We're as capable of looking for it as she is. I think she just wants to be doing something. It runs in the family. Neither of us can bear sitting around twiddling our thumbs. I had noticed. Joseph raised his eyebrows. So what shall I tell her? I'll ring Cameron and ask him to get one of his team to go around and look for it. The place is still a crime scene, so he has a key. I'll get a police motorcyclist to collect it. Tell Mother to butt out. As far as I'm concerned, she's still under house arrest. Okay. Joseph went back to his desk. Nicky phoned Cameron, then sat back and looked around the office. It was unusually quiet. The whole station was on high alert, just waiting for something to happen. The threat level had lifted from substantial to severe, indicating that an attack was highly likely. No one had seen or heard from Mad Tom, and his house was now closed up and surrounded by armed police. Everyone entering the station was searched, and their business there verified and double-checked. But Nicky knew that nowhere was impregnable, the place was full of civilians, some working directly for them, some contracted in. A sea of new faces constantly moved around the building. They were all doing their best, but the fear was still there. Who would Mad Tom target next? She decided that work would be the only thing to stop her imagination running away with her. A few moments ago, a plainclothes detective had brought her an envelope containing information cobbled together by Wendy and the others. 
It was down to Nicky to collate it and decide how best to present it to the superintendent. Nicky was convinced of its veracity, but she no longer felt confident that justice would prevail. Taking a deep breath, she gathered up Rory's forensic report on Jenny Foxwell and his observations and professional opinions on Air Commodore Arthur Rowling's and Anne Castledine's deaths, added the damning tox reports that had come in from their one survivor, Robert Callum, the bookshop owner, and started to work. Just after eleven, Niall came in leading a rather effervescent crossbreed dog. This is Skipper. He looked down fondly. He's a cracker, isn't he? Joseph agreed. Skipper was a handsome animal, and although he seemed a little in awe of the strange surroundings, he was responding very well to Niall. Right now, he was lying quietly at Niall's feet and gazing up at him adoringly. I think he knows you rescued him, Niall. Joseph went over and tickled the dog's chest. He's a friendly guy, isn't he? And now he's an orphan. Niall looked down at Skipper, moved closer to Joseph and whispered, Do you think Tam would like a dog? Joseph chuckled. Save the whales, save the red squirrels, save the beagles, save the planet. What do you think? Hmm, I'm not sure that will extend to save the GSD cross Labradors. But he is now officially homeless, so perhaps that will swear. He looked serious. Actually, I'd be relieved for her to have a dog like this in the house when I'm working late. He'll be good security. Joseph laughed. You've sold the idea to me, son. Now all you have to do is convince your wife. It still seemed weird referring to his little girl as your wife, but he was getting used to it. He rather liked it, actually. Can he stay here until my shift finishes? The dog handler said he'd look after him, but Itchy, his own dog, isn't too impressed with Skip. I've got a blanket and a water bowl. Oh, and some biscuits, too. I think the DI's office would be perfect, don't you? Give him a bit of peace. I think he quite likes the attention out here. Indeed, everyone who entered the room made a beeline for Skipper. Okay, under my desk. But you have to make sure there's no accidents, okay? Niall beamed with pleasure. Jimmy's dog had just found a new home. Package for DI Galena, from DCI Walker at Beach Lacey. A motorcycle copper looked around the room for the recipient. I'll take it, thank you. How are things over there? How is your injured detective? Asked Joseph. It's worrying, Sarge. He's showing no signs of waking up. DCI Walker is really concerned. I'm sure he is. Tell him to keep us posted, won't you? And thanks for getting this for us. Nice dog. It's my son-in-law's. Joseph grinned at how easily that had slipped out. He hadn't thought twice. When the man had left, Joseph removed the telephone book from the envelope and rang Eve. Got it here, Eve. Can I look up a number for you? Nicky doesn't want too many people calling at the hotel. Eve told him that she needed the number for a man named David Danbury. Joseph skimmed the D's and read it out to her. Are you okay, Eve? We haven't had a chance to talk properly since your ordeal. I'm not sure it was an ordeal, Joseph, she said pensively. I think it was something of a learning curve on a lot of levels. We'll talk when this is all over. Oh, and we've just seen the TV appeal asking the public to keep a lookout for that man, Andrew Falcon. Any news on that score yet? Nothing, but we're hoping he shows his face somewhere. Hopefully some eagle-eyed member of the public will spot him. We need to get to him before he carries out his threat. Look after Nicky, won't you, Joseph? I know I've caused her a lot of concern recently, and I'm truly sorry. Now it's my turn to be worried sick. Oh, I'll watch out for her, Eve. Never fear. I know you will. Now, when are you two finally going to get it together? Joseph coughed loudly. Eve, you know it's... it's... I know, I know, it's complicated. You've told me that before. But who is making it so? As far as I can see, it is perfectly simple. Joseph loved Eve to bits, but he really did not want to go down this road. It's a job. You know what it's like, and because of our rank. I really do need to talk to you about secrets, Joseph Easter. They can be a wonderful thing if handled correctly. Think about it. And Eve hung up. Joseph stared at the phone. Wasn't Eve sick of secrets by now? He shook his head and wondered how much longer Nicky would be with the superintendent. Superintendent Greg Whittle read her report twice, growing paler with every page. I wish you hadn't showed me this, Nicky. No one wishes that more than me, sir. I will have to take advice. This is way beyond my remit. As a someone you really trust, sir, only I have it on good authority that certain elements will try to bury this. 
I don't doubt that. And Nicky, I never talk to people I don't trust. He dragged an unwilling finger down the page. And all of these young women can be linked to this man in some way. Every single one, sir. But you can't prove it. We certainly could, given time and adequate assistance. Greg closed the file and sat back. I've heard of Charles Esprit. He's top management. Some believe he's untouchable. This, he pointed to her report, is an incendiary device. I just pray that we don't get burned. He stared at her. There could be repercussions. You know that. They always look for a scapegoat. He's a perverted murderer. I'll take my chances. There was a hard edge to her voice. It brought back memories of another Nicky. And the officers around you, what about them? They're all good, loyal men and women, and committed police officers. They would never forgive me if I backed down on this piece of filth. And thank you, Nicky. You may go. The man stared down the narrow alleyway, out of the black void that his life had become. He had once been an intelligent sportsman. He was still far from stupid, but much had changed. All because of the thieving trash that broke into his house. He gave a bitter laugh. They had taken so much more than they intended. In a couple of terror-filled hours, along with some old pictures and pointless trophies, they had stolen his whole life. It had been so good, that life. Golf had brought Andrew Falcon success, fame and wealth. But more than all of that, he'd had love. The love of his wife and that of his beautiful daughter. Though especially the love of his little princess. He'd had it all. Fast cars, exotic holidays and designer clothes. He looked down at what he was wearing now. A grubby anorak, filthy jeans, a shirt with a frayed collar and cuffs, and old scuffed boots. Well, he certainly looked the part. The only good thing to come out of those endless grinding therapy sessions was his friendship with Jimmy. Thanks to Jimmy, he had learned the art of blending in on the streets. Andrew hunkered down and squatted on his haunches, leaning against the cold brick wall behind him. Jimmy, confused and impaired as he was, actually understood him. He was the only person who did. He was sorry he wouldn't see Jimmy again, but he knew that after this last hurrah, he would be locked away forever. Of course, Jimmy could always visit, but with his claustrophobia, a high-security prison was the last place Jimmy would want to be. He gave a little sigh. Go well, Jimmy. It wouldn't be long now. Timing would be key, but he had patience. The games taught you that, along with craft and duplicity, and how to win at all costs. He missed the computer games. For a while after his family left him, he had been addicted to them. The games had provided another world to escape to. He had discovered a whole realm, a fantasy kingdom of thieves, and something had clicked in his brain. This was how he would get his revenge. He had immersed himself in the study of villains, imaginary and real, until they blended into one seamless whole. He was proud of what he had achieved. Finding out about the real criminals had not been easy, and in some cases it had been downright dangerous. But he had moved among them undetected. He had listened to conversations in pubs and bars. He had traced records and followed blogs, newspaper reports and websites. He had also spent a lot of time in the police station. He had a reputation as a troublemaker because of his constant complaints about the appalling way the case had been handled. He had been bundled from this officer to that, in and out of offices and rooms, until he knew Greenborough Station rather well. And all the time he had listened to what was being said around him. He knew the pubs that the coppers frequented, so he would go there too, always listening. After all this time, he knew a lot about D.I. Galena and her team. He rubbed at his tired eyes. Yes, he was proud of it all, but the game itself had disappointed him. He had hoped it would fill the emptiness, but it hadn't. Not even the killings. Somehow he had envisaged an epic battle between his avatar and the detective inspector. He had picked her out because she seemed the toughest of the detectives, a strong woman and a worthy adversary. But there had been no spark no real connection, and he had quickly tired of all the riddles and the secret language. It seemed to annoy her, but nothing more than that. There was something else occupying D.I. Galena's thoughts, and it wasn't him or the game. So he was forced to end it. This final killing would do it. He would have all her attention. All of it. Back in the office, Nicky felt as if a weight had lifted. She could do no more. 
It was now in the hands of those with more power than she had. Whatever the outcome, she had delivered the facts and made sure they were backed up. All she could do was hope that this sensitive information reached the right ears. Suddenly the station was a hive of activity. In the wake of the TV appeal by the superintendent, the whole staff, officers and civilians alike, were fielding calls of possible sightings of Andrew Falcon. Uniform and civilian interviewing officers were following them up, sorting the plausible from the merely daft. The deafening clamour of phones and voices filled the room, and Nicky loved it. Things were moving at last. For a second, Nicky felt sorry for her mother. She would hate being excluded from the action. But she was safe, and that was all that counted right now. Until the super had done whatever he could, and wheels began to turn, there could be still men out there with an unfinished assignment to fulfil. Cat raised her voice above the cacophony. Who's for Sarnies? I've got to have a break. The chorus of yes-pleasers echoed around them, and Nicky joined in. It was a long time since breakfast. Cat took the orders and pulled on her coat. I'll go to the deli round the corner. It's close. Ben smiled at her. I'll go with you, but I'm waiting on a couple of hopefuls. Not to worry, I can manage, but I won't be able to carry drinks as well. I'll give you a head start, Catkin, and go make us some coffees. Dave stretched his arms above his head, hands together. Oh, I've got cramps sitting here for so long. He rubbed his midriff. Plus, I've got indigestion brought on by lack of food. Cat giggled. That'll be the day, Piggy. You did say two rounds of cheese and pickle, didn't you? And a doughnut? Cat passed Niall, hurrying in. Need to take Skip out for a pee. Is the Sarge around, Mum? He'll be back in a minute. He's just taken some papers to be copied. Would you tell him I rang Tam and Skippy here has a new home? Nicky smiled. That's good news. I'll tell him. She watched the young man leave the room, the dog at his side. Just perfect. A loving relationship, a lovely old cottage, and now a handsome dog to complete the picture. Nicky cared for Joseph's daughter and her new husband like her own flesh and blood. She was truly happy for them. Ben interrupted her thoughts. Excuse me, Mum. I'm just going down to have a word with Uniform. There's been a possible sighting. It may be a complete crock, and I don't think it warrants me turning out, but I'm going to get them to check something out for me. Sure, go. Nicky's phone rang. Hello, Mum. Fed up with playing I Spy yet? Very funny. Actually, I've set up a poker school between us and some of the security guys here. It's quite good fun. You are incorrigible. I'm taking my mind off things. Eve's tone became serious. We've made a call, and you should know that no matter how badly things seem to be going regarding that, um, matter we've been involved in, there is someone of importance on our side. And now I have to explain the royal flush, so I'm going. Speak later, darling. And please, just stay safe. Nicky shook her head. What a woman. And who on earth had she phoned? The Prime Minister? The Minister of Defence? The Pope? Nothing would surprise her. Fancy a coffee, Gov? Would I ever? And get Joseph one too, Dave. I'll bring a trayful. Nicky returned to her office. The paperwork on her desk would take a month to clear, but hopefully things would calm down a bit when they finally had Tom in custody. No, I'm not starting all this yet. No way can I concentrate with all this uncertainty. She jumped when Joseph answered her. Did I speak out loud? Let's have lunch. Then hopefully you might hear something from the superintendent. She closed the door on the mounds of files and went into the CID room with Joseph. She told him about Niall and the dog and said, I told Dave to get you a coffee, okay? Absolutely. But I just came past the vending machine and he wasn't there. They stared at his empty desk. He's making his proper coffee, said Joseph. Down in Galena's grotto. Nicky stood still and put a hand to her heart. The basement, the oldest part of the station, and the only part which has never been renovated. She pictured the old defunct fire escape leading to a backyard. Oh, my God! One glance at Joseph told her that he was thinking the same thing. The mess room had no CCTV. It was the perfect setting for Mad Tom. Andrew Falcon stood beside a tall filing cabinet. There was very little natural light, and he had already removed the starter from one of the two strip lights, so his end of the big old mess room was dark. He'd been told about this room by one of Jimmy's street pals, a skinny druggy with pupils like pinpricks and bad teeth. He said that the old wooden sash window slid up real easy. 
There was a coffee machine down there where you could get a free drink, courtesy of the Fenlon Constabulary. It was risky, but Andrew and Jimmy had tried it once, just for a laugh. He smiled. He was very glad they had, because this was the only weak point in the station's security. He knew people used it regularly. Several officers slipped in here to take a sneaky break away from the bedlam of the rest of the station. There were probably more illicit keys cut for this unofficial restroom than anywhere else in the whole station. So someone would come. It was lunchtime, after all. He didn't care which one it was. He had a kind of hierarchy of preferences, but really anyone would do, as long as it hurt Nicky Galena. He heard a key turn in the lock. This was it. There would be no more after this. He had reached the final level of the game. He would win. He had to. He stared at the man who came in. It wasn't who he expected, but he would do. In fact, he would do rather nicely. Andrew took his time. He stood in the shadows and watched, let the man switch on the coffee machine and check that there were creamers in the little basket next to the cups, let him glance up at the darkened strip light and mutter something about getting it sorted after lunch. He flexed his fists. Soon he would make his move. Then he stiffened, unsure of what he was seeing. The police officer clutched at his chest and a low moan of pain issued from his open mouth. He staggered a few steps away from the coffee machine crashed to the floor and lay still. Andrew Falcon stood rooted to the spot. No, this couldn't happen, not like this. It couldn't be taken away from him. His mind spun. Then anger coursed through him, the like of which he had never felt before. With a scream of frustration and anguish, he threw himself at the prostrate figure. You cheated me! You have cheated me! I hate you! You spoil everything! Cat was just coming in as Nicky and Joseph raced from the CID room. She took one look at their faces, dropped her armful of bags on the nearest desk and ran after them. They haired down the stairs and stopped at the end of the long corridor leading to the old mess room. They found Dave ambling along, key in hand. Sorry, got held up by Yvonne. She wanted to pick my brains about the whereabouts of one of our old snouts. He stopped and stared at them. Whatever is the matter? Yes! added Kat, now very confused. Why have we just done an Olympic sprint down here? I, we... Nicky panted, jumped to a conclusion. I got it wrong. Phew, breathed Joseph. Then he tilted his head. What is that? They all listened. The sound welling up from the end of the corridor was terrifying. Jesus! Nicky dived forward and beat them all to the door of her grotto. She pushed it open, and they all stopped in the doorway, unable for a moment to believe what they were looking at. It was like a waxwork tableau. Andrew Falcon stood immobile over a figure lying silently on the floor at his feet. Greg Woodall, the superintendent. Sir? Nicky's shout seemed to galvanise Falcon, and he began to rain vicious kicks at the superintendent's limp body. Bastard! Leave him alone! Nicky sprang forward, then stopped. Falcon took a step back. He turned to face her. He cheated me. This was my last kill, and he stole it from me. Nicky felt an icy coldness creep into her. Get the super to safety, she hissed to Joseph and Cat. Now, get him away from this monster. Call for help, Dave. Her eyes bored into Falcons, but all she saw was her boss, her ally, her friend, lying on the ground, defenceless. Then she saw the crime scenes. Two men beaten to a pulp. And for what? Mad Tom began to laugh. It hurts, doesn't it? And it's your fault. Why wouldn't you play the game properly? You made me very angry, Detective Inspector Galena. Anger? Nicky took a step forward. You think you know about anger? Somewhere in the background, Joseph and Cat were dragging Greg towards the door, and Dave was calling for help. But she hardly noticed. I'll show you anger! Nicky's leg shot out. Falcon gasped and doubled over, clutching at his knee. She threw herself at him. Off balance, he went backwards, and she landed on top of him. Nicky drew back her fist and hit him full in the face. Do you like it? She gasped. Do you like being on the receiving end? Well, that one was for Greg. She hit him again. That's for Ryan Cook. A third blow. And that's for Michael Roper. All because of your stupid game. What were they? Collateral damage. Nicky drew back her fist for another blow. Then she felt an arm around her, 
and someone easing her firmly and gently away from the screaming Andrew Falcon. Nicky, enough. She had an impulse to resist, but realised it would make her no better than the man on the floor. Her anger slowly dissipated, and she almost collapsed into Joseph's arms. I'm sorry. Stay there. I've got him. She sank to the ground, while Joseph read Andrew Falcon his rights and slipped the cuffs onto his wrists. Then there were officers everywhere, and someone was helping Kat to try to resuscitate the fallen officer. Greg! Her voice sounded very small and weak. Kat shook her head, her face a mask of misery. I tried, but... First responders here! Dave called out. Kat moved away to allow the medic to get to work. She crawled across and sat next to Nicky on the floor. I'm so sorry. I did try, honestly. Then her tears began to flow. Nicky put her arms around Kat and began to cry with her. Then Joseph came back. He's where he belongs. I told the custody sergeant exactly what he did, so they won't be extending him too many favours. He looked down at them, with a great sadness in his eyes. We can't do any more here. Let's go back upstairs. They all sat together, trying to piece together what had happened. Dave was shaking his head. It should have been me. If I hadn't stopped to talk to Yvonne. Nicky thought he looked so much older than he had a few hours ago. But then none of them looked too good. What was the super doing down there? Asked Joseph. No idea, said Nicky. I've been wondering that myself. I know, Kat said quietly. She let out a long sigh and looked at Nicky. It was his coffee machine. You nicked the superintendent's coffee machine? Ben's face was a picture. Only sort of. She gave a tired smile. It was a present from his wife, but he never drank coffee at work. I just relocated it somewhere where it could be more appreciated. Joseph almost smiled. Like all the other stuff, including the men's room clock. Please, not that bloody clock again. Nicky looked at Cat. If he didn't drink coffee, what was he doing down in the grotto? He went down there a lot just to get his head together, away from all the pressure. He used the hot water to make a cup of decaf tea. How come you know all this? asked Dave. I met him there a couple of times. It was our secret. She stared at the floor. Not all secrets are bad ones. He was a bloody good super. They nodded. A long silence fell over the room. After a while, Joseph said, The FMO was in the building. He says it was a massive heart attack. A real one this time, not induced by some faceless killer. And the reason he drank decaf tea was that he suspected a heart condition but never sought medical help, because he didn't want to be forced to retire. What a price to pay, Dave murmured. Ben rubbed his face. So, Mad Tom's game is over. You've put together all we know about the Foxwell murder, and Eve Anderson and her troop are safe. So what next? As if on cue, the CID room door flew open and a group of strangers stepped inside. Everyone step away from your computers immediately. Do not touch anything. Leave the office now and wait outside. There has been a breach of security. Men in suits hustled them out, and Nicky saw other men closing down their computers. What the hell do you mean? she shouted. Who the hell are you? She might as well not have been there. Then a figure she recognised took hold of her arm and pulled her out and away from the CID room. Sir, what is all this? she exclaimed, although the answer was already beginning to dawn on her. For God's sake, our superintendent is lying dead in the basement, attacked by a maniac who is now in custody, and this, this lot come marching in here shouting about bloody security breaches. What is going on? Chief Superintendent Bill Brennan ushered her away from the rest of the team. You gave Greg some very sensitive material, some of which was accessed using these computers. It wasn't well received. But, sir, Nicky, it's time to walk away from this. It's out of our hands now. There are some areas where we have no jurisdiction, and we have wandered onto someone else's territory with this one. He held her shoulder firmly. You have to drop it now. Nicky bit hard on her thumbnail to fight back her caustic reply. It wasn't Brennan's fault. He was a good man, and she knew he was an old friend of Greg Woodall. This would not be easy for him either. And then there was the fact she had no choice. 
she exhaled. I do understand, sir, but can I ask you this? My mother and her ex-MOD friends have been under threat. Two of their friends have been murdered. The man one of them was working for has died suspiciously, and another man connected to them had an attempt on his life. Then we have one of our own, D.C. Darren Smith, in a coma, and another man shot in his car. He died last night. She looked him in the eyes. All this, all this to protect some perverted beast in a tailored suit from having his name blasted over tabloids and TV screens. How will I ever sleep knowing that my own mother or one of her very brave friends could be next? When I say it ends here, I mean it, Nicky. I've had assurances, and I have to say they're from people I believe I can trust. He gave her a thin smile. I don't blame you for that cynical look, but I am told that after an internal investigation, there will be changes made in personnel. There will be no more deaths. Your mother and her friends can go home and live their lives again. He straightened up. Now I want you and your team to leave the station and go straight home. There will be a debriefing tomorrow morning. He walked away. Nicky felt sick. Go home and live your life again. Greg Woodall certainly couldn't do that. She looked around for Joseph and saw him beckoning to her. She wasn't sure that any of their lives would be the same again after today. We've been told to go directly home. Joseph looked grey with worry. Nicky looked at him. And after we've been to see my mother, that's exactly what we'll do. At the hotel, Vinny wasn't convinced that peace was once more reigning in Greenborough. He told them he would stay one more night with his ladies to make sure that they were safely settled back in Wendy's place. We are going to have a small party, said Lou. Not a glorious knees-up, that would be most inappropriate, but a sort of celebration of our friends' lives. We'll just be reliving old memories, and sharing them with Vinnie, who, I might add, has become an honorary member of the gang. Eve hesitated about going. She was still upset after Jimmy's death. But Nicky convinced her to go, saying that maybe time with her friends was exactly what she needed. You can have my car, Eve until you decide what you want to get to replace your old Volvo. Joseph offered, If Nicky follows me in her car tomorrow morning, I'll bring it over and leave it with you. Are you sure? Of course. I'll car share with Nicky. Nicky nodded. Sounds like a plan. We'll come to Wendy's before work, if that's okay. Nicky and her mother just didn't do hugging, but now they clung to each other. Eve whispered in her ear, This has been a very bad time but I won't ever worry you like that again. This time I really am hanging up my Sherlock Holmes hat and magnifying glass. I'll believe that when I see it, Nicky replied. But is it really all over? Remember what I said. Don't be put off by what has happened today. There are forces at work that will, how can I put it, bring the situation to a satisfactory conclusion. I hope so. I really do. Go home, sweetheart. It seems I have a party to attend, and you and Joseph need a very large glass of wine and a long talk together. Nicky finally let her mother go, and turned to Joseph. She's right. Let's go home. All I can think about right now is a long hot shower and a cold bottle of wine. Chapter 33 Nicky and Joseph sat at the old pine kitchen table and finished their meal, on their way home, it had suddenly occurred to her that they had eaten nothing since breakfast. For the first time she could recall, Joseph did not feel like cooking, and instead made the very generous gesture of allowing Nicky to pick up cheeseburgers and chips on the understanding that it was a one-off. They were halfway through a bottle of Chablis and reminiscing about the super. Nicky even managed to find some photographs from years back. He was a really feisty copper when he was in uniform. Nicky passed Joseph a photo of Greg Woodall in a rugby shirt, I'm not sure that his promotion to superintendent was the best thing for him, really, but he was good at it. She sipped her wine. We are really going to miss him. I keep getting flashbacks of that maniac kicking his dead body. It's just unreal. I don't think I'll ever forget it. Joseph shook his head. It's one of those dreadful snapshot moments that haunts you forever. Then a smile spread across his face. But on the plus side... I'll also have a snapshot of you knocking seven bells out of Mad Tom. I know I asked for the old Nicky back, but that was something else. Nicky tried to look sheepish. You did say fight dirty, didn't you? I don't recall asking you to kill him. I felt like it. I really did. 
she had never felt anger like it, except once. She remembered how she had felt when her daughter died. Her anger at those responsible for that was probably greater. She stared at a picture of Greg Woodall, taken at a charity bash they had attended together. I wonder who will replace him. Joseph pulled a face. I dread to think. New beginnings, I guess. Someone else to knock into shape. They always take a while to get to understand me and my lovely team. A wave of sadness washed over her. But for one chance conversation on his way to make coffee, the dead officer would have been our Dave. And then it would really have been murder. Falcon has already admitted that he didn't care who he killed, as long as it hurt you. Nikki lowered her head into her hands. What kind of world is this? What kind of people do we deal with? She swallowed a sob. Why do we do this damn job? Joseph leaned across the table and cupped her hands in his. We do it because we care. We do it because there are good people out there too, and they need us to protect them. But what about us? Nikki asked. She was crying now in earnest. How long can we go on like this, taking the flak day in, day out? Are we really that strong? I think we are. But we also need to find some perspective. There has to be a life outside Greenborough CID. Right now we have nothing but work, work, and more work. It's draining us. I thought I'd lost her. Eve. Joseph gave a little laugh. Now there is an enigma, if ever there was one. She looked up at Joseph through her tears. If it hadn't been for crazy mixed-up Jimmy Fraser, we would be attending another funeral in the weeks to come. They would have killed her the same way as her two friends. And I... Well, I don't think I'd be able to get over that. Joseph came and squatted down beside her. He looked up into her face. She knows that, Nicky. She's changed since Jimmy died. I think she's become aware of the responsibility of having a loved one close by. It's a responsibility, loving someone. He was right. Joseph was right about a lot of things. Strangely, she had never even thought about having a life outside the force. Even with Hannah, it was just a daily jigsaw puzzle. Work provided most of the pieces, and the rest fitted in around it. Hers had never been a balanced life. And now people around her were dying. Greg had gone in the blink of an eye, her mother had been a whisper away from a fatal injection of poison. Jimmy Fraser, a reluctant hero, had been shot. And there were other casualties, too. She suddenly became aware of how fragile life is. We can't waste the life we have, can we? It would be a sacrilege. What do you want to do? You know, without me telling you. He sighed. But failing that, I'd like to know that I was really living and not just working my way towards my own funeral. She touched his cheek. And if I wanted the same thing, how do we do that? And still keep the team together? Joseph's eyes brightened. Ah, oh, now, your mother was explaining to me all about well-kept secrets. Apparently, if handled properly, they are an amazing thing. He raised an eyebrow. A slow smile spread across her face. As in... What they don't know won't hurt them. Exactly. Or us. He stood up and held his arms out to her. Diagolina, I do believe you are catching on. I'm a detective, aren't I? Yes, you are. And a bloody good one. So now, I'm going to make it my life's work to provide balance so that good detective doesn't burn out. How does that sound to you? like the perfect end to a really shitty day. Epilogue Christmas, five months later Light shone through the stained glass windows of Monk's lantern. Glowing storm lanterns either side of the drive led the visitors to the old chapel. Jenny's will had been clear and straightforward and was settled in five months. Eve decided to move in straight away. She put her own house on the market and left the keys with the estate agents. She had no ties and no great fondness for the place. The party was not a big affair, and she had selected her guests carefully. The main attraction was the Christmas tree of noble fir, its glorious grey-green needles and strong branches festooned with coloured lights and decorations. It had cost a fortune and taken a whole day to decorate, but Eve decided she deserved a treat. 
There was a buffet laid out on a long refectory table in the hall, and drinks would be served in the kitchen. She had bought a large tray of bright red cyclamens from a local grower, and had placed them in terracotta pot covers for added colour, and had lit just about every lamp in the house. She had been living with shadows and dark deeds for too long. Now she needed light. She wanted Monk's lantern to shine like a beacon. Nicky and Joseph were first to arrive. Joseph immediately offered his services as barman. Oh, no, dear. You are to enjoy yourselves tonight. I've got a lovely couple from the village coming in. They'll deal with the food and drinks. Who's coming? asked Nicky, and surreptitiously seared a sausage roll from under its cling film colour. My gang and Vinnie Silver. Vinnie, you invited him? Joseph sounded pleased. He didn't need much persuading, I can tell you. He's very fond of his lovely ladies. Then there's your team. That's Dave, Cat and Ben, Yvonne, Niall and Tamsin, and Skipper, of course. Cameron and Kay, Rory and David, and two other special guests. Eve saw Nicky throw Joseph a curious look, but her daughter tactfully didn't inquire further. Secret squirrel strikes again, she whispered to Joseph. Eve laughed. I heard that, but you'll see soon enough. Over the next hour, people trickled in, all enthusing over the beautiful chapel conversion. Eve put on some carols, and Peg and Ginny, her local help for the evening, began taking around trays of delicious food and drink. The evening was going just as she'd hoped. I'm delighted to see Rory here, and that he's not alone, said Nicky. Eve nodded. Wearing a pair of light-up Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer antlers, Rory was happily introducing his long-term partner, David, to everyone. Home from foreign shores, at last, Rory said. Well, I'll give him two weeks before he's making sure that my passport is up to date and checking the timetables for flights out. David laughed. So, said Nicky, where is this fabulous holiday destination? Have you made up your mind yet? Mexico, Madagascar, Hawaii? David looked across at Rory and smiled broadly. It's Whitby, actually. Nicky laughed out loud. Not exactly exotic. Maybe not, but it's where we met. Rory gave a wistful smile. Ah, heady days. And I've had it with foreign travel for a while. David pulled a face. Whitby will be just fine. Joseph said he loved North Yorkshire. He and David were soon deep in talk of war zones and freedom fighters. Well, I've lost him already. And the one other really gorgeous man in the room. Typical, Rory huffed. And what's wrong with my Nile? Tamsin tweaked one of Rory's antlers. He's married, darling. I never describe a married man as gorgeous, and especially not when his beautiful wife is close by. He lifted his glass. But between you and me, he is rather wonderful, isn't he? Tamsin slipped her arm through Rory's. I think so, she grinned. And so does a new addition. Skipper idolises him. I cannot tell you how happy I am that you've taken him, said Eve. It was the first thing Jimmy asked about when he regained consciousness. I understand he had a bit of an odd lifestyle, but he was well looked after. Tam smiled at the dog sitting patiently at Niall's side. He's in lovely condition. Rory turned to Eve. Now, dear lady, when are you going to tell us what this glorious party is all about? Because we have a sneaking suspicion it's not just a seasonal housewarming all in good time. Eve tried to look enigmatic. Rory turned to Nicky. Do you know? I'm only a daughter, Rory. Why would you tell me? I'm as much in the dark as you are. She threw an accusing look at Eve. Okay, okay, it's almost time. I can see our special guests arriving, so all will be revealed. Eve hurried to the door and ushered two new guests into the room. Everyone, quiet, please. I'd like you all to raise your glasses and welcome Darren Smith and his mother, Julie. The injured detective and his mother made their way into the lounge, and everyone clapped. Cameron went straight over to Darren and shook his hand. Good to see you again, Darren. You're looking one hell of a lot better than six months ago. Back to work soon, sir. One more medical and we're there. Eve had kept in touch with Julie Smith. She had always felt responsible for what happened to Darren, even though Julie had never blamed her. You gave us all a right scare, you know. Cameron passed him a glass of orange juice. Always the same, my Darren. He never liked waking up, even as a child, and as a teenager. 
I had to prize him out of bed. Mum. Eve left them laughing and joking. She suspected that if Jimmy hadn't acted when he did, Darren's attacker would have finished him off when he was no longer any use as bait. Maybe Jimmy had saved two lives that day. She looked across the room and saw Wendy looking at her. Eve nodded. It was time to explain. She called them all into the hall. I know you're all wondering why I'm having this party. You can say that again, mother dear, Nicky called out. There was a short ripple of laughter. A few months back, we all went through hell. The expressions on the upturned faces told her this was true. So there is something I would like you all to hear. She unfolded a sheet of headed notepaper. I received this recently, but was asked to remain silent as to its contents until today. It's from a man called David Danbury, someone who held Jenny Foxwell, our dear friend and the previous owner of this lovely home, in very high regard. This is an article that will appear in tomorrow's papers. She held up the letter and read, We have heard today from our correspondent in the Italian town of Fiumicino that the death has occurred of Giles Esprit, late of Abinger in Surrey. He was found last night on his yacht in the marina, and it is thought that he died of a sudden, catastrophic heart attack. The family have requested that Mr. Esprit's funeral take place in Italy, and his ashes will be scattered at sea. She paused and looked around. And good riddance to bad rubbish. Vinny almost exploded. Talk about karma. What goes around comes around. Eve looked directly at Nicky. I did say that there would be a satisfactory outcome. That is thanks to both the way that your late superintendent, Greg Woodall, dealt with the information that you gave him, and the loyalty shown to Jenny and Anne by their former colleague, David Danbury. She looked out across the amazed faces. A toast, please. To Jenny, Anne and Greg. And another toast, added Nicky, after the initial cheers had died away, to the man who in a rather bizarre and roundabout way saved my mother's life, to Jimmy Darius Fraser. Eve lifted her glass and felt the tears well up in her eyes. She looked down and saw Jimmy's dog sitting at the foot of the stairs, looking up at her. To hide her tears, she walked down and bent and cuddled the big soft creature. You'll be happy, lad. You'll have a good life with Tam and Niall, I promise you. Did she imagine it, or was that just a tiny hint of Jimmy's fragrance on his fur? Thank you, Jimmy, she whispered, and the tears overflowed. The party went on until the early hours. After everyone had left, Nicky and Joseph sat with Eve on the sofa. So, they removed a sprit in the same way that he disposed of the people who were on to him. Nicky stared into her mug. A fit and end, but I would have preferred to see him smeared across every tabloid in the country. True, but I should think it was considered the most effective way of dealing with the situation, Joseph added. A lot of government officials believe that the public don't need to know everything that goes on, or they would lose faith in our security services. Luckily, men like Esprit are few and far between. Eve yawned. And I forgot to tell you, our Air Commodore has been posthumously awarded a medal for long service to the country. He has been completely exonerated of any misconduct, so the cloud over the Arthur Rawlings family has lifted too. And you guys have finished Anne's job and catalogued his books. That feels rather like closure, doesn't it? I've just got Jenny's fern garden to landscape. But yes, I'd say this is where we draw a line. No more adventures. Joseph looked at her slyly. Eve thought of her two dead friends, and of Jimmy slumped and bleeding as his whole world burned behind him. No more adventures. She finished her coffee and looked across to Nicky and Joseph. Forgive me for asking, but there's something different about you two. I can't quite put my finger on it. She frowned and looked from one to the other shrewdly. Are you keeping secrets from me? Two innocent faces stared back. Joseph puffed out his cheeks. Now, that would be telling, wouldn't it? This concludes Thieves on the Fens by Joy Ellis. Narrated by Henrietta Meir. Copyright 2017 by Joy Ellis. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Joffy Books, care of Lorella Belly Literary Agency, and was produced in the year 2018 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books, which holds the copyright there too. Please visit tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks.